Bum, 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 bum. Don't get copyright struck. That old music was from Monty Python. I'll stop singing now, but yes, uh, I don't. For those of you who asked, the epic music theme, which uh, is from Monty Python, it, uh, it, I no longer have. I had to pay for it. I, you know, spend money on other things. But hello, it's John Iceberg. It is epic. It is epic day. It is. He is risen. He is risen. Uh, special snowflake, John Snow, Easter Jesus of ice and fire, ice and fire. No tea. Thanks for joining me, folks. Uh, it is Easter Sunday. We appreciate that you do have family plans and Jesus meetings to attend and all that stuff. But we thank you for joining us. And of course, if you're watching on the rewatch, this is every John Snow theory that I care about deeply. Um, and it's going to be some character stuff, going to be some RLJ stuff, a lot of theories, some new theories that you've never heard before. And real quickly, I just want to give a shout out to Alt Shift X, who, of course, recently did some cool Jon Snow stuff. He did Who is the Real Jon Snow? Um, and then a live stream to follow up. He gave me a shout out to reference some of my theories. So that's really cool. If you watched that, well, why should you watch another long Jon Snow video? You might be asking yourself, well... Of course, we're different people. We have slightly different takes on the character. Um, he referenced a few of my theories, but I have more theories and different spins on them. And specifically, we have very different takes on John's ending. And then uh, also, uh, yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun. Like I said, I got some new theories and we're going to do a little bit of character analysis. And of course, Alt Shift X, he uh, a long time ago did a Who is the Real Tyrion? trying to compare book and show Tyrion. That inspired me to do Who is the Real Daenerys, which I'm very glad I did. And uh, then he just did Who's the Real Jon Snow. So <laughs> Truth and Reconciliation Committee. That's what it's about. But today we're really um, doing book John stuff. We'll, we'll do a little bit of versus show John talk, but um, let's go a little more blue. That's more purple. There we go. All right. But yeah, that's what we're doing today. So happy Easter. Um, and uh, yeah, shout out to Alice Westhill in the chat. And uh, I think it's Ishtar Day and Trans Awareness Day. There's a few things. So it's Jon Snow Special Snowflake Day. That's what we're doing here. So let's get into it. We've got slides. You can see on the left the topics. Those are only half the topics. That's the character stuff and the RLJ stuff. I've actually got more on the second page of theories, which is all the magic stuff. There'll be a little bit of magic and mythology here in the beginning, but most of the heavy magic stuff. So we've got lots of stuff coming for you. It's going to be a chunky monkey. So let's get into it right away with our first slide. Blue Winter Roses. Oh, man, that is... Nice looking art. Who's that by? Uh, it is by B. Gonzalez. Thank you, B. Gonzalez, for creating this beautiful picture of Daenerys. And this is, of course, Danny's House of the Undying Dream, where she sees a blue flower growing from a chink in a wall made of ice. And then it says, Mother of Dragons, Bride of Fire. So this is... We're talking about RLJ here. These first cluster of clues are RLJ. I'm so look, guys. I actually have never talked about RLJ. I'll let you see my shirt here. This is my Stark shirt. I got my dragon glass. I got my Stark pendant from Wheelstar Glass. So we've got all kinds of glass and stuff. RLJ. I'm asked about RLJ. I've never really talked about it much. Thank you, Isaac Jacobson. Cheers. Appreciate you. Um, I've got two RLJ videos coming out, one this month and one next month. The first one will be RLJ, a love story, and the second one will be RLJ, a secret wedding. And I've got some new observations about RLJ, which I didn't really want to make a video until I had a strong take on it. I do have some takes and some observations uh, that I have not seen. Thank you for the gift of memberships, Kim D. Shout out Minty Maelstrom in the chat. And so uh, I'm not going to spend too long on RLJ, but I'm going to give you a little sampling today of a few of my favorite RLJ clues. The more exhaustive RLJ content will be coming soon. It's pronounced N plus A equals J. God bless you. God bless. There's room in the fandom 
Is RLJ canon now? Well, it will be in about 20 minutes. So let me just get to work here. So the blue winter rose, this, this thing is one of my favorite symbols. And the reason why is because there's not much else it can mean other than Jon Snow is Lyanna's son. And I've never seen anyone propose another interpretation of this that makes any sense. Because, of course, Lyanna is associated with blue winter roses quite heavily. And that is from the tourney of Harrenhal. Rhaegar gave her a blue winter rose. It actually was on the tip of his lance. He didn't hand it to her, but whatever. It's Maypole symbolism. And so, yeah, the blue winter roses. And in fact, when Lyanna dies in the Tower of Joy, she is still clutching the roses, although they have turned black. It is, they're used as her symbol over and over and over. So it's very clearly uh, something that has to do with Lyanna. And this art here, by the way, is by Luvi Haller. I'll come back to it in a second. This one is by Duhita Das. So Luvita Haller here. Luvi Haller. I just mixed the two names. Sorry. And yeah, so the Blue Winter Roses, it's just very clearly a symbol of Lyanna. And so when we see it growing out of a chink in the wall made of ice, that's clearly Lyanna's legacy, her son, John, growing at the wall and filling the air with sweetness too. So that's a good sign. Um, <laughs> and we'll talk about the chink in the ice as well. Uh, that's gonna, there we see another symbol of John's identity later in another chink in the ice, but we'll come back to that. So that's the first thing, the blue winter rose growing out of the wall and Danny is seeing it too. So why does Danny need to see the blue winter rose? It must have something to do with her. The next line is mother of dragons, bride of fire. And so, Perhaps if John is a fire white, then Danny marrying John would make her the bride of fire. Oh, 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 that's right. John, you think of him as icy, but of course he may be fire whited in part. We'll talk about the complexity of John's white possibilities, but yes, marrying John could be a bride of fire for Danny. Interesting. She already married a solar king, Drogo, and we'll talk about that more too. So, Bale the Bard is it's probably the second big RLJ clue, and this is new calendar artwork by Justin Sweet. So Bale the Bard, of course, this is an entirely parallel story to Rhaegar and Lyanna. It is told to John by Ygritte, and all three of these are Romeo and Juliet love stories. Okay, the, the Romeo and Juliet love story, as I'm using it loosely, just means like a forbidden romance between two houses or factions like the Wildlings and the First Men, the Wildlings and Starks, who are at war or frequently are at war. And then there's a romance between the two that causes tension. So Rhaegar and Lyanna are like that. Bale the Bard, who is a king beyond the wall, he originally comes down to Winterfell to teach the Lord Stark a lesson. He's in disguise as Bale the Bard, and he plays and sings so well, as you can see here, that the Lord Stark said, name your, I, you know, name your gift. I'll give you, you know, any gift. And so he says, I wish for the fairest flower in Winterfell. And it was only then that the winter roses had just come into bloom. And so Lord Stark had his people go and pluck the finest blue rose from the glass gardens to give to Bale for his singing. But Bale didn't mean that flower. He meant, of course, Lord Stark's maiden daughter, and in the morning, the maiden daughter and Bale were gone. And they disappeared for a year. It turned out they had been hiding in the crypts. And Bale basically, basically uh, the, the, the daughter returned one day to her bedchamber. And she has now an infant son and Bale's disappeared. They had been hiding in the crypts. And they were in love. Although Ygritte says all the maidens love Bale in those stories. So it's, it's we don't know. But according to the story, it's a love story. And, you know, unless he forced her to stay down there in the crypts and kept her very quiet so no one could hear her. Like, it, it sounds like it was a love story. And the point is they hid out to have a secret baby. So with RLJ, this is the most obvious and first reason why Rhaegar and Lyanna stayed hidden until John was born is because other people might have a problem with what they're doing and try to prevent John from being born. And it was very important that John be born. And so, and so, that is uh, the parallel to Bale the Bard. And then, of course, Bale is a minstrel. He's a bard. Rhaegar is a harpist. 
It's a very good parallel. Uh, thanks from Stebo. I've been pondering Jon Snow for a while, and I've recently come to realize his potential with Torrin Stark, with his connection to Stannis as a parallel to Aegon. Torrin Stark. Okay. Um. Yeah. Okay. I feel you there. And of course, also you have to realize that Danny is going to be replaying Stannis's steps of like starting on Dragonstone, maybe trying to take King's Landing. Wildfire goes off. We rethink it, and then we hear about. A threat from the north when we go north to take care of that threat. That's what Dane is going to do. She's going to follow that same path. You're going to hear about the threat from the north from John after doing something at King's Landing. Which is going to go north and take care of that. Um, so, yeah. So the whole, like, Danny and John might be Aegon and Torrin. Ooh, another reason to ship Aegon and Torrin. That's funny. So, yeah. So John is the son of a harpist. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. And so, um, the, the daughter, the child of the son of Bag uh, the son of Bale the Bard and the Stark Maiden grew up to be the next Lord of Stark. Okay. So that's another foreshadowing that like John is royal and he's going to grow up to be King of Winter or, you know, maybe turn out to be an official Targaryen. So that's the forbidden love, hidden conception. I was kind of going for a crouching tiger, a hidden dragon, you know, flow there. Forbidden love, hidden conception. The point is, again, Bale and his maid hid out in order to conceive a baby. And that is almost certainly what Rhaegar and Lyanna did, uh, among other things. So there you go. Oh, and let me, um, I realize this is a little too big and we're missing the bottom of this. Let me just go back and see. I need to zoom out a tiny bit. It's about 198%. Try that. I do like to get, I spent time <laughs> getting these sizes right. So I'm going to want to make sure it displays properly. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. Oh, no, it's a little bit of margin showing there. Ah, now it's perfect. Okay, there we go. So forbidden love, hidden conception. They're in the crypts. You got the idea. So that's the second clue about RLJ, these strong parallels. And then of course, Ray, uh, John and Ygritte are their own Romeo and Juliet. And I'd like to point out that like Danny talks about Rhaegar and his northern girl. Well, to John, Ygritte is his northern girl because she's north of the wall. <laughs> so they both fell in love with northern girls with whom they're kind of sort of at war. And the relationship pulled against the loyalty oaths and all that stuff. So very strong, very strong parallels. And again, the Blue Winter Rose, not only is, is it interchangeable with the Stark Maiden in the sense that Bale asks for the rose and then takes the Maiden. He leaves the Blue Winter Rose on her pillow when he, when they abscond to the crypts. And so it's like, you can see that the flower and the Maiden are, that's, that's their, you know, the symbol, the flower symbolizes the Maiden, just with, as with Lyanna. So then, the Ned Clues. The Ned Clues are kind of insane to be honest. And this art is by Chrysler, Chrysler Diales and it's called Blood and Roses. And you can see this is Leanna giving baby John to Ned at the Tower of Joy in a room that smelled of blood and roses. The room smells of blood and roses. There's, there's so many ro there's so many roses in the room where Leanna is dying that it smells like roses. So this is not just the rose crown. L Rhaegar continually brought uh, Leanna roses, which is just, you know, just tells you what kind of, it was a romance. It was a love story, as they, as they say. Um, so Ned Stark, protector of Targaryens, that's not an exaggeration. Um, not only does he protect Jon, who's a secret Targaryen, he, of course, protects Daenerys. He resigns his office as oath of uh, as oath of office as I'll get it straight. I'm just getting warmed up. He resigned his office as hand of the king because Robert wanted to send assassins to kill Daenerys, and and Ned pitched a big fit about it. He's like, "What are you afraid of? A child? If the Dothraki come here, we'll throw him back into the sea. You know, like we don't kill children. What are we doing?" And, uh, and he resigns his office because of that. So protecting Daenerys. 
And then there's a few lines where Ned is talking about Rhaegar's children. Like when he's talking to Cersei and confronting her in the godswood right before the coup. Cersei's coup. And Ned thinks he has the upper hand. And he's like, look, I'm going to be nice to you, but you have to go into exile. And, she, and, she, and she's like, oh, exile. That's a bitter cup to drink from. And he's like, oh, it's not nearly as bitter as the one your father served Rhaegar's children. So 17 years later, Ned is like, got an ax to grind about the murder of Rhaegar's children. So this is not somebody that ever thinks a bad word about any Targaryens except for the Mad King. And certainly not about Rhaegar. Um, this line, somehow he thought not, is a famous one. When Ned is in a brothel looking, uh, researching Robert's bastards, and there's the there's the baby, there's the very young sex worker with the child that she has named Bera after Robert Baratheon. And Ned's like, ah, she's so young like she must have been a virgin when robert slept with her and the nicer brothels offer that and so now we're left to reflect like just how kind of disgusting robert is like not only does he sleep around he goes to brothels and pays for very young girls or at least he did in this instance left her pregnant and then never totally forgot about it and so here comes ned after the fact and he is investigating this and he thinks to himself, you know, I, he wondered if Rhaegar Targaryen ever visited brothel. He's like, somehow he thought not. So it's interesting comparison. We're thinking about Robert as a man who does not have restraint, especially with his sexual appetites. He compares that to Robert or to, to Rhaegar as a man who has more restraint. So it just tells you like, oh, did Rhaegar steal and abduct and rape Lyanna? Like, probably not. Um, Ned's inner monologue would have gone a little differently. <laughs> he would have been like, hmm. He wondered if Rhaegar Targaryen ever visited brothels. And then he would think, no, Rhaegar Targaryen would just take women when he wanted to as he had stolen his sister, you know, but there's nothing like that. You'll never find a single bad word about Rhaegar coming out of Ned's mouth or in Ned's monologue. And that's a big clue <laughs> that the abduction is was no abduction. It's basically only Robert that thinks that. Uh, and some of the common folk, I guess. So, And then the last thing about Ned is that when Ned thinks about Lyanna and her early grave, he thinks about her wolf blood. He doesn't blame Rhaegar. He thinks, oh, Brandon had, you know, Lyanna had a touch of it and Brandon had more than, than a touch. And it put both of them in their early graves. Leanna was 16 when she died. She was either 14 or 15 at the tourney. It is unclear. Um, so uh, in any case, Ned blames her wolf blood. He doesn't, you know, he thinks, oh, that's, they put them both in an early grave. So it just tells you like um, the main cause of Leanna dying young is her sort of, it's not recklessness, like the wolf blood can be reckless, but it could also be courageous. Like Leanna's wolf blood shows, um, you're not late, Tim, we're just getting started. The wolf blood shows when Leanna stands up to bullies, uh, when she chooses not to marry Robert, but to run off with Rhaegar instead. Um, so yeah, that's the wolf blood. It's, it's whatever, it's the metaphor for somebody that can't be told. So Ned blames the wolf blood, not Rhaegar. Let's keep going. We've made the point. Um, and yeah, so Ned, this is just Ned in the crypts here thinking about Leanna. It's a nice piece of artwork. It is by Nick Kalin. This one's by Jake Murray. So there's a lot of clues that John is a king. And thank you, Chad. I've got one eye on you. I see you there having fun. A lot of clues that John is a king, and this art is by Kubiak. It's kind of hot, to be honest. It's a little steamy here. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, there's John with the King of Winter crown and Daenerys with some kind of dragon crown because that iron, Aegon's crown needs to be updated. Daenerys deserves something of spun silver. I, I dig it. In any case, kings under the snow. When, when Robert first comes to Winterfell, he's like, where are your people? And he's like, oh, they've never seen a king before. 
you know, they're probably hiding. And he's like, uh, I don't know what's the line. He says, he said, uh, Kings, you know, they must be under the snow. And he's, he's sort of saying like Kings, no, they must be under the snow, meaning the people must be under the snow. But the line makes it sounds like there are kings under the snow at Winterfell. And of course, John is a king hiding under the name Snow if Rhaegar and Lyanna got married, which, newsflash, they did. Um, by the way, Elia's marriage was not annulled. That was a weird thing the TV show did. There's really no reason to do that. Targaryens can do polygamous marriage, and Rhaegar wouldn't have wanted to disinherit his other children because he thought he needed three special children, so it would have been marrying both of them, just in any case. Do you think Arya is on a similar arc to Lyanna? No. There are comparisons, obviously, but no, they're not on a similar arc at all. Thank you, Stebo. Um, so second one is the Raven calls John a king and calls John a corn king as well. So it's one of those things where the Raven's giving you clues. I don't know if Blood Raven's trying to tell John he's a king, but it's more of a reader clue, I think. We'll talk about the corn king thing. It's a specific kind of mythological king. But yes, the Raven calls John a king. And they talk about how he likes the word, and Mormont's like, oh, he's never said it before. And then he starts saying John's name and king. So, um, Vermeer Sixkins looks at Ghost, good boy Ghost, and thinks that uh, it's a second life fit for a king. And this art here is by Fadli Ramdani that I used on the cover art. This is grown up beefcake John of our, of our fantasies. <laughs> Look at that hair. That is that is hair commercial, John. In any case, <laughs> the armor is crazy good, too. So, Varamir looks at Ghost and says, well, that's a second life fit for a king. So, John is going to have a brief second life stopover in Ghost, and he is a king. It's looking very kingly here. Um, oh, this is the kings under the snow. I was supposed to show this a second ago. This is uh, Vera at... Vera... Adsker, A-D-X-E-R, Adsker. So this is King John in heaven, but he's looking very snowy. And uh, I'll go back to Beefcake John. He is very handsome. Try to try to pay attention to what I'm saying. This on the screen, if you can't. It's challenge level impossible. In any case, second life fit for a king. And then there is Rob's will. Of course, Rob's will probably establishes John as his heir and there's a couple people that know about it and they're hanging out in the neck and maybe elsewhere and I'm not going to get into all that but clearly at some point the will is going to flo you know float up and there'll be you know some people that want to name John King of the North and of course um, at some point John will be leading the forces of the living and it makes sense for him to be named King of the North. I do think he will be named King of the North, although I would prefer it if they go back to the old title and call him King of Winter. Maybe they will. We'll talk about the King of Winter in a bit. Fenrisian, I appreciate your, uh, appreciate your extra mythology additions. If there's anything particularly tasty that I don't catch, please do leave it in the comments so I can see it later. I don't have a ton of time to stop and go on side branches today. But uh, yeah, if there's anything particularly good that I should look at, then leave it in the comments. And I certainly will. So yeah, Ghost is a wolf. Sometimes he's going to have resting, you know, wolf face. There's that. Somebody said he looks pissed off. He's a wolf. All right. So then we've got the Pact of Ice and Fire. Uh, mild, mild spoilers for this season of House of the Dragon. Although, of course... This is full, this is an account from Fire and Blood full of rumors, and we don't know how the show's going to play this, so soft spoilers, but Jace goes to Winterfell and meets with this fella, Cregan Stark, who's actually a bit younger maybe than he looks. In the, all the Starks look old, I, I think. Perhaps they look like old men. But Cregan Stark and Jace, they strike up an alliance uh, to get the Starks to help Rhaenyra, and part of that is a wedding pact. And Jace promises to wed his firstborn daughter to Cregan's son, who is one at that time. Chase doesn't have any daughters, but he says, when I have a daughter, we'll marry it to your son, and we'll send a Targaryen princess north uh, to, to wed Jace's son. So, 
There is also somebody called Sarah Snow there, potentially. This is a mushroom rumor, maybe, maybe not. We're all waiting to see what the show does with this, but supposedly uh, Cregan Stark's bastard sis- half-sister is named Sarah Snow. Oh, we'll get to the Flaming Swords, Kelly Johnson. We'll get there. Um, the rumor is that uh, Jace, who's betrothed to Bela, by the way, uh, laid with Sarah Snow in front of the old gods. The old gods looked on, but it was okay because they actually got married, um, which would screw with the idea of Jace promising his trueborn daughter to Cregan, which is why this is all very suspect. But there could be some affair there. And the point is, it's a Targaryen prince and a northern girl named Sarah Snow. So it's pretty similar to Rhaegar and Lyanna, whose son is Jon Snow. And the main thing is that this pact is never fulfilled because Jace does not live long enough to have any daughters. And so there is this hanging pact of ice. It's called the Pact of Ice and Fire. This is to give you a clue of what, like, what ice and fire is about, Stark and Targaryen. And it was supposed to be, yeah, a wedding between a Stark and Targaryen. It never took place. So if John and Dan, or Rhaegar and Lyanna, I guess we could say, is the long overdue fulfillment of the Pact of Ice and Fire, and there are these parallels between Rhaegar and Lyanna and Jace and Sarah Snow. And so there is a rumor that Vermax laid a clutch of eggs down in the Winterfell crypts. And I think that is actually more likely. <laughs> I did hear that great race, Tim. I think it's actually more likely that um, instead of Vermax laying an egg, and of course, Vermax sounds like a boy's dragon name, but we don't know. We don't know the gender of any of the dragons unless they lay eggs. That seems to be the only way that anyone tells. Um, And it could be that they can switch sex like in Jurassic Park. There's so much we don't know. But the point is, it is possible that Vermax could have laid an egg in the crypts. And maybe there's a place down in the crypts that's close to the warm springs that's a little warmer Um, It's almost certain that the crypts do connect to caverns. We know that the caverns go all through the hills and they probably come out in the woods. And by the way, if Bale the Bard and his maid hid out in the crypts for a year, the logical, what did they eat? They didn't sneak up into Winterfell kitchens and steal food. People would have recognized either one of them. What Bale probably did was go out into the woods and hunt a bit by following the cave system out into the wolf's wood going, sneaking out, hunting, and then going back into the caves. That's probably how they did that. Um, And Vermax also probably wouldn't have been able to go down that spiral stairwell. Maybe Vermax found a cave in the forest, followed that down into the crypts and laid an egg. That's possible. However, if you're going to make a marriage alliance and you're Jace in this situation, uh, it would make sense if they actually brought an egg to Winterfell as a promise, a down payment, if you will, and said, you know, we're gonna bring, we're gonna bring a Targaryen princess. We're gonna marry, we're gonna marry it to your, marry her to your son, and their child will be due a dragon's egg, and here it is in advance, right? So they would have to show them how to make a dragon egg warmer. But yeah, so if there's a there, there's a couple different ways that there could be an egg involved. But yes, all this pact of ice and fire stuff. Heavy Rhaegar and Lyanna parallels, and all points to RLJ. And the last RLJ clue that we're going to talk about today is this piece of art from Justin Sweet. So again, Sarah Snow and Jay supposedly made love as the old gods looked on. And now we see that Rhaegar and Lyanna have visited the Isle of Faces. Now, here's one of the interesting things that I found while researching... RLJ. Rhaegar and Lyanna disappear almost two years before Ned finds Lyanna at the Tower of Joy with baby John. Uh, do I think the caves are for some Helm's Deep situation in case the others attack? Oh, that's a good thought, Frabicello. The, the caves in Winterfell, there will be obviously a big battle at Winterfell using the crypts caves to escape into that. Yes. Yes, yes, that makes tons of sense. Nice one. Getting back to this. This is the Isle of Faces, Rhaegar and Lyanna here. Okay, so they disappear, and it's almost two years before Ned finds Lyanna at the Tower of Joy with baby John. 
So Leanna actually didn't necessarily conceive John right away. They had a, a big window of time that um, they hung out first, like at least seven months or so before John is conceived. So what did they do all that time? They didn't necessarily go to the Tower of Joy and just hang out for a year and a half. We, they, we, they visited the Isle of Faces. We know that now. So the question becomes, how long did they stay on the Isle of Faces? What did they do there? Was John perhaps conceived on the Isle of Faces? And is that important for some magical reason? <laughs> so yeah, that's one thing I just want to point out. It's a, they got a lot of time that they were apart. John was not conceived right away. And they probably did not stay at the Tower of Joy that whole time. And Arthur Dane and Oswell Went were with Rhaegar and Lyanna when they disappeared together. So Arthur Dane and Oswell Went, who are at the Tower of Joy, they know everything that Rhaegar and Lyanna did. Unlike Gerald Hightower, who was sent to the Tower of Joy by Ares to drag Rhaegar back to King's Landing. And isn't that an interesting difference? Someone should make a video about that coming next month. So let's move on. RLJ is true, as we have seen. So next part of the John Iceberg, who is the real John Snow? And again, shout out to Alt Shift X. His video is terrific. I'm not going to disagree with a lot of the character analysis. I'm also not going to spend a ton of time repeating anything he said. So I will move to this part pretty quickly, but hopefully give you some good insight on the character. So first of all, Book John is a no-show on the show. He did not show up. We did not see him. Show John, and and uh, Alt Shift did a great job of this. Um, show John doesn't say much, especially the last two seasons. In season six, he's still giving like three sentences at a time. The last two seasons, it's just it's terrible. He doesn't say much. He doesn't think very much. Um, he's not very clever. Like Book John is constantly using his brain. He's thinking about stuff. He's thinking outside of the box. He's using strategies, using diplomacy. Show John just kind of likes to chop stuff, just run at the run into the line of the, the enemy. Okay. Um, Book John keeps, oh, I don't want it. You know, he's just this quiet, unambitious thing. Varys even says, <laughs> Thank you, Kelly Johnson. Yeah, exactly. And Varys even says, oh, he's the perfect king because he doesn't want it, which is dumb because being president or king or anything like that is really hard. And to do a hard job, you have to want to do it. Just we'll say that. <laughs> we should force someone to do something against their will. Then they'll do a great job. No. In any case, Book John is ambitious. He does want stuff. He wants Winterfell. He wants his father's sword. He wants to be recognized. He wants all kinds of stuff. So when Stannis offers him Winterfell and Val and the name, he wants it. He knows he wants it. Um, and then RLJ, despite the fact that these folks do look very nice together, and they did have a bit of chemistry in the cave scenes. Maybe that's just the torchlight or whatever. But And by the way, I'm wearing the same rose-colored rose -colored glasses that I wore for the Danny Iceberg, just to be fair. Just to be fair. So yeah, RLJ was a dud story. And what I mean by that is that they really only used RLJ to create political tension between these two. These two. They did not talk about it in regards to John riding the dragon, right? Um, they didn't use it to, oh, John and Danny, the last two Targaryens. Both of them have felt isolated and they've longed for family. Like, how about a hug? Oh my God my brother's son, you know, like, no, there's not one minute. As soon as Danny tells, as soon as John tells Danny about RLJ and the Crips, she immediately goes right to the political challenge and she's threatened and it was the mad queen. They didn't, it was crap, like absolute crap. And in the books, this is going to be very emotional. Both of these people, like I said, John's a bastard. Danny is isolated. The last Targaryen for all she knows and it's going to mean a lot when they find out that they exist to each other, 
even before any romance um, happens. So it's complete dud on this on the show. Kelly Johnson show talked about John Danny romance through the uh, through others. Um, a little bit. I mean, it, no, I mean, they did have a romance on the show. There's there's no doubt about that. I'm just, it kind of fell flat. They didn't. What I'm saying is they didn't talk about the the found family idea. They didn't bond over that. We didn't really see them, you know, really talk about it. And and the weird thing is that John rode the dragon and they never connected that. They never talked about that. Um, Another John, book John, show John weird thing is his unresolved zombie status. He was raised from the dead. And then nobody treated him like a zombie. And if he's not a zombie, then all the Northmen should have been looking at him like, why aren't you on the wall and why are you breaking your oaths? If the idea is he doesn't have to... What's up, Girl Nettles in the chat? If, if, if it was like a matter of, well, John doesn't have to be Lord Commander anymore because he's dead and alive again, so his oaths are fulfilled. Well, then other people should know. And also, if John is raised from the dead... That would spread like a legend. We've seen George play with this. The way, what you know, the things that Danny does become legend in real time. If John had been raised from the dead, everyone would be talking about it. They'd be looking at him as a god. And they mentioned that real quick. Tormund did. Oh, they, they, they're not sure. You know, they think you're a god. You were brought back. There would be a lot more of that. Um, so yeah, it really. He wasn't different either. <laughs> and George has talked about how death changes you in his world. And we got Barrack and Stoneheart. And yet John comes back and he's the same dude with less dialogue, I guess, but really dumb, really dumb. Um, and of course, as I always say, and just get the message out. If you ever hear anyone saying, Oh, well, George told Dave and Dan the ending and Danny's going to go mad in the books too and kill a bunch of people. And John's going to have to kill her. No, 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 no. <laughs> just tell them no it's very simple there's it's dave and dan said that we came up with the john and danny ending around season three i'll put up the quote actually i've got it right here i think the final scene between john and Daenerys is something we came up with sometime in the midst of the third season of the show the broad strokes of it anyway but there was a tremendous amount of pressure to get it right because we know that this is not a scene that's giving people what they want no it's not and you didn't get it right but the point is they came up with the broad strokes Okay. Um, so, and thanks Kelly Johnson. Um, so like George told them about three quote, Oh shit moments that they were like, Oh, we just couldn't believe it. When George told us about this, one of them was Shireen being burned. The other one was Hodor's hodoring. Uh, and the last one was Bran being the King at the end. And so we know all those ideas came from George and that we will see some version of those ideas in the books. We all know Shireen's probably going to be burned. We see the foreshadowing there. King Bran makes sense when you think about him as a green seer king. And I've tried to explain that in some videos. Um, and the Hodoring, something will clearly happen uh, like that. Dragon's Dogma released 2012. Then Dragon's Dogma 2 came out 12 years later. Dance of Dragons came out in 2011. Is this a sign? <laughs> yeah, well, George's recent blog post is being interpreted as a sign of... Well, but look, we're always holding out hope here and we're enjoying the books in the meantime. But getting back to this Dave and Dan thing, Danny going crazy and massacring the citizens of King's Landing would, would qualify as an oh shit moment, obviously. And John murdering her also would qualify as a, that kind of moment. Uh, but those didn't make the list. The three oh shit moments are Hodor Bran and Shireen. So that just tells you just what they said. Dave and Dan came up with the John Danny ending. And that means Mad Queen Danny and the murder because John only needs to murder her because she went mad and killed so many people that she's obviously on the way to becoming Hitler and we better take her out now. So the whole thing that is Dave and Dan's creation. For a fact, they've admitted that. So there's no debate about that. If anyone says it's George's idea, they're just wrong. And you can be very polite to them and kindly inform them of what the creators have said about the books. 
give them a hug, bring them into the circle of truth and light, uh, that we don't know what Danny's ending is on the show. And it is unlikely to follow the show or the book ending. And we shouldn't try to reverse engineer the show ending into the books because it's going to be different. I think I have made my point and we will move on. The one thing about Jon Snow's show ending that could be right and that may have come from George is Jon going north of the wall at the very end. And this is what I have been calling the cold hands ending for years because cold hands is this eternal ranger. We don't know um, how long he's been wandering. You know, they killed him long ago. The, The children of the forest are saying long ago. It's probably many, many, many years Maybe he's one of Blood Raven's Raven's Teeth, but I think he's way older than that. The point is, he's a zombie ranger, and he's roaming the haunted forest in perpetuity. So maybe John will take up that role at the end. That would be bittersweet, right? Um, he's kind of alive, but not, and he's got to range the north forever. White John level go two on one. Well, there is no Night King in the books. That's the thing. There is no Night's King in the books. There's just an ancient character whom I speculate may be around in the Weirwood Net to body snatch Euron and come back to life or something, but we don't know. So the what we won't see is like Arya jumping in at the last second to do the thing that Jon obviously should do. That's That won't happen. Um, I think everyone will have a fulfilling and important role in the end game. So that's... John having purple eyes after he's being rezzed. I don't think so. I do think he'll have white hair as everyone has been talking about for years because of Elric and Blood Raven and all that stuff. But the Cold Hands ending is also Frodo-esque. If you remember, Frodo has the wound from the ring wraith from the Morgul blade and he's carried the ring and he just kind of like, it's too, it's too much evil too much residue for him to just live in the Shire. He has to go to the blessed land, blessed isles with the elves where the healing magic is stronger and the taint won't hurt him quite so much. So it's kind of this idea that like, after you've been through something really intense and magical, it transforms you and you might not be able to just go back to your old life. John's been resurrected, or at least he will have been resurrected. And we don't know what, kind of shape he's going to be in, but we shouldn't think that he could just go back and live a normal life. So him being a cold hands and ranging the North forever, it's very bittersweet, but it might be the only thing he could do as a zombie after all this is over. Um, so it's, it's <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the cold hands ending. It is a possibility. I think I could see a few different things, but when we saw it on the show, you know, we already had been talking about it in the fandom. So as soon as we saw him go north at the end, I was like, oh, it's the cold hands ending. Look. So um, uh, that was by Justin Sweet, that last artwork. Sorry, Justin Sweet. And this one is by John Boccaccio. This is a calendar artwork. Tremendous Jon Snow. I used it in my Norse, Norse mythology John uh, videos which I didn't bother to summarize in this iceberg, but John does have some cool Norse mythology parallels. Check out my uh, Norse Ice and Fire playlist. There's an Odin Origins John video. It talks about him as a, well, you're probably familiar with the Berserker, like the Berserker warriors. Those are bear warriors. There's a wolf version of that called Ulf Hednar. And John is basically an Ulf Hednar. He's a wolf warrior. The war skin changing thing is part of that, so. That's very cool Norse mythology. If you want to check that out, that's, uh, like I said, Odin Origins, John. But we're not going to do that today. This picture just reminds me of it. John will become a broken man. So glad I found your channel, man. This is my she's knit. Um, uh, You mean like in the uh, Septon Maribald sense? It's almost like more than that. I mean, in a sense, yeah, but not in the same way. Like the broken man is like the infantry man that like, breaks and runs that's that's not john he's broken in the sense that he's dead and resurrected yeah game of thrones was a slap in the face kelly um and they literally said they just did it to like as a twist there was not even a sensible reason and the annoying thing is that Arya should have used her faceless men powers to try to kill cersei that was a very obvious tactical thing that somebody in the room should have suggested hey Arya. You can wear people's faces to the point that no one can recognize you and just go wherever you want. 
Maybe you could go to King's Landing and assassinate Cersei and just save us all a whole bunch of time. But no, they didn't do that. They just said, well, Arya learned how to run really quiet in Bravos, And that's why she was able to run really quiet. But the White Walkers didn't notice. You saw the hair blow and that was Arya. And then she had a secret trampoline because she learned that in Bravos too. Really dumb. Anyways, yeah, thanks, Kelly. Appreciate that. Whenever I'm like feeling sleepy and I need to get the blood flowing, I just think about the Game of Thrones ending and all the things that were dumb about it. In any case, the real Jon Snow, it's kind of the flip side of what we said earlier. Real Jon is clever. He is resourceful and he's curious. He's thinking, again, differently than other people. And he is experimenting and he's reading about stuff. He's asking questions. Okay. Um, he is resourceful. He is, uh, like I mentioned, the Iron Bank and the Glass Gardens at the bottom. You see the bottom uh, talking point. He gets, he, at some point when he's Lord Commander, he's like, we should make Glass Gardens like at Winterfell so we can grow crops here. To which we all should say, duh, why didn't anyone do that a long time ago? Um, he creatively, uh, you know, uh, the Iron Bank stops by for a different reason. And he's like, hey, how about let's make a deal and you bring us some food and stuff. So... John is very resourceful. Thank you, Qantas, and thank you, Kelly Johnson. The Clegane Bowl was well shot, but didn't make sense for Sandor. Sandor gives a speech to Arya. He's like, yeah, revenge. It's really bad. It's just, you know, not worth it. And then he goes and fights Sand Clegane. Anyway, um, but the lighting, the light was good on the stairwell. So John, right in the first chapter, uh, Bran's first chapter, it says that John has eyes that didn't miss much. So he's observant. He had to bastards grow up faster. Um, he does experiments with whites when he's Lord Commander. He has a couple of the whites captured and they put him in the ice cells because he wants to see what they do. So he's very smart and practical. He's not just afraid of it. He's like, well, what do they do? How does it work? <laughs> What's the world building here? Um, and then, of course, uh, Maester Aemon advises him to read Colloquial Votar in the Jade Compendium. So much like reading Rhaegar, his dad. He is reading about Azor High. He also adjusts to his Night's Watch reality very quickly. Um, there's a, you know, Tyrion talks about that. Tyrion breaks it down for him, shatters his illusions, and then notices that Jon adjusts pretty quick. So, I'm afraid we might lose Ghost physically when Jon is brought back. His soul will remain melded with Jon, but no more ear scratches. Layla... I think I might be the, well, I'm probably not the first one, but I'm definitely one of the first people to preach that doctrine. And I will explain why. Um, but as I always say, it is only meat that will die. The ghost spirit will be merged with John and they will both live happily in John's body together as John the Wolfman. So he can scratch his own ear, perhaps. We'll get to that though. We'll get to that. And thank you, 700 people watching. Love y'all. Thanks for spending Easter with me. Oh, yes. And we then one of the new theories I have is about dragon's eggs. So Easter eggs, dragon's eggs. Got some behind me there. Moving right along. The real Jon Snow. Oh, so I'm sorry. I just, yeah. I mentioned Maester Aemon and Coloco Votar. So here's just another piece of artwork. This is by Mark Simonetti. I found this one recently. I hadn't seen it before, so... Book John is clean shaven and he does often look angry. So sort of edge Lord Rhaegar vibes here a little bit. And there's a cool Maester Aemon. Um, and Maester Aemon also points out some of John's better qualities, right? Like he sees John uh, and, you know, basically helps put him in the position to be groomed for command because he sees John's character. He tests John, asks him questions about what to do with Sam, for example. And John gives a very good answer about how certain people are good at certain things and certain people are good at other things. And if you try to make someone do something they're not good at, they'll fail. But why don't we have them do something they are good at so we can make use of them? Which is a really smart and common sense argument. But some of the other people like Alistair Thorne are so worked up on rage and toxic masculinity and Sam can't fight. So we're just going to beat him up until he cries or becomes a man, you know? Um, and John is much smarter than that. So this is Maester Eamon sees that. And that's partly how he ends up uh, Mormont Squire. 
Will we see super strong Berserker Jon Snow again? Of course. We've seen him three times. Uh, he jumped on the table to try to stab Sir Alistair Thorne. Had to be restrained by like eight people. He yanked the Ashwood spear with the head on it out of the snow with one arm when it took all the, the other two spears, two men each, like working at it to get him up. And he just yanks it out. Um, and then when he goes into a rage fighting uh, Leathers, he starts thinking about Rob and Winterfell. And then he comes to and they're like, dude, pack up. I said, I said yield. What's wrong with you? And he just like, he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I, uh. I went somewhere. I went to the bad place. Sorry. So yeah, we'll definitely see that again. <clears throat> so John is Ned's son. He is Ned's son. And, uh, you know, even though Rhaegar is his biological father, obviously Ned raised him. That makes him his dad, if you will. And we see many traits that John picks up from that. I mentioned that acceptance, you know, resolving to do your duty, even if it's tough, even if it might mean your death. He got that from Ned. You know, Ned, he he never shirks his duty. He's handed a bunch of stuff that was for Brandon, and he just just takes it up. Age of 19, just bears it all. Um, he bears the secret of John's identity for the sake of Leanna. He goes down to King's Landing, even when it's not the thing he wants to do to help Robert. So he's very dutiful, very honorable, very courageous, both of these men. Um, there's a deep dedication to doing right here. Uh, and this is really something that stood out to me. John cares so much about doing the right thing. He obsesses over it. Almost like some religious person, like a very religious person, not some, just a very religious person, like... He breaks his oaths and he think he just torments him that he slept with Ygritte, even though clearly it's not a big deal. And actually, he's just not supposed to have not supposed to have children or take a wife. It doesn't say that he can't lie with a woman, but he's taken it, the oath as far as he can. And he's just constantly thinking about doing what's right. So is Ned. So these are people with a strong moral compass. And even if they make mistakes, these are people that like they're not going to deceive people they're not going to betray people like they're always trying to do the right thing and they take it really seriously both john and ned um now cat is giving john the sort of message you're lucky to be here right other other situations the bastard brother doesn't get to live with the trueborn kids he'd be in the winter town somewhere and ned would have somebody taking care of him but he doesn't he raises him as a kid um, and, uh, that's something that obviously creates tension with Kat. Um, so Kat gives John this, uh, you know, John does have the feeling like he is lucky, you know, to be here in a sense. He does appreciate the things that he's given. We'll talk about the privilege in a second, but yeah, nothing is taken for granted. I don't think from John. Uh, do you think John could be taken north of the wall before being resurrected? Yes. So I'll get to that, but yes. And then uh, Ned's raising John has left John with loyalty to the Starks. He's very loyal to the Starks, to Winterfell, to the old gods. When Stannis offers John Winterfell, he says that John will have to rip up and burn the heart tree. And John says, no. He looks at Ghost and he's like, that one belongs to the old gods. And it says, then he had his answer. So the answer saying no to Stannis, it's not about a Night's Watch oath and this and that. It's more about, I'm not going to desecrate the memory of my family by tearing up the heart tree. So this is something, yeah, John has respect for the traditions of Ned and the Starks. Oh, this is John Picaccio also. And this is probably my favorite Valerian steel sword artwork, incidentally. This is obviously ice. And I love the rippling here. I love the, the smoky gray look of it. And I think this is my favorite. I love the Ned. I love the heart tree. This is just one of my favorite Ice and Fire artworks ever. Attack on Titan, yes, a long time ago. I don't remember it very well. Um, so then we've got, uh, no, Cat was not told. Cat does not know who John is. The secret was too dangerous. Some things are better left unsaid. 
Ned thinks to himself at one thing. Some secrets are dangerous. So this is by Kit Rose. This is incredible Leanna, Knight of the Laughing Tree artwork. You can see the Knight of the Laughing Tree shield, the lower left and the weirwood trees and Leanna with the sword and the rose crown and the white dress. Northern bastards definitely seem to be treated differently compared to Southern. Definitely a faith-based thing from what it seems. That's somewhat true, Cat. That's somewhat true. And Cersei thinks if Cat had any, if Catelyn had any medals, you know, any spine, she would have killed John, as Cersei put uh, many of Robert's bastards to death. We'll get to the Shireen question, Katrina. We will get there. And so, um, yeah. Uh, Leanna's son, John has the wolf blood. We just said, John is fiery. He's impulsive. He does have that rage. There's no question John has the wolf blood. He, he has the blood of the dragon and the wolf blood, okay? Um, so yeah, this is another difference between like show John is very measured and controlled most of the time. Book John is not always that way. So Night of the Laughing Tree, this is one of my favorite parallels. Check this out. What's one bastard boy against a kingdom? Everything, Stannis, everything. <laughs> I love that you're asking that. It's on point for the avatar. The night of Leanna is the Night of the Laughing Tree. Um, next Sunday. Me and Tim are going to reread the Bran Stark chapter with the Night of the Laughing Tree story. So if you're a little foggy on it, don't worry. We'll cover that next week. And also give Tim a chance, by the way, to opine on Jon Snow, one of Tim's favorite characters. So yeah, Tim, Tim, uh, Tim, Tim Salabim. He will be here next week to give his take on Jon as well. But Lyanna is the Night of the Laughing Tree. And before she enters the tourney in disguise as the Night of the Laughing Tree, of course... She defends Howland Reed against bullies. Hey, Tim, there you are. Three bullies. One of them is a, uh, they're three squires. They're about 15 or so. They're bigger than Howland. Leanne is, again, same age, 14 or 15. And they're kicking him and punching him. And Howland is curling up on the ground. And they're, they're, they're kicking the Cranog man because he's a frog man. And then they heard a roar. And the she-wolf said, that's my father's man you're kicking. And she pulls out a wooden tourney sword and lays into these three bullies and beats the hell out of them and chases them off. Who does that remind you of? Jon Snow defending Sam against three bullies in the training yard of Castle Black. So same odds, three on one, same situation. You know, Howland and Sam are the same. They're getting bullied. And there comes John, like, John is doing a pretty risky thing here because he's also standing up to Alistair Thorne. Alistair Thorne is responsible for the bullying of Sam. He's the one telling the other kids to keep hitting Sam. And John stands up to Alistair and those bullies. And the same thing with Leanna. Like, when she enters the tourney as the Knight of the Laughing Tree, she angers Ares. Okay. And Ned also talks about uh, Leanna standing up to Robert. Robert's like, oh, Leanna wouldn't have done this. And <laughs> Ned's like, you don't know Leanna. You didn't know the iron underneath. Like she would, she would have told you not to participate in this tourney. So this is a truth to power thing with Leanna and John. They both do what's right, even to speaking up to authority. How pissed do you think John will be when he wakes up? Pretty pissed. We'll talk about why, but we'll see. Um. Yeah, all the resurrection stuff is coming. Don't worry. So yeah, John standing up to bullying. Same thing as Leanna. Goes one step further. Because Leanna afterwards, she takes Howland to the Stark's tent. Takes care of him. They talk him into coming to the feast as their guest. They offer to give him honor, uh, armor if he wants to enter the tourney to avenge himself. And instead, Leanna does it. Leanna avenges Howland. But the point is, they take care of Howland and then bring him into the pack. John does the same thing with Sam, doesn't he? He doesn't just stop the bullying one day. He goes to all the other Night's Watchmen and gets all the recruits and gets them all on the same page, gets them unified, brings Sam into their pack and protects him against Alistair Thorne. So it's a very detailed correlation. And standing up to bullies is... It's basically story code for like, this is a heroic person. This is a good person, right? So love that. That's Leanna and John. 
Do you think the connection between Howland, RLJ, and the Isle of Faces? What is what was Howland there? What do you think the timeline is? So Isaac Jacobson, you, if you came in late, I'm going to explain that. I've got two RLJ videos coming. First one is RLJ, a love story. It'll be out in a couple weeks. And then in May, RLJ, secret wedding will answer the questions that you are asking. I have very detailed theories about all of those things. So you're asking the right questions. Yes. So moving on. And I'm going to need to take a bathroom break real quick here. Just because sometimes that happens. John is also Rhaegar's son. He's reading Rhaegar. <laughs> Look at this artwork. This is brand new. This is by Enesat One. Reading Rhaegar. And this one is by Nick. Nick Delegaris. So, Nick Delegaris, you've seen that one before. This is one I just found. Enesat One, reading Rhaegar. Um, let me go ahead and uh, hit the restroom. And uh, let's see, should I give you the music or should I leave this beautiful artwork up for you to look at? I will leave the beautiful artwork up and be right back. And we're back. Thank you very much. All right. So Romeo and his northern girl. I already talked about this a little bit. Rhaegar and his northern girl. Jon Snow and his northern girl. So these echoes, right? Um, both of them like to brood and both of them wear black. Just kind of an obvious correlation. Do I think Jon is more aligned with dragon or wolf? Oh, I it's a I think it's a nice, healthy mix, but um, I could see it's a lot of Targ dragon stuff attached to John, as we're going to see today. So why don't uh, we'll see it. We'll get to the end of the stream and then uh, and then we'll uh, we'll talk about it. So then we've got uh, so sober, dutiful and passionate. Rhaegar is sober, doesn't visit brothels. Um, don't know if he's smoking long bottom leaf down there in the in the library, but for this part, he is dutiful. He reads something in a scroll and comes out and says, well, seems like I must be a warrior. What he's actually saying is, I've got to get ready to go play my part in saving the world, and it's going to require me to be a warrior, which I wasn't going to do, but now I will. So kind of like Ned, there is that obligation, sense of responsibility, in fact, the sense of responsibility is incredible here. If you think about it, you know, you could call this main character syndrome, except for it's fantasy. And we have Aegon's prophecy and all this other stuff. So Rhaegar had a reason to have main character syndrome. However, <laughs> he, I mean, he made himself responsible for the fate of the world. And John is kind of the same too. Like he does not hesitate to take on just all this responsibility. So yeah, I mean, it's like a sense of ownership, you know, it's pretty ridiculous. So then we've got uh red fire and black ice. Okay. So this is cool, right? Um, remember I just said earlier in the stream, the blue rose appears in a chink in the wall and it is a symbol of one of, John's parents, Leanna. Well, there's a different scene. It's in the chapter where John is letting the wildlings through the wall, I believe. And it's the last light of the sun. The sun is fading. So shout out to the keyhole and smog's mountain or whatever. Last light of the sun reflects off of the cracks in the ice. So the chinks in the ice and the light reflects on the melt water in the cracks. And it says streaks of red fire turned to rivers of black ice because the wall is weeping and melting. And so you have to imagine the sun glinting on the wall 
and for a minute it lights up at the top with this red fiery twinkle. And then as you look down, you can see it go into the shadow. And in the shadow, it looks like these rivers of black ice. So red fire and black ice. Of course, that's John's Azor High Dream. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. He's armored in black ice and his sword burns red in his fist. So it's a very cool ice and fire symbolism, but in the colors of House Targaryen, red and black ice and fire. So the fact that we see it both in John's dream where he wields Lightbringer or a Lightbringer, a red burning sword, and we also see the same symbol in a crack in the wall where we also saw the blue rose. So John has, or George Martin has put both symbols of John's parents in the same place, in a crack in the wall in the ice, and John will be tied to the cracking of the wall, in case you're wondering. Yes. And that also is a symbol, the sun injecting fire into the wall that turns into a river of ice. This is talking about the comet that's going to hit the wall, because the comet is like a bit of fire from the sun, and it's going to crack the wall and then we will get rivers of ice and there'll be black ice because it'll be in the darkness. We will get to all the apocalypse symbolism tied to John as we go. But yes, it is also an apocalypse symbol as well as a very cool Targaryen colored ice and fire symbol for John. Good stuff, right? Love that one. And again, just a little more reading Rhaegar here by Enesat one warrior of light. Love this. Love this. And reading Rhaegar from the other room is saying that he likes it as well. You can't hear him, but he's saying it. So Now, John stands up to bullies, uh, but before that, he's the bully. And you may remember this, Donald Noy, one of John's many, 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 many positive male role model father figures. There's like 10. We'll talk about that in a second. Donald Noy, after John had been beating people up, in the yard a little bit. Um, remember, there was four of them that ganged up late at night to beat up John. And two of those were Gren and Toad. And two of the others were rapers and whatever that uh, Yorin had brought up from the wall. So two total scumbags and Toad and Gren before John is friends with them. Will Titanic magic be unleashed before the end? What kind of question is that, Kelly? You know that it will. I'm going to tell you about some of it. Moon meteors and also year on and deep one. There's lots of stuff coming. So John, essentially these four bullies come to pick on John and John, of course, is able to stand up to them and beat them up and send them running. And I think the wolf is involved too. I can't remember. No, the wolf is not involved. It's just John. But then Donald Noy shows up. I think he's kind of the one that ends the fight, but John is holding his own because he is castle trained. And that's what Donald Noy says to him. He says, you better check yourself before you really wreck yourself. And that's why there's ice cube in the notes, but that's what he says. He says, look, you are a bully. You have been trained in a castle yard by an actual warrior. And these guys have it. And so you're using your training to humiliate them and you're taking out all your anger on them. Well, how do you think they feel? They look dumb. And one of these days, it's going to get a knife in your belly. You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. And so John, he's kind of like, what do you mean a, a bully? They're ganging up on me. And he's like, no, you're the bully. You have the advantage of being trained when they don't. And so this is what we call relative privilege. I'm not going to do a whole speech on privilege, but privilege is entirely relative. The whole concept of privilege just means that like some people have it harder than you and you might have it harder than other people. That's all it means. So for John, relative to Rob and his other brothers, he has a lack of privilege because he's a bastard and he has this shame mark on him and Catelyn doesn't treat him well. And eventually Sansa treats it, calls him half brother. Rob doesn't deal with that. Rob has the privilege of not being a bastard. However, John has a privilege of being castle trained and raised in a castle. He's been fed better food. He's healthier, okay, than than these guys that have just been dragged to the wall and towed and grin. And so, instead of enemies to lovers, we go enemies to totters. Because Todd, 
or Toad rather, his real name is Totter. So enemies to Totters. Gren and, to and Toad obviously become two of John's best friends. So this is a real grow uh, growth moment for John to go from not seeing his own privilege because he's too, he's feeling sorry for himself for being sent to the wall. So he gets slapped around by Donald Noy and he's like, oh, you're right. And so then what does he do? He starts protecting Sam from bullies and he organizes all the recruits, including the ones that were picking up on him, makes them friends. It's great stuff. Great character stuff. All right. So important character lesson for John, no doubt. <laughs> I don't know who the artist is on this one, but this is uh, Sam, John, Ed, Pip, and Gren. Just raking weird with leaves in, in the Grove of Nine, you know, just having fun. So just want a little, little lighthearted moment. He made friends with all these guys. A little misfit bunch. And of course, we see Satin come along later, a male sex worker, a boy whore, and everyone's prejudiced against him. And John is like, no, he's quick and clever and smart and he's agile and he's a good shot and we're going to make use of him and treat him like a human. So John, we're going to talk about the wildling bigotry too, but John is just very consistent about, remember what I said with Maester Eamon, John sees different ways to make use of people. He doesn't see, he doesn't rule people out because they're flawed. He finds a way to, uh, to see the worth in people. So you love that about John. Good kid. Good kid. All right, let's keep going. Craster's Keep. John is a Craster objector. <clears throat> if John's privilege made him like this, then it was good privilege. No, that's no, that's not it. No, John had to put his privilege in check in order for him to be a good leader. The privilege is not helping. The privilege had to go. The sword training is good, but he needed to mix that with humility and understanding and all privilege really means is being aware that's all it doesn't mean you have to cut your own hand off so that you're not more privileged than jamie lannister it just means that john needs to appreciate the fact that the other kids haven't been trained and that's all and then he's better able to interact with them in a way that doesn't humiliate them because that doesn't help anybody so john is He's kind to Gilly, not as kind as Sam, but he is kind to her uh, when she comes to him and she's asking for help. He, he has to turn her down, but he is empathetic. He chooses not to sleep inside Craster's, which is awesome because F that guy. And of course, most importantly, he raises an objection to Mormont and he says something to Craster and kind of makes a scene or whatever. Good. <laughs> this is Mormont. The Night's Watch has gone down a bit of a slippery slope. And Mormon is like, yeah, you know, sometimes it's the difference between life and death, Craster's keep, blah, blah, blah. But what is he doing? He's enslaving all of his daughter wives and giving his children to the others. Right? And this is an unholy pact. And maybe Mormont doesn't understand that the babies are going to the others. He's just giving them to the woods or whatever. And maybe he doesn't believe in the others. But Mormont does seem to kind of believe... I mean, he's like, tell them the trees have eyes again. Like, Mormont is credible with the old gods. This is a Ronsta Sesteo, by the way. Oh, and I forgot an artist. Let me go back. This is Te Iku. Te Iku. Bastard bully artwork. So this is a Ronsta Sesteo. She did a calendar a couple of years ago. I think it's 2023. So yes, he objects. Uh, Mormont is kind of doing a slippery slope thing with the Machiavellian, you know, it's ends justify the means. You get the feeling if John were in charge, he would not be okay with this. So we like that. And of course, John is a war leader in training. And I actually missed the first one. The first one is when he saves Lord Commander Mormont, bravely fighting the white with Ghost. Um, John even reaches his hand into a pile of burning drapes in order to throw them at the white, which is kind of an insane thing to do in the moment. I and mean, that's how he got his burned hand, of course. So it's very, I mean, who would just stick your hand into a fire, right? You might look around for like a stick to grab the drapes. No, he just reached his hand in there 
and threw the burning drapes on the white, and that made the difference. And he saved his Lord Commander. So he's he's brave. He's also again clever. Like Ghost wakes him up. He's like, "Oh, what's wrong, Lassie? Is Timmy stuck in a well?" And he's you know he's pawing at the door. So John figures it out. He goes out there and raises a warning. And uh, yeah, so that was cool. Um, off topic. If Eldrick Shadow Chaser is Westerosi Azor Rahai, why isn't he remembered in any POV? Why isn't that name remembered? It is remembered. That's why all the Starks have all those Eldrick name variants. Elric and Edric and Edarion and all that stuff. And as well as House Dane. I bet you House Dane remembers the name. And somewhere in the annals, the Starks must too. It's probably just been lost knowledge. But yeah, it's there. You can, And that's part of the proof of it is that he is the West, that Elric Shadow Chaser is the Westerosi name, is because there are all these Elric naming variants in House Stark and House Dane, and those are the two Westerosi houses that should be tied to the last year, but we'll get to that. So John, on the raid with Corrin, half-hand, uh, showed bravery, obviously him and Corrin sneak, you know, climbing and sneaking along the ridge and then jumping down and fighting bravely, uh, but then of course he shows mercy to you, Grit, and I guess you could question the full, he only had mercy on her because she's a girl. And otherwise maybe he'd have chopped her head, chopped his head off. It'd have been a guy. I don't know, but he did show mercy. And then later, and then after the initial moment, you know, uh, Corin like leaves it. He's like, I leave it to you to decide what to do. And then he decides to let her go. And he's not chastised for that. He's showing his character. And then later when um, they've crossed the wall and they've come to that village south of the wall, um, Steer, uh, the Magnar, commands John to execute the old man in front of the apple tree. And he won't. That's when he flees. So he even, like, instead of thinking, planning his escape for the best moment, like, part of the reason he fled right then is because he refused to kill an innocent person. So John... It's really interesting. You know, Corrin Halfhand is like, well, you got to do dishonorable things to save the realm because your honor is meaningless. The realm is what's important. But John still sticks to his morality as much as he can and refuses to take Ygritte's life. And the fact that he had mercy on Ygritte is what saved him with the wildlings because it's Ygritte that stood up for him when Lord Bones wanted to kill him. So this is George showing us that mercy can come back around and do you a solid, right? So then, so John shows mercy at the village. Um, and overall, he still succeeded in his mission. He got back to Castle Black as Corrin commanded him to. He brought warning of the wildlings before they came. And he had tons of intelligence about how many men the wildlings had, what their strategy was, all of it. So this is like a James Bond mission that John went on. And although it's very emotional and rocky, he basically succeeded. So he warned Castle Black, but wouldn't harm innocents. Nice job, John. Unfortunately, he had to betray Ygritte, kind of. Um, but we'll talk about that. So Battle of Castle Black, he fought wounded, if you remember. And that's where the, you know, the Magnar is attacking from the south. He's on top of the towers. He's using fire arrows. His leg is hurting something fierce. And he's still limping around and fighting. So Purple Heart for that, I guess you could say. Um, and then a couple days later... He's leading uh, the Night's Watch atop the wall. And we see, you know, people get taken out or they get injured. And then John is left in charge. And so he mans the wall and he does it successfully. He leads the watch and they hold off the wildlings. Then Alistair Thorne shows up and they call John a traitor. And they accuse him of killing Corrin. And they send him on that suicide mission to kill Mance Raider. Remember that? And so John does it instead of mutinying or refusing a command. He says, I'm a man of the watch and I'm commanded to go do this for the watch. And so even though I've got to kill somebody that I'm friends with, I'm going to go do it because this is what I'm supposed to do. And he knows he's going to die. And that's part of it. It's like Alistair Thorne is sending him on a suicide mission and John accepts it. So if in the future... John is called upon to go on a mission to the heart of winter, which looks like it will probably require his life. Is he going to balk? No, he's not. He's going to, he's going to buck it up, stiff upper lip, and he's going to charge right at it and do his duty because that's who he is. He's a hero. 
Um, and he's just shown it time and time again. And then, of course, once Stannis comes and uh, busts up the battle, John acts honorably in that he protects Dalla, Mance's wife. Uh, he does not turn around and start killing wildlings or something like that. Um, and then he treats with Stannis. <clears throat> so then the last thing he does as sort of a growing war leader type of thing is that he devises Stannis's war plan, right? Stannis is about to attack the Dreadfort or something stupid. And John's like, no, 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 no. Don't do this. You got to do that. Um, yeah. So there you go. Uh, he's good. He's a good strategist and I'm sure that will come in handy. So I think I forgot to show you another. Yeah. So this is war leader, John. Oh yeah. This is by, um, Jonathan Burton. So this is the Lord of bones, John with corn half hand at the cave mouth when they were cornered right before John had to fight corn. Another difficult thing that he did. And here's, of course, John atop the wall, leading the defense of the wall. This is by Fictograph. And then we've got more Fodley Ramdani. He's the artist that did the beefcake, John, that's on the cover. So here's war leader, John. This is basically king of the north, John. He's got his Stark outfit. This is, yeah, this is him. He's got his hair tied back like me, kind of. He needs to shave the sides of the head. It's a little cooler if you're down south. But John's in the north, so he doesn't need to do that. So yeah, war leader John. Just more artwork here. Fadli Ramdani once again. It's time for Reconciliator John. Thanks, Beetlebones. John's the reconciliator. Don't worry if you're coming in late and you missed a lot. You can just catch up later. And uh, yeah, we got we got a long way to go still. We've got lots of, lots to cover. So reconciliator John, this is partly a, a part of his Mithras symbolism, and we're going to talk about that in more detail in a moment. But just know that Mithras is heavily associated with contracts, negotiations, and treaties. And John is doing that left and right. He is negotiating contracts and treaties, and most importantly, he is letting the wildlings through the wall to join the lands of the living. So he is a mediator and a reconciliator. He is reconciling the wildlings back to Westeros, to the lands of the living, because he sees that they are no different than first men. They're just on the other side of the wall. And when the others come, they deserve to be on the south side with the lands of the living. And this artwork, by the way, is Jay Barrero, this is John as Azor High, got his Solar King Divine Halo. It's very appropriate symbolism here for today. So the th most important thing about John is he sees through the bigotry of the wildlings. They, all kinds of stories are told about them, but then he goes and lives with them. And he, again, sees the truth. And this leads him to coming back and saying, look, it's the living versus the dead, and they're the living, and they need to come to the south, and we're going to make it work, even if it's tough, and we're even going to take Harma Dog's head and the other disgusting people who have killed Night's Watchmen. Uh, we're going to give them a chance at forgiveness and a chance to man the wall and all this stuff. So it's a big risk, uh, but it's probably the right thing to do. It's very controversial, and of course, it has a lot in common with Danny seeing through bigotry and protecting the weak. Um, you know, Danny's moral compass for leaders. She says, why do the gods make kings and queens if not to protect those who can't protect themselves? And that is what John does. He protects the weak, whether it's Sam, you know, or it's all the wildlings, or it's that old man, or it's your grit. So he passes Danny's test for a good leader. And part of that is a big part of that is his reconciliation, his ability to reconcile. This is a major theme of the books, guys, like grudges and rifts and separations that need to be reconciled. It's such a big part of the story. It's the closest we get to like happy ending theme work is like reconciling stuff. Um, and this will this will also translate to the others as well. And John's role with the others. So we'll keep going with this. Um, oh, this is, yeah. So John starts off knowing nothing, right? This is Maga, uh, Magali Villeneuve. Uh, <laughs> Magali Villeneuve. Magali Villeneuve. 
almost can say it. So this is Ygritte, obviously, looking back at John as they go towards the wall. This piece is titled, You Know Nothing, Jon Snow. It is beautiful, of course. And John, this refrain, you know nothing, Jon Snow. It's, she's just saying, you're ignorant. You don't know all this stuff. You don't know about ways of the North. You don't know that we're actually just the same. But she teaches him. That's the point. That refrain is Ygritte teaching John stuff. So by the time that Ygritte is dead and John is a Lord Commander, he does know stuff. And it's thanks to Ygritte. So you grit, um, you know, and, and this is part of the Romeo and Juliet story, which I'm not an expert on, but apparently it does have a, a lot to do with like the parents are at war and the kids are rejecting. They don't want to just adopt that stance of their parents. And so we see that in House of the Dragon with the kids being forced into the rivalries of their parents. Tyrion talks about dancing on the puppet strings of those who came before. It's a big theme of Ice and Fire. And so John being able to cut against that and break one of those cycles and say, no, this wall was made to stop the others, not the wildlings. We've lost sight of what it's really for, and we're going to reconcile these people to Westeros. So I think I've made my point, but this is the center of John's moral compass. So family, duty, honor. These are the Tully words, of course, but they apply to, they're just theme, theme work words, really. Um, so we mentioned Corrin's slippery slope. Corrin's like your personal honor comes after your duty and after your family. And your family in this case is all of Westeros. He's saying if you have to break your oaths and become a filthy spy and do whatever you need to do, don't balk. And your job is to bring intelligence back to, to the wall so that all of Westeros isn't overrun with murderous wildlings. Okay. So this is a bit of a slippery slope. And we see this with Ned's confession, almost a similar thing. Ned chooses personal disgrace. He admits to something he didn't actually do, right? He, he says, oh yeah, I plotted to steal the throne from Robert and this and that. He reads this false confession in order to try to save Sansa. And this artwork is also Magali Villeneuve, by the way. I think. Uh, let me just double check. Yes, it is. And so Ned Ned accepts this personal... People are going to remember that Ned Stark plotted against Robert now. And he did this to try to save Sansa. It didn't work. But Ned was... Ned decided that family comes before personal honor. And it's the same thing that Corrin is sort of saying to John. This is, however, a slippery slope. And that's why I was saying it's interesting that John doesn't kill innocents and agonizes over every part of his oath that he, you know, breaks or whatever. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it, we see John na uh, navigating this tightrope pretty effectively. He doesn't just go, okay, I've got license to do bad things now. Like, no, he tries to re remain true to his moral compass. Now, this starts to slip a little with Arya. When he takes, at the very end before he's murdered, he's going to take the wildling force and go attack Ramsay Bolton at Winterfell and save Arya. This is a clear breaking of his Night's Watch oaths. He's embroiling the Night's Watch into the wars of the kings, um, but he's doing it for family. So he's kind of violating duty and honor in order to go to bat for his family. So this is the interesting thing about family, duty, honor, is it sounds like a list of priorities. It's actually a list of ranking of importance. And saying that family comes first is kind of mafia-like. It's like, yeah, honor and duty, sticking up for family first, even if the family is doing something dishonorable. And even if I've got to break my duty in order to do it. So we, George loves to pit these things against each other and put people in these conflicts. And we see that with John and Ned both. And John got murdered in large part because he did that. Oh, it's very, very hard and conflicty. And, oh, it's not updated. Let me just, uh, real quick, boom, there we go. This is Ygritte, of course, by Steamy. Love this artwork, very 
kissed by fire, you grit. So this is similar to the last slide that we're talking about. Love, the death of duty. Much is made of this, the conflict between love and duty. Similar to the dynamic that we were just talking about. Um, John has to give up his love, you grit, in order to do his duty, right? And that's tough. Here's the thing, though. Ygritte is choosing her own path, right? She is choosing to attack Castle Black. She knows that's John's family and that's his cause, uh, but she's doing it anyway. And so sometimes when you have to let things go, and I thought about this, like, oh, it's a really hard message that George is giving us here. John did the right thing, right? He did the right thing by betraying Ygritte, quote unquote, and going back to Castle Black. That was his duty at the time. He had to do that before he could let the wildlings through the wall. He can't just let the Magnar overrun Castle Black. That's not the way to reconcile anything. So he had to let Ygrit go and let her choose her own fate. She's an adult, right? And that led to her death. And it's very sad. Um, and this is the thing about doing your duty or whatever. The comparison I want to make is to the misguided idea that John's going to have to kill Danny to save the world. We all know here at this channel that I strongly believe Azor High is a bad guy and that George is kind of messing with us by giving us this myth, oh, you just got to kill your wife to make a magic sword, save the world. Uh, but he gives us this story in Davos's POV and Davos hears it. He's like, well, I could never kill my wife. I must not be a hero. It's like, no, actually you are a hero because you won't sacrifice innocence. That's good. A real hero sacrifices himself or herself. And so this is where I get to the love and duty thing. Self-sacrifice is the highest form of love. And it's, it's even a Bible verse, I, I think. No, there's no greater love than laying down your life for a friend, for someone else, right? So John being willing to risk his life to save other people, to save the world, or Danny choosing to do the same at the end if, she, if that's what she chooses. It is the ultimate act of love, self-sacrifice. So I do think that that is the resolution that George is pushing people towards. He's not trying to say, kill all of your loves and become a monster, like, uh, like uh, in Dark, you know, the villain from Dark, Adam. That's what he's trying to do. Kill all his passions so he won't be obligated to anything. I don't think that's what George is saying. So consider this. Kill the boy and let the man be born is the advice that's given to John. But he kind of takes it too far. He sends all of his friends away to other castles. And then he doesn't have any friends when everyone comes to mutiny him. Um, and so, like, if he had kept his friends... At Castle Black, they could have helped sell his decisions to the other men. Instead, John just makes these decisions and leaves people like Bo and Marsh to stew about it. But if he's got Dollar said and Toad and Grant and stuff, they can go and smooth some of that stuff over for him. So he's not very good at politics. And he took this kill the boy stuff too far. And he sent away all of his friends and then was isolated. So there, there's got to be some balance between love and duty. And I think it's probably, um, it's probably the kind of thing where uh, it's every situation is different, and you just have to navigate it as best you can with your judgment. So clearly, this is the thing with Ygritte. His duty is the death of his love with Ygritte. Kind of, I guess they always love each other, you know. But yeah, so that's a tough one. And this is, oh, this is just more artwork. This one's by Wolf Luke. And so lost puppy John. Oh, there's a German in the chat wondering, yeah, no, we love Dark over here. I am an evangelist for Dark. It's the greatest storytelling I've ever seen on television by far, on any screen of any kind. And if you haven't watched Dark and you're looking for a series to watch, Watch Dark on Netflix. It is incredible. Anyway, um, Lost Puppy John. <laughs> this is his roster of positive male father figure types. Okay, so Ned, obviously. Um, Tyrion, a little bit. Tyrion um, teaches him some pretty important lessons, really, in the first book. He's the one who breaks the news about the watch. 
and helps him acclimate to that. If it weren't for Tyrion, he would have had a much ruder landing with the watch. Gives him some good advice. Benjen, obviously a father figure and a role model to John. Uh, Donald Noy, we talked about him already. Lord Commander Mormont, here by artist R. Valley. It's one of John's major father figures that doesn't need a lot of explaining. And they share a bond with the old gods and a faith in the old gods. Mormont's raven on the shoulders. Maester Eamon, we talked about him. He's obviously a father figure to John. Gives him a lot of advice. Helps bring John's better qualities out. Um, Corrin Halfhand plays a brief father role to John and, and teaches him again some lessons about the watch and honor and stuff like that. And also shows a lot of faith and confidence in John, which counts for a lot too. Um, as well as Mormont and Eamon, they do that as well. And then there's Mance Raider. John and Mance's relationship is really interesting. Um, Mance is almost like someone that's been in John's position. And, and this is the beginning of John really making thinking about what's the difference between the wildlings and the watch. And he's Mance sort of pokes a hole in this idea that the oaths are sacred and you can't violate the oaths. He's like, oh, they made me give up my splash of red fabric. Like, what was the point of that? And wildling music is good, you know? So <laughs> thank you, Michael James. And uh, yeah, Mance also sparred with John a bit too. Honed up that uh, fighting skill. Um, let's see. Leathers is is another one. Oh, the per. Oh, yeah. Who's who? Um, who is the master at arms at Castle Black? It's uh, with the, the bushes, the bushy. I'll wait for that chat to tell me. But yes, I guess that's yet another father figure. Be the master at arms at Winterfell. Roderick. Uh, Roderick Cassell. Thank you. Yes. And he does think about Sir Roderick a couple times. All the Stark kids do. And now the chat being 30 seconds behind. We'll all answer the same thing. Roderick Cassell. Thank you, guys. So yeah, Mance Raider, Tormund Giants Bane. It's a little bit of a bro older brother energy, but there's still some role model and some teaching stuff. So that's cool. Um, with Tormund and obviously lighten, you know, lightens up the mood, but it's talking to him about your grit and his oaths. And again, Tormund is also like, well, what's the shame in a father and a bastard? Like if it's in love and the kids cared for, who cares? You know? So it's just a different perspective than the Andal marriage tradition, shame complex stuff. Um, and this is important for John because he himself is a bastard. So this is a different line of thinking that maybe he's not born bad. Tormund doesn't think so. And then there is Stannis. I don't know if you'd call him a father figure or even a role model, but it's definitely somebody that John might learn lessons from and think about later on down the road. And this is another, uh, you know, older male figure that's in John's story. So it's really incredible how many there are, like just a long line of people that John can learn from. Uh, in order to be a, a good person. That's, and that's kind of why, like we see him able to do all these things, right? I said, he's accepting stuff. He's showing all this high character. Some of that is, is the influence of all these people. And let's give Mance a shout out. This is Mance Raider by Joshua Art. So John is a lost puppy. And there's lots of, lots of role models waiting around. Take care of John. Okay, so let us update, update the frame. And we're actually gonna do, I'm gonna take some, I'll take a quick music break and I'll come back with a different frame, loading up the rest of the, uh, the questions here. So here we go with the mythical astronomy music.
almost a smooth transition, I was saying, into the muted microphone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Almost a smooth transition. Here we are, and we're back. There we go. New theories. Yes, yes. Praise Garth. By the way, if you want a Praise Garth t-shirt or a Reading Rhaegar t-shirt or a Nana Vagar t-shirt, in case you missed that, we got Nana Vagar shirts, the link is below the video. Bonfire store, get your t-shirts. We got more coming every month. We are going to turn into a t-shirt factory. I've always wanted to become a t-shirt factory. I love t-shirts, right? I wear a different t-shirt for every video. They're usually thematically tied. I'm like standing up and making, pointing out the dumb puns on my shirts. I'm a t-shirt guy. So I tried to do uh, t-shirts years ago for all my patrons, but I did the thing where like I found a fact, a local screen printing factory and sent them the design and they made them and sent them to me and then I had to package them and mail them out. And that was a disaster, a disaster. But now we do things in a more organized fashion. We just upload the, uh, we found the very best one of these websites, which is Bonfire. And we just upload the image and then you order the shirt and I don't got to do any shipping and it's great and it works great. And I'm working with artists, several artists, including Atlantis Morissette and uh, Rai Rai Noel and a couple others have given us designs, uh, which, so yeah, we're working with fandom artists and get you a Nana Vagar shirt. That one's hot. I need to order one. I'm embarrassed. I don't have one actually. But let's get going with the next section of theories. So there's like 21 theories or something. These are all under the heading, John is the prince that was promised. I started doing the, 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 the draft for this, the notes for this. And I was like, okay, let's write down all the theories that have to do with John is the prince that was promised. And I couldn't believe how far I got. Like all of these theories are tied to John being the prince that was promised. So there are still, not only are there RLJ deniers out there, recently there has been a trend to sort of say, oh, only Danny is the prince that was promised. And John's not special. And he just, people just want John to steal Danny's stuff, you know? I think I have a slide for this actually. I don't know why I'm saying this. I have this on a slide. Stan Hammer. Where's the Stan Hammer? Yeah. Stan Hammer takes. I've got the Ban Hammer. I've also got the Stan Hammer. The Stans, those are the ones on Twitter who are, you know, gung ho one team or the other. Hashtag Rainier did nothing wrong. Or, you know, I'm glad blood and cheese happened. And, you know, all the obnoxious stuff that we don't do here. Okay. This is younger LML here with shorter haircut. And he's hot on the mic. He's got, he's got the Stan hammer. We're hammering the stands. St standing is not good, guys. Look up the lyrics to Eminem's Stan, which is where the term comes from. Some of y'all are too young. Don't know where this comes from. Stan is a psycho. Stan is a psycho, obsessed fan of Eminem. And uh, it goes to some dark places. So you don't want to be a Stan. Just put that in. Anyway, um, some of the bad takes that I'd like to just quickly hammer down. Uh, first of all, show John is a murderer. So F that guy, screw John. Um, guys, set aside any antipathy you have for show John and just, just put it in a dumpster because he didn't do those things. He would never kill Danny as we've seen. And this is why we did the character stuff first. John doesn't take innocent life, does he? He'll go to great lengths to not do it. <laughs> so this is not something he's going to be doing. Um, and uh, we shouldn't, the point is, don't let show John and specifically the fact that he murdered Daenerys taint your feelings for the book character. Because the book character, as we've seen, is a good boy. He's a good boy. So don't hold that against John. Um, like I said, some people, uh, I think in part because of the books, or not the books, because of the show, they resent John for killing Danny and also the show just for ruining Danny's character. And so they're like, they've come to this idea that actually Danny 
is Azor High Reborn. She's the prince that was promised. John's a red herring or a foil. And people just want John to have Danny's stuff. The dragons are Danny's. She hatched them, not John. And that kind of thing. That's silly. We know that the prince that was promised and Azor High Reborn is a prophecy that very clearly applies to multiple people. We're going to go into why that is. But if you've spent any time thinking about this stuff in the books, you should know that. I feel feel like that's pretty obvious. Um, you know, this idea, some people also resent the idea that, well, danny has got to atone for the sins of Valeria, or she's not going to survive. She's going to have a sacrificial hero's death because the dragons are dangerous and they're just as dangerous as the others. And it's not fair that only Danny has to atone. I just want to point out everybody has to atone. Everybody, um, magic is pretty much bad in this story. If you look, there's hard, it's hard to find any magic that isn't like very costly and icky, okay? Um, the dragons were probably created with hideous human experimentation and blood magic. Um, the others were created when the uh, by a defilement of the weirwood net, according to me, and according to many other people as well, something along those lines. So when Bran is the last green seer, for example, he's inheriting a messed up weirwood net. All these trees are bleeding and miserable, and the whole thing is messed up. And he, as the last green seer, is going to have some role in cleansing slash shutting down the weirwood net. He's also going to be the last king in the story, in my opinion. So it's all going to be all this like sort of shutting down the old ways and atoning for the ancient sins. Um, and to the extent that Azor High caused the Long Night, Bloodstone Emperor, you know, um, cause a long night, and then they are the ancestors of all the Valerians. The reason why Danny has dragons, and eventually John too, is because of horrible things that people in the past did. Um, both the Valerian Empire, which was a 5,000-year empire of slavery and genocide and human experimentation. There's very little good to say about it other than it had great architecture. <laughs> And like, you know, science and learning and stuff. But this is like the kind of empire where like it's bathed in blood, right? The only reason Danny has dragons is because Valeria existed for 5,000 years. So yeah, she is inheriting a legacy of slavery and all the Valerian horror. And that's why it's important, narratively speaking, that Daenerys takes her dragons and goes to Slaver's Bay where the Valerians learned slavery from the Giscari and uses her dragons to burn slave masters and to liberate slaves. So if you don't notice this like echoing of the story, it's like history, it rhymes. You know, like George Lucas says, then I don't know what to say for you. Valerian ancestors enslaving thousands and even millions of people for 5,000 years with their dragons. Along comes Danny. She herself is a slave. She's not born to a life of privilege and luxury. She is sold to Drogo and she identifies with other slaves and downtrodden people. And so she says, why do the gods make kings and queens? Or why do the gods give people dragons? Any kind of power, if you will. If not to do right, to do justice, to protect people. And so Danny is using her dragons to liberate slaves where her ancestors enslaved people. And that is beautiful. I think it also extends to Aenar Targaryen and him being on the inside of the Doom and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, some people resent this, that Danny has to atone for her ancestor. Why can't she just eat lemon cakes and be a princess? Well, it's not the effing story, you know, sorry, but it's not. Go somewhere else with that. Like, Danny is, she's Jesus Christ. She's the Jesus of the story, like even more than John. To be dead serious for a second, I think that if you look at the House of the Undying symbolism, Danny is foreshadowed for the Jesus-like self-sacrifice that cleanses the world. Because remember, according to Christian theology, Jesus' death allows everyone else to go to heaven. Supposedly, according to a lot of people's thinking, and I was raised Christian, so I'm, I'm familiar with these debates, like all the people that died, all the good people that died before Jesus, like Elijah and King David and stuff, they didn't go to heaven. They were in like a holding limbo or something. And then after Jesus, his because he was blameless, his death is can pay 
for everyone else's sin. And so then everyone can go to heaven. So it's George was raised Catholic, and there's a lot of Christian ideas in the story. And so when we talk about the weirwood net being defiled and somebody needing to purify it, like that's Danny and John and Bram will probably all have a hand in it, but it's very similar. So I don't want to go off on Danny too much right now, uh, but everyone is atoning, and that is good. That is the power that they've inherited, whether it's a weirwood net power or the dragon's power, like it, it, it got created not by innocent means. You know, it's like if you're, if you inherit a fortune from your parents and then you learn your parents got rich by exploiting people or doing business with the Nazis or something, what do you do with your fortune then? Do you just keep buying cars and yachts or do you take your money and like, Oh, I'm going to go and do some good with it. Maybe try to atone for some of the crap that my parents did to get this money, right? That's what Danny is essentially doing. That's a good thing. I think I've made the point. So let's keep going. And then the last bad talking point is like, Danny is more special than John and they can't both be Azor or High. I'm a little sympathetic to that just because Danny is the one who hatched the dragons. That is unique. Um, but John has other things about him that are unique. He is a merging of ice and fire. He's a skin changer dragon lord. He's got flaming swords symbolism that Danny doesn't, and that's part of Azor High. So there's no reason to, to, to sort of pick between them, really. They're, they're both quite special. So uh, I'm doing some good soapboxing today, feeling good. And I've got some PayPals in. Let me just real quick check on my PayPals. Um, I, that is another way that you can support the program and send in questions, and we do appreciate it. From Hunter. Have I watched Michael talks about stuff video about the unpublished drafts. Yes, I have. And the glass candle stuff is very interesting. Uh, but then he got into predicting that John was going to kill Danny and I had to turn the video off because I just can't. I just can't with that. Although I still love Michael talks about stuff. He's great. But yeah, the glass candles are interesting. I should talk about some of the glass candle finds from the drafts. George used to do them, was doing a lot more with them. And the sorcerers could live forever by binding their spirit to a glass candle, which he could still whip that out, by the way. Well, we should probably talk about that a different time. Always love your takes, says Swinny the Pooh. Thank you, Swinny. Appreciate that. And let's see here. From June. Thank you, June. Just a supportive PayPal. Appreciate that always. Very good. All right. So let's go on to this now that we've Stan hammered. Oh, who's that? What, what is this? Who put that in there? Reading Rhaegar must have added a slide. I apologize for that. That's indecent. Demonetized. All right. Azor High Reborn is something that we need to talk about, obviously. That's what Danny wants. She wants family. That's right. Watch my Who is the Real Danny video, but I do love making that point. Viserys is the one who's dreaming of retaking the Iron Throne. And Danny sort of grafted that on to her desire for a house with the red door. And those things are actually separate. But I talked about that in the real Danny video, which is almost to 500,000 views. Thank you, everyone. And by the way, getting the truth out. All right. So the Azor High Reborn prophecy, just some basic facts about it. It comes from a shy. We're told that in a couple places. World of Ice and Fire, as well as Melisandre. It is from Ashai. Um, and the story of the Bloodstone Emperor, which I believe is tied to Ashai. It's officially tied to the Great Empire of the Dawn. Azor Ahai comes in at the end of that story. So multiple clues that it is from Ashai. The basics of the prophecy, we probably all know it. Um, there's one version that says when the Red Star bleeds, which would be a red comet. There's another version that says when the stars bleed, which I've always pointed at because stars, plural, bleeding means multiple comets, which actually there's not multiple comets. It'd be multiple meteors. Comets and meteors both look the same. They function differently, but they both look like bleeding stars because they have a trail. They're bleeding out as they fly. So when the stars bleed actually sounds like a meteor shower. And of course, 
my big theory that got me on the map and got me started with everything is that the long night was caused by the moon disaster that is referred to in two different myths. The Azor High Legend says when Nissa Nissa was stabbed, her cry of agony and ecstasy broke the moon. And that is a clue that Azor High killing his wife was a bad thing that caused the long night, not a heroic thing. Um, and then there's the Carthine legend of the moon cracking to give birth to dragons. That's where dragons come from. But of course, the flapping dragons, they didn't really come from the moon. That's a little too silly for this story. <clears throat> However, moon meteors, meaning falling bits of a cracked moon that were burning up in the atmosphere, they would look like bleeding stars. They would look like flaming swords. They would also look like falling dragons. And in world mythology, comets and meteors are frequently described as swords or dragons for that for the obvious reasons that I just listed. And so, the Ashai prophecy talks about bleeding stars or a bleeding star. It talks about when the darkness gathers, a hero hero will will be reborn from salt and smoke to wake dragons from sword, uh, wake dragons from stone, and he will pull forth from the fire a burning sword. He who clasps it will be Azor High reborn. The sword will be Lightbringer, and the darkness shall flee before him. So this is essentially the prophecy. Benero adds that all those who die fighting in his cause will be reborn, which I think is talking about fire whiting and not like heavenly rebirth, but we'll get to that later. So it's an Ashai prophecy. It's talking about all the stuff. Now, the last thing that I want to emphasize about the Azor High prophecy itself is that Melisandre and Maester Aemon both speak about and Girl Daddles, I don't know if I shouted you out in the chat, but hi, and thanks for coming, and you're awesome. In any case, and thank you for joining me on the villain stream. Both you and Tim made the villains tourney huge success. Everybody's loving that. Lots of comments. Do more tourneys. We had a great time. Nettles is awesome. One person really hated your opinion, but pff, people hate my opinion too, and you know, that's just how it is. So I told him to suck it. In any case. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't. I said something else. And anyways, um, I'm trying to be better about that. I'm trying to not just, you know, blast people and righteous rage and stuff. Um, so Melisandre, Maester Aemon, they both speak about Azor High Reborn and the prince that was promised as the same person, same prophecy, same guy prophesied to do the same things. Some people like to say, oh, is Danny Azor High Reborn, and John is the prince that was promised. I think they're both, both. I really do. And if you think about it, Rhaegar talks about, you know, he thinks it's one prince. He's the, the prince that was promised, his will be the song of ice and fire. But he also talks about three heads has the dragon and there must be one more. So he's looking for three, three heroes. And if you think about the song of ice and fire... That sounds like a good description of John and Danny doing something together, right? <laughs> As opposed to it being one person's song. Um, but the point is that Azor High Reborn and the Prince that was promised, the best information we have is that that is the same thing. And there's more about that to come. Uh, this is, oh, this one is Fadli Ramdani. This is the whole kit and caboodle here is John with Lightbringer riding Regal. This could happen. It's a little wish fulfillment-y, but honestly, this might happen. I don't know if it's all happening at the same time, but this is John as Azor High Reborn, certainly. And it is pretty cool looking. So that's Fadli Ramdani. This one is Ace Official Art, Azor High Reborn. Ace Official Art. You can see the cool armor and the, the dragon. So let's talk about the prince that was promised in a little more detail. And this one is by Ertak Altanaz. I apologize. This is a wide picture. You can only see the beginning of Night King and the Red Comet. But basically, Aegon, these are Balerion's teeth. It's like a giant jaw of Balerion. And Aegon is in between two of the teeth. And he's looking at the Night King in the north. And there's others in the Red Comet. It's a really great piece. Sorry if it doesn't translate perfectly. But we're talking about Aegon's prophecy which we know is true in both the books and the shows, right? Um, 
so books and the shows it's just there's some version of we don't know if it's going to be written on a knife in the books but we know that Aegon had a prophecy about the north ice and fire prince that was promised and the need to you know conquer westeros and have a targaryen dynasty ready to fight the others so that is the prophecy of the prince that was promised uh, Maester Aemon, when speaking about this, he says the language misled us all for a thousand years. A thousand years. So clearly the prophecy of the prince that, and he's talking about how prince in Valerian is actually a dragon and it's a non-gendered word because dragons' genders are known. And so prince that was promised could easily be prince that's, that was promised. And he's sort of, he's hearing about Daenerys and he's like, oh, Daenerys has the dragons. That proves it. That proves that she's the prince that was promised. The language misled us for a thousand years. We were looking for a boy. We were looking for a prince. And language misled us for a thousand years. So that tells you the prince that was promised prophecy is older than Rhaegar much older than Rhaegar. It goes back to Valyria. And if it's the same as the Azor High reborn prophecy, it's at least 5,000 years old and it comes from a Shai. And the Valerians got it from the Shai, who are the ancestors to the Valerians. That's the real story here. Um, Melisandre speaks, again, when she's talking about Azor High reborn and the prince that was promised interchangeably, she says his coming was prophesied 5,000 years ago in a shy. And of course, 5,000 years ago is just a really long effing time ago. But yeah, Rhaegar's vision was just an update. And you can see I wrote it right there. Aegon's prophecy was just an update. It was more specific. It was saying the prince that was promised will have a song of ice and fire. And you must conquer Westeros in order for this to happen. Or at least he interpreted it that way. We don't know what the wording exactly will be, but we'll find out. So, yeah, Aegon was just having an update to an older prophecy. And then the last thing is that um, Rhaegar, in the vision in the House of the Undying, we see Rhaegar. And he is talking about three things at once. He's t holding his son with Elia, who's Aegon, and he says, he is the prince that was promised. His is the song of ice and fire. And so we know that he has found Aegon's prophecy. He has decoded it, and he thinks it applies to his son. And Aemon even tells us that he thought it was himself for a while, and then he became convinced that it was his son Aegon because a comet was sighted on the night that Aegon was conceived. Com hashtag comet sex. And so, um, Rhaegar is holding baby Aegon with next to Elia, and she's got, um, you know, Rhaenys in this vision. And he says, the prince that was promised, his is the song of ice and fire. Three heads has the dragon. There must be one more. And it's like looking right at Daenerys, right? So this is telling us, this is about multiple people. And there are going to be three potentially people that will qualify as Azor Ahai reborn, the prince that was promised. I believe I've made my point. So Azor Ahai with three heads. That's what we're talking about. Um, Danny obviously fulfills the prophecy already. She woke, she woke dragons from stone under a bleeding star. You know, the darkness hasn't gathered yet, but it's getting ready to. And so, yeah, that's, Pretty clear that Danny has fulfilled the prophecy. Uh, but of course, like I said, it's more than one person and John's going to fulfill it too by the time he's resurrected. The original Azor High had five different names. Maybe those were different people. Eldric Shadow Chaser, Hercoon the Hero, uh, Yintar, and Nefarion, as well as Azor High. So maybe those were multiple people. We've definitely picked up some clues and thank you, Kathleen. That was very generous of you. Appreciate that. We picked up multiple clues that um, Azor High, Night's King, Last Hero, could be a father-son relationship in there somewhere, brother-brother, uncle-nephew, because George likes to parallel these relationships all throughout the story. And we see a lot of brothers 
uncles, nephews, and father's sons who fight. And it looks like a last hero fighting against his evil dad, the Night's King, or something like that. Um, so we, I don't like to overinterpret, so we'll just have to see what sort of, what George gives us, and we'll draw what parallels we can. But yeah, there's multiple clues that there was more than one person. Um, and in fact, the Yeetish legend, um, there's two. Okay, so Yintar is a name for Azor Ahai that is obviously Yeetish. Okay. However, the Yeetish also speak of uh, the woman with the monkey's tail who helped end the darkness of the long night. So is woman with the monkey's tail Yintar? Could be. And by the way, Yintar, if you think about it, Yin is the black side of Yin Yang. And tar is also black. So yin tar is like black tar. But of course, tar is also the prefix for the uh, Numenorean royalty. And so yin tar is a reference to like tar palantir and tar miriel and people like that. Because the great empire of the dawn is ice and fire and Numenor. So that's pretty cool. Yin tar could be tar yin. But yeah, that could be monkey's tail woman. Um, and so then you have a female Azor Ahai in with male Azor Ahai. So we're thinking of a team. Also, uh, two of the names for Azor Ahai, Eldric Shadow Chaser and Hercoon the Hero, those both come from Elric of Melnibene, Michael Moorcock's books. And in those books, they're, they're both cousins. Elric and um, so Elric's cousin is Irkun, and they both have a magic sword. One's called Stormbringer. And one's called Mornblade. So Stormbringer, Mornblade, Lightbringer, Sword of the Morning, which is Dawn. So the point is, to make it simple, when George gives us five names for Azor High, it appears at first as though he's doing cultural diffusion. He's saying, oh yeah, there was a flaming sword hero and different people call him by a different name, but it's the same guy. That's what the maesters say. And that's probably true, but there's a reader clue here. Two of these names, Hercoon the Hero and Eldric Shadow Chaser, those are the names with like one letter changed of these two cousins, Elric and Irkun. And Elric and Irkun both have a sword that is the obvious inspiration for Lightbringer. They are rivals though, and they fight. So this is a big clue that Azor High is more than one person and might have been similar people with dragon swords who fought each other, even though they were related. They could have been cousins or brothers or a father and son or a daughter and father or a sister and brother. We've seen every permutation because Arya is involved with it too and other female characters. So female characters aren't always Nissa Nissa and male characters aren't always Azor Ahai. You're looking at Azor Ahai Reborn right there. Daenerys Targaryen. So, yeah. I feel like I've just blown some brains. I see brains splatted in the chat there. Um, let me give you one more and then I actually need to take a quick uh, bathroom break again because I have been drinking a lot of water today. So like I said, there's three dragons and they're talking about, um, Jorah and Danny are talking about what does it mean? Rhaegar said three heads has the dragon and Jorah's like, well, there were three conquerors and three dragons and you've got three dragons. So you don't even need to marry, you know, he's like, you you don't have to find, they don't have to be Targaryens that like you could, you know, wed people like, you know, Aegon did. So, cause he's trying to, he wants to marry Danny and get a dragon. It's pretty transparent. But the point is Danny's already thinking that that's what it means. And logic would dictate that we need three people to ride the three dragons. So just don't overthink it. Um, then we talk about the prince that was promised having a song of ice and fire. Well, that makes sense. If John and Danny are both a prince that was promised, their song together is Ice and Fire because John's from the north and Danny's from the south and fully embraced her dragon heritage. Now, the dismelcordant note is a word play. I'm talking about a discordant note along the lines of Melkor from The Lord of the Rings. Now, if you guys know the creation story of The Lord of the Rings, it is done through music. Eru Iluvatar is singing everything into existence, but Melkor adds a note, a discordant note, and this is the birth of evil in the world. And so J.R. Tolkien is choosing to sort of 
symbolize this all through the use of Morgoth. Yeah, Morgoth and Melkor are the same person, are they not? Or does he become Melkor later? Um, but yeah, sorry, it's Melkor fit with the discordant better, but it's the same person. So Melkor made dubstep. <laughs> he made the the rhythm, the 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 really obnoxious stuff. Same person. Thank you. So the point is, it's a discordant note. So I'm my main theory for the third head of the dragon is Euron. It could be Tyrion. It could be Bran. That's an idea we need to talk about more. It's that's Bran skin changes a dragon to be the third head of the dragon. Okay, but set that aside for now. Euron is by far my favorite. And Euron is the evil Azor High. And this makes sense. If the original Azor High is a villain, in some sense, if Bloodstone Emperor is partly Azor High, then we should have a villainous Azor High. And that will be Euron. So he will be the discordant note in the song of ice and fire. That's the, that's the word joke. John and Danny are making a nice song, but along comes Euron Melkor to just. Sorry, I didn't read the music. Just doing my own thing. Check out my whammy pedal. <laughs> yeah, you get it. All right, so let me just hit the restroom real quick. I will not do music. I'll give you some more artwork to look at. This guy right here, that's the Dis Melkorn dude. This is uh, Mathia Arconiel. All right. So thanks for putting up with my small breaks. We are doing, oh, how long are we going today? What are we in? We're two hours and 18 minutes in. This feels like about four hours total. I think that'll be pretty close. Okay, so where are we at with views here? 756. Love you guys. Appreciate the support. Uh, yeah, Mathia Arconiel, one of my favorite lesser known Ice and Fire artists. A lot of style and character here. You can see the dragon horn. I love the twisted end of it. You know, it looks like a real animal horn. The glyphs. Great stuff. And you guys have already seen this one. I showed it to you already, but of course, this is the idea of John as one of the dragon riders and third head of the dragon. It's Fadli Ram Dani. All right. So this is where we're getting getting into the thick of it now. Great scarf. Okay. So Danny has the dragons. She does not have a burning sword. Now, I told you that Comets, dragons, and flaming swords can all symbolize each other. So people have figured out, well, Danny has the dragons. And they're like a flaming sword. Zara Zoe and Dexa says, your dragons were a wonder when they were born, but grown, they're a flaming sword held over the world. Meaning like a threat, you know. But of course, a flaming sword held over the world literally looks like a comet and is being compared to the dragons. So you can see it's all the same. So... Danny's dragons are her light bringer, right? 
Now, John, thing is, he has flaming sword stuff very heavily associated with him. And so it seems like maybe John has the flaming sword and Danny has the dragons. They'll come together and mix it up a little bit. So let's talk about this. Um, John's dream, his Azor high dream, as I call it, it comes in a dance with dragons and I can pretty much quote it from memory. It's burning shafts hissed upward, uh, uh, trailing tongues of fire. Um, Scarecrow brothers tumbled down, black cloaks ablaze. Stand fast, he said, but he was alone. I forget exactly. Um, And it said basically he's armored in black ice and his blade burned red in his fist. Uh, And dead men climbed up the wall like spiders and he sent them back down to die again. And then it says too late. He reckoned, you know, he he slew a gray beard and a green boy and a girl with red hair. Too late, he recognized your grit. The world dissolved into a red mist. Okay, that's the key lines of the thing. And so John is defending the wall and he's by himself. So this kind of reminds us of the last hero. The last hero set out with 12 companions, but they all died. So he ended up by himself at a certain point facing the others. Okay. And he even says all, everyone has abandoned me. All right. Um, But he is defending the wall against foemen, undead foemen that are scuttling up the ice like spiders. So it's not quite ice spiders, but it's really close. And here is Justin Sweet's ice spiders artwork. I modified this to make it look like Dawn. The original sword was not glowing. Thank you, Fergun, gifter of memberships. I modified this to make the sword look glowing. So just to be clear, the original calendar art, the sword is not glowing. I did that to make it more book accurate, according to my theorizing. <laughs> because obviously the last hero's dragon steel was Dawn. I'm getting ahead of myself. Well, no, I'm not. It's right there on the list. Dragon steel in the last hero, Dawn, the sword of the morning, a sword that brings the morning, ends the long night, light bringer. These are pretty obviously all the same sword or they're a related idea or something. If Azor High came to Westeros to fight the others, that must become the story of the last hero, right? This does not take a rocket scientist to figure this out. So, yeah, the, this hero does need a shave. He's, well, he's been out. He's Look, he's been, he hasn't seen a cast in a long time, okay? He's been out in the woods learning the magic of the children of the forest in caves, eating mushrooms and stuff, weird paste. He'll shave when this is all over, okay? But you just lay off. Oh, Fergun, thank you for asking. Cleo and Goose are at the Bird Hotel. Somebody needed a bird break. That's me. Two thumbs point at this guy. It is springtime. It got very springtime around here. And uh, yeah, I took him to the Parrot Hotel. Well, they'll have a great time squeaking and squawking with all the other parrots and the very nice bird people whose hearing is probably not very good anymore. So I'm going to film a whole bunch of videos over the next three weeks and uh, get a little bit ahead of schedule. I've got lots of things coming. We've got a big one coming. I want to tease it, but I'm not going to yet. Mm, Got a big video coming. Okay. So besides the RLJs, getting back to the topic, Dragon Steer, Dragon Steel, Dawn, Lightbringer, obviously all related ideas. And they're kind of doing the same stuff, right? Last hero leads the Night's Watch in the war for the dawn against the others. Azor High fought the darkness in the east and fought off the long night there somehow with his magic sword. And then we have Dawn, which is called the Sword of the Morning. And of course, if you look into the wording of Lightbringer, you discover that Lucifer means Lightbringer. And let me see if I can explain this very simply. Uh, We're talking about the planet Venus. The planet Venus appears as the morning star and the even star. When it's the morning star, it's the first star, and it's the last star of evening. So it's the last star left before the sun comes up. And when it's the even star, it's the first star that appears at night. Because Venus, even though it's a planet, it looks like a star. It looks like a very bright star. I'll get to the Lucifer thing. Just wait. I'm just going in order. Astronomy first. So the planet Venus looks like a star, and it's actually the fourth, uh, it's, it's four times brighter than any star in the sky. And it has a very unique behavior 
because it is not a star, right? The canopy of fixed stars all moves together. As the Earth turns, the stars move together, all right? But the planets don't move with the stars. They move in different directions. They move apart from the stars. That's why they're called the wanderers, the planetary wanderers. Wandering star, obligatory porter's head. And so the thing about Venus is that it is closer to the sun than Earth is. So it's always going to appear near the sun. Like if I'm the Earth here and the sun is over here, okay, Venus is going to be somewhere near the sun. It can't be over on the other side. That's where Jupiter and stuff could be. But Venus is going around the sun over there. And we're over here on Earth. So it's either going to be on one side of the sun or the other based on when it goes around. So when it's on one side of the sun, it appears to rise in the morning. And when it's on the other side, it sets in the evening. So this leads to this very interesting phenomenon where every 200 and some days it switches sides and in between is the transit of Venus. If Venus is passing in front of the sun, you can see it as a little black dot in front of the sun. And when it's going behind, it takes, excuse me, because it's further away. And there's a different word for that, which I forget, but that's going behind the sun. And so Venus has different names. This is the point. This is my, oh, it's my manager telling me to get on with it. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Venus has uh, different names when it is in the different positions because it acts and appears different, even though it's the same. And so in Greek, it's Hesperus and Phosphorus, or Eosphorus, it looks like. But we'd say Phosphorus. So Hesperus and Phosphorus. Um, and in Latin, it is Lucifer and Vesper. So Lucifer is, oh, my mic changed. Okay, thank you. Yes, it did. Thanks. Oh, I've got to, okay, I got to do a thing. Hang on. Appreciate it. I'll just go here. And that should pop back up. One second. I need to get a new, oh, okay, it's back. I need to get a new cable if I, if I bump it. Okay, so Lucifer is the Latin name for Venus when it is the morning star. And Vesper is the name for the planet when it's in the even star. And the reason why Lucifer is associated with the devil is because of what the morning star appears to do. When the sun begins to rise, the morning star is up above the horizon. And as the sun rises, Venus rises and then it disappears, right? So it rises from the horizon and then it, once it becomes daylight, it disappears. So this looks like Jesus ascending to heaven or Lucifer rising up to try to challenge God because the morning star rises just before the sun and it's so bright, you could almost imagine it's trying to be the sun as Lucifer challenges God. But then the real sun rises and it puts it to shame, says, nah, I'm the sun. Flip it around, what does the evening star appear to do? Well, it appears over the horizon, and then as the sun sets, the even star tumbles to earth and disappears below the horizon. And so this is where we get the idea of Satan getting kicked out of heaven, falling to earth. Jesus is also compared to the morning star. And what does he do? He descends from heaven and then ascends back to heaven. And in fact, many, many, many mythological deities all around the world, outside the confines of Christianity, are compared to Venus because it is this very interesting thing, how it switches sides and goes up and goes down. And what you'll find is that all the Venus-associated mythological deities will, have, will do ascending and descending stuff, like the Mayan hero twins. They go down to the underworld and come back. Ishtar, same thing, down to the underworld and back. Um, so it's, it's all based on the astronomy of Venus. And so to get back to ice and fire, the word light bringer is a translation of Lucifer. 
It means bearer of light, bringer of light. And another translation of it is son of the morning. Think about it. Okay. This is like, it's the brightest star that isn't the sun. And so usually the sun is the father God. And in Christianity, God the Father is associated with the sun, whereas Jesus is associated with the morning star. So Lucifer, son of the morning. That's the whole thing, son of the morning. So the sword dawn being called sword of the morning it's almost the same thing. It's like telling you that it's Lightbringer. The name Lucifer, the name Lightbringer, Son of the Morning, it all comes from the same place. And then look at the Night's Watch oaths. I am the sword in the darkness, the light that brings the dawn. That's all based on Lucifer mythology too. And so we can use this to put it together. The Night's Watch, meaning the last hero who has a magic sword, the sword in the darkness bringing the dawn. That's the same story as the sword of the morning carrying dawn. Or Azor High with light bringer, the bearer of light. It's all the same stuff. And by the way, Daenerys who's, is, uh, has a lot of Aphrodite symbolism. And Aphrodite is a female deity that is tied to Venus. And the legend of uh, the planet Venus, the legend of Aphrodite is, uh, you know, Oronos, his balls, his heavenly balls are chopped off and his balls and his blood and all this stuff falls down to earth and uh, his seed lands in the water and it creates the sea foam. And then Aphrodite rises from the sea foam. So it's, you can see the falling thing is like the even star and then Aphrodite rising from the ocean that's just seeing the, eve, or, I'm sorry, the falling is the morning star. Apologies. No, even star. <laughs> the morning star rises, the even star falls. So the morning star rising, um, in Greece specifically, they would see it rising over the ocean. And so that is why Aphrodite is foam born. And she is born from the ocean. If you see the famous paintings, The Birth of Aphrodite, she is like standing in a little clamshell or big clamshell um, in like in the surf. OK, so that is just Venus um, appearing to rise from the horizon or. Uh, yeah. So. And then so Daenerys, basically Daenerys being called the most beautiful woman in the world. Um, and when uh, Missende asks her what she wants to wear to see Dario, her love, she says, starlight and sea foam. So this is a reference to Venus, the starlight, and the sea foam from which Aphrodite is born. So it's, it's hanging a lantern on the fact that Daenerys is Aphrodite. She's the most beautiful woman in the world. She is a beauty. She is a goddess. And that is a female version of Lightbringer. So it's a way of saying that Danny is Lightbringer. So Brienne the Beauty also based on Venus symbolism, look at the sigil of uh, House Tarth. It's got a sunrise and a sunset. So day star, even star. And then her dad is called the even star. And they used to live in a place called Morn. And their hero is Galadon of Morn. Dawn, Morn. Sword of the morning, Dawn, Galadon of Morn. Just same stuff, okay? Anyways. Where were we? Getting back to John's dream. Welcome to Squisher. John's dream. His blade burned red in his fist, right? So he's defending the wall alone like the last hero. And he's got a burning red sword like Azor High. And he even in this dream, he kills you grit with his sword, which is a perfect echo of Azor High killing Nissa Nissa. Right? So John is reenacting the legend of original Azor High at the same time that he is reenacting the myth of the last hero. And that is a big clue that these are the same archetype, same person or the same set of people, the related ideas. Right? So Azor High, again, like I said, they're all doing the same thing, they all lead the watch against the others. 
And uh, so they are referring to the same person or group of people. So part of the Azor High prophecy is that you're supposed to be born under a bleeding star, right? <clears throat> well, John was born at the Tower of Joy. And we all remember what the show did here. They showed us John. Sorry to show you bloody Leanna. Apologies, Leanna. <clears throat> Shouldn't share the post-pregnancy photos without asking. But as you can see, the sword Dawn is resting against the bed. And so John, in a way, is born under a bloody dawn. Dawn is a star sword. It's made from a falling star. It's literally a meteorite. So if John is born... Under dawn, and there are theories that there's there was a Leanna's bleeding so much because there was a C-section and dawn was used, but I think she would have already been dead if that was the case. So I really think that's just a gory, strange theory that we don't need. However, Arthur Dane is at the Tower of Joy, and Arthur Dane almost certainly dies. Maybe he's in hiding, but probably he dies. And Dawn is there, and so John, in that sense, is born under a bleeding star. And also, there's the uh, the imagery at the Tower of Joy. You know, uh, it says in in uh, Ned's dream re recount version of the story, it says a storm of rose petals blew across a blood streaked sky, as blue as the eyes of death. So in Ned's dream, and this is Mike Miller, the artwork here. This one, uh, that was from the show. Okay, no artist. So, a storm of rose petals blew across a blood-streaked sky as blue as the eyes of death. The eyes of death, the blue eyes of death are the others. And the others have blue stars for eyes. So, the blue rose petals are becoming blue star eyes above the Tower of Joy in terms of symbolism. And there's a blood-streaked sky, which further implies bleeding stars filling the sky with fire. And so we've got the cold star eyes of the others. We've got a blood streaked sky. And John, this is where John is born. So George is painting stars in the sky and he's painting blood in the sky where John is born. So this is all about, yeah, obviously it's sunset. <laughs> but the language he's using to choose to describe the sunset creates blood and stars in the sky. And so that way you get the uh, prophecy, the nod to the prophecy. And then there's John's rebirth. John's rebirth will probably hit this note too. Will he be reborn when the red comet comes back? I do think the red comet is coming back. Because we need another long night. And if the first long night was caused by moon meteors, when a comet hit the moon, then George isn't going to invent a completely different way to cause the new long night. He's going to bring the red comet back. It's going to hit the other moon, just as the prophecy said. One day the other moon will kiss the sun too and crack and the dragons will return. So yes, the meteor dragons will return. The other moon will crack. The comet is coming back. And John's rebirth is strongly implied to be tied to that. So I think that is what we will see that will really hit home with the reader is that his rebirth will be tied to the appearance of the Red Comet. Or maybe even the impact with the moon and the actual moon meteors. One or the other. Um, also, people have proposed that Melisandre is like a bleeding star because her eyes are like red stars, her ruby is like a red star. And she very well may walk onto John's resurrection pyre or something like that. So he may be reborn under bleeding Melisandre as well. John is Relora's chosen. Relora is trying to tell Melisandre this, but she's having a hard time getting it. She tries to see Stannis, and she can't. She searches. She asks for Relora's Chosen. She asks to see Azor High, and she can't find Stannis anywhere. 
But she sees the bastard boy again, Jon Snow. Man, keep seeing Jon Snow over and over. I ask for Azor High, and I see only Snow with a capital S, meaning only Jon. I look for Azor High, and it's only Jon. It's so weird. Put it together, Melisandre. I don't mean to belabor the point, but it's just like, come on. Um, and in fact, I noticed when I looked at this recently, she even hears his name. The flames are whispering the name Jon Snow. So she's not just seeing him. She's hearing. The fire is talking to her. And it's like, Jon Snow. You're looking for Azor Ahai. It's Jon Snow. She's like, I... <laughs> so of course she sees him as a man and then a wolf and then a man again. And the skulls were all around him. So the skulls mean death. And the man, wolf, man again is his process. He's going to be a man and then he dies and he goes into his wolf ghost and then he's going to be a man again when he's resurrected. John uh, Melisandre is seeing all of this in the flames and that's where John's going to be resurrected is in the flames. She sees him limbed in tongues of fire, which is very specific wording. Happy Easter. <laughs> tongues of fire is signature Holy Spirit talk. That's always the symbol for the Holy Spirit in the Bible, tongues of fire. It's used in a lot of art, medieval art. And limbed in tongues of fire is great. Limbed meaning just like outlined in, but it also describes a fire man whose limbs are made of fire. Okay. And also it's a tree man thing as well because tree limbs and there's burning tree symbolism that John has, but we'll get to that. So yes, tongues of fire. He is risen. Hallelujah. Praise John Jesus. He is Relor's chosen. If you've never seen this, I'll just give you a second. It is delightful. It is delightful. <laughs> now, as R'hllor is chosen, he will probably be a fire white, at least to some extent. He may be an ice and fire white. Because remember, in the dream, he's armored in black ice and his blade burns red in his fist. So maybe he's an ice and fire hybrid zombie of some kind. We'll get to that. But the point is, fire whites, like Beric Dondarrion, can light their own swords on fire. This hit me like a ton of bricks when I thought about it one day. Will John have to kill Daenerys to make Lightbringer the burning sword? Well, no. Not if he's a fire white. Because if your blood is powered by R'hllor, like Beric, you can just run your sword across your own hand and light the sword on fire. And there it is. So very cool. Um, John should be able to do that. And this is one of the most annoying things about the show is they're not even consistent with their own logic. They showed us that Beric can light his own sword on fire. And then they had Beric look at John and say, R'hllor brought us back, you and me, for a purpose. Watch me light my sword on fire. And then John's like, hmm, yeah, no, it's not useful at all when I fight the Whites or the others or the Ice Dragon. He was looking right at the Ice Dragon. He could have been like, Whoa! Whoa! no, no, that would have been fun. We wouldn't do that. So yes, fire whites don't even need to murder anyone to light their swords on fire. Fun fact. Now, Benero talks about Azor High, and he says, all those dying in Azor High's cause shall be reborn. And like I said, that could be a promise of heavenly fulfillment, or it could be talking about fire whites and how an army of fire whites sure would make good soldiers to fight the others, wouldn't they? They can all light their weapons on fire and burn the hell out of everything. Like it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? So that's probably why the Reloris know how to make fire whites is because its origin is in Azor High's original battle against the others. This is probably what they did. They made fire whites. There's a lot of symbolism about this. If you want more fire white stuff, check out Melisandre's Secrets, fire whites. And the others in that series, if you like. 
But yes, dying in Azor High Reborn's cause is just going to be a second until one of our field generals can get to you, and then you'll be right back on frontline infantry. And then there's, oh, this is Ertak Altanaz. Thank you for asking. Ertak Altanaz. This one is Joanna Seguero. Joanna Seguero on Barrack. And this is Ertak with Fire White John. So green zombie theory, I'm not going to get all the way into it, but it's just basically, you got gifted a squisher, Fabricello. That's what happened. Um, green zombie theory is based on cold hands and John. And we looked at the fact that cold hands is an undead skin changer because that's the only way you can ride an elk and talk to ravens and stuff. He's clearly a skin changer, but he's resurrected. And then um, uh, 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 John is going to be a resurrected skin changer. And I got to thinking about it and I was like, oh, resurrected skin changers are ideal for fighting the others because um, whites don't need to eat or sleep or find warmth. Whether you're a cold white or fire white, you don't need to stay warm. So you could roam the lands of always winter and not worry about that or finding food, which is also a big problem in the lands of always winter. So the main thing is the skin changer component preserves the soul, right? Barrack is deteriorated every time he comes back. Stoneheart was dead for three days before she was brought back. So she's extra gone. But John's spirit is incubating in ghost right now these past 11 years or whatever it's been. And so, depending on how long they wait to get him out of the wolf, he'll probably merge with the spirit or whatever, but he's going to be more preserved and differently preserved than Barrack or Stoneheart, who did not have an animal to act as what I like a soul jar, essentially. They seem more like ghosts. It's almost like a ghost is called back to be shadow bound to their own reanimated corpse. That's what I see with Barrack and Stoneheart. So John's going to be different. He's going to be a better zombie because he is a skin changer. Bran might even be involved in John's ultimate resurrection, which could bring green seer magic into it. And that's totally different. Bran, of course, talks about seeing Ned in his vision. And he's like, oh, he's alive. I saw him. And Leaf is like, oh no, do not attempt to call him back from death. That's very bad and naughty. And you can't do that anyway. And so it's like, well, why are you telling Brad not to do it if it's impossible? It must be possible, but it's probably very bad. So Green Seer Resurrection, I do theorize that it exists. I mean, it makes sense. You can resurrect people with ice and fire and water. Why not Green Seer magic? So John, a lot of, a lot of possibilities with what kind of zombie he will be. But the point is that zombies make the best Night's Watchmen. And there's a lot of indications that all the original Night's Watchmen, the last hero and his 12, were undead zombie skin changers. I strongly believe that, but I can't get too far into that theory right now, but that is that is what's going on with Fire White John, I believe. And I think we will f see more Fire Whites. <clears> hmm. <throat> Oh, I think I'm going to grab a caffeinated drink. Yes, it is time for caffeine. Ugh. Dragon Glass John. Dragon Glass John. So this artwork is by Coralia M. Stannis tells John, you are the weapon that R'hllor gave me, and I mean to make use of you as you may found the dragon glass on the fist. So Stannis is saying, John, you're a weapon given to me by the fire God. And you're just like that dragon glass. And I'm going to use you. So it's calling John a dragon glass weapon. And that makes sense. John himself um, is a black sword. The Night's Watch say, we are the swords in the darkness. And they wear it black all the time. So they are literally black swords that bring the light. And what do we know about glass candles? They're very bright. Dragon glass can illuminate. So we've never seen a dragon glass knife shine with a light, but it could based on what glass candles are doing. And glass candles are so tall that they're basically like swords. They're three feet tall. So a glass candle is essentially a dragon glass 
burning sword in a way. So Stannis is comparing John to Dragonglass. Um, then there's another line where John is coming into contact with Ghost and he's beginning to feel Ghost's appetite and the language is merging almost into Wolf Dream language, right? And it says there was a hunger inside him, sharp as a blade of dragon glass. So John's hunger is compared to dragon glass. John himself is compared to dragon glass. He's a black sword that brings light. And his dream said he's armored in black ice. And as you can see from this picture of dragon glass, which is called frozen fire, it looks basically like black ice. And since George is saying it's frozen fire, it is a kind of ice. It's black ice that brings light. That's what dragon glass is. So these are all John's personal symbols. That's what this means. John is like dragon glass. John is like Lightbringer. John is like a black sword, which could either be a Valerian steel sword or a dragon glass blade. And again, when I say John is a black sword and he's armored in black ice, like imagine John as a big piece of dragon glass. <laughs> and then his sword burns red in his fist. So he's like a burning piece of dragon glass. <clears throat> and Stannis is going to use him. Rockborn Mithras. Let me get my Red Bull. So this is really fun. Oh, the other thing about black ice, the Valerian steel sword that John grew up looking at is Ned's sword. It is called ice and it is essentially black. It's very dark gray, but there was a Stark who carried ice named Barth Black Sword. So we know that it looks black enough for somebody who carried it to be called Black Sword. So black ice, is also a reference to Valerian steel or specifically to Ned's sword ice. So when John is armored in black ice, some people think this means Euron's dragon steel armor, his Valerian steel armor. If John and Euron fight, a la Damon and Aemond, potentially John could get that armor and wear it and then he would be armored in the black ice of Valerian steel. Or it could be talking about him being frozen and ice whited and he's armored in ice in that sense. So there's a lot of things that that could mean. It's pretty fun. But I did want to remind you that the uh, it could also have reversed a Valerian steel and dragon glass. As far as you're talking about your symbolic archetype, black ice is a family of symbols. Black steel, black frozen fire. You get it. Uh, yes, and uh, of course, the Starks, thank you. The Starks put iron swords in the crypts. Those are crude black iron swords. When they rust, they turn red. So they're, they're black and red swords, just like Lightbringer is a burning red sword, but is symbolized as a black sword. And just as Ned's black ice is now turned into two black and red swords. So yes, the kings of winter down there, they all have black swords. It's pretty dope. Yes, it's an important symbol. Because basically the kings of winter and the Starks and the Night's Watch are all kind of the same. They're all wielding black dragon weapons to fight the others. Okay, so let's talk about Mithras. I mentioned Mithras earlier. This is Mithras. I don't know why his balls are so tiny, um, but... It's a style of Roman sculpting, so don't hold it against him. This is called Rockborn Mithras, and these are both the same depiction. One just has the egg, and one does not. One's only got the shell. But Rockborn Mithras, he's born from an egg rock, like the cosmic egg. And he's born with a sword and a torch, which is basically like, if you combine those, you get a flaming sword, right? So Mithras is this flaming sword or sword and torch hero. He's born from a rock. He's kind of Jesus-like with the rebirth and stuff and offering of salvation. And there's a lot of nods to Mithras. 
in Ice and Fire, and specifically with John. Um, I, if you really want to have your mind blown, look up uh, R plus L equals Lightbringer by Schmendrick, and it's on westeros.org forums. But it's all about John's Mithras correlations. But essentially, this is part of the Azor High inspiration. One of the things that George drew from to create this Azor High myth. And he is born from a rock. So when you talk about Azor High being waking dragons from stone, and you talk about the moon being like an egg that cracks open and the dragons come out, these are all playing with rock-born Mithras ideas. He comes out of the rock egg with a sword and a torch. Okay. So Mithras, the, the Mithras was worshiped down in caves and they were in fact, um, mausoleums quite off, often. And those were called Mithraims. Myth, uh, myth, I think, yeah. Mithraims. I think that's what they're called. Essentially they are crypts. They, they meet in crypts. That is where the religion hangs out underground all the time. And it's pretty popular in Rome, actually, because there's lots of underground crypts in Rome. And so we see John, of course, what is he doing in his recurring dream, walking in the crypts? Okay. Um, then we have uh, the Tauroctony. The Tauroctony is, you can sort of see it on the left scene. You can see that there are symbols going around the ring, the tan one. Those are the zodiac signs. And uh, I should have included a different piece of art. But if, if anybody wants to Google Tauroctony, it's the famous scene of Mithras slaying the bull. Oh, I'm going to have to show it. Bloody hell. Oh, don't go there. Why did you go there? That's ugly. Come down here. This is really important. I don't know how I forgot to put this art in. So there you go. There you see it. So here is Mithras. This is called the Tauroctony because he is slaying the white bull. And the white bull is a friend and a companion to Mithras. Some people believe it is meant as an avatar of Mithras, much in the way that Ghost is an avatar to John. And he slays the white bull in order to be resurrected. This is a major clue that Ghost will be slain in order to resurrect John. It won't be John doing it, but it's logical because John's spirit is going to be stuck in Ghost. And the only way to get the spirit out of Ghost is pretty much to sacrifice the wolf. Now, like I said, after a few days, the warg and the wolf spirit will merge. And so what's going to happen, I think, is that John's going to be in there for a while. So when he comes back, it's going to be both. But Nevertheless, Ghost is John's white bull and the Tower of Joy where John was born. Gerald Hightower died. What's Gerald Hightower's nickname? Say it with me. The White Bull. And this is the only reason that Gerald Hightower is named the White Bull. The only reason. We're never even given a story about it. He's called the White Bull so that John is like Mithras and that he is born when the white bull is slain. So it's very important. So the, the it is the Tower of Tauroctony. John's birth is like the Tauroctony. Now, the last thing is that uh, Zodiac John, okay? John is one of the only people that looks at the stars and names the constellations. And he even talks about the 12 houses of heaven, meaning the zodiac signs, and he names a few. So this is basically a Tauroctony moment. Like the Tauroctony is almost always depicted with the zodiac signs going around the edge. And these are stylized depictions. I know they don't look exactly like the zodiac, but trust me, it is meant to be the zodiac signs. And you see the sun and the moon. And so basically, yeah, John is looking up at the 12 houses and talking about the thief and the red wanderer and stuff like that. So that's all Mithras stuff. And then, like I said, Mithras is responsible for treaties. And so John's major thing, first, he's reconciling the wildlings. And I think he's going to have something to do with reconciling the others as well. 
So the Mithras is a big part of John's identity. And here is John as Mithras. We looked at this picture before, but I'm bringing it back. It's by a fictograph. And John with the sword and torch, defending the wall. <clears throat> I see you, Theory of Ice and Fire. I see you. So waking dragons from stone, again, Danny already did this. She literally woke dragons from stone eggs. What about John? He can't wake dragons. There's not really dragons for him to wake. But John is a dragon. And we've seen that Targaryen dragon dreams about dragons hatching can actually be about Targaryen people instead. And in fact, there's a great example of this. John the Fiddler in The Mystery Night. Talking Duncan Egg here. John the Fiddler, who is a black Damon Blackfire in disguise. Damon Blackfire the 13th or something. Um, he has dragon dreams of a dragon hatching at White Walls. And Blood Raven, at the end of the story, says there's always been Targaryens with dragon dreams. He dreamed of a dragon hatching here, and so it did. And he talks and he points at Egg. And Egg is now dressed as a Targaryen. He's no longer wearing a fake disguise. He has come into his own and owned his Targaryen identity. And that was the meaning of the dragon dream. So, John himself, when he wakes up from his resurrection, he will probably know that he's a Targaryen. And so, as he wakes from his stony, frozen corpse, he will be the dragon being born. Because he will be coming into his own as a Targaryen and casting off his fake identity, like Egg did. And John the Fiddler also had a fake identity. Casting off his fake identity and Blood Raven. They all had fake identities. <laughs> Casting them off to announce them to announce himself as a true dragon. All three of them did it. Blood Raven was Maynard Plum. We do need a Mithras John video. Yeah, I should do it. Um, yeah, they all cast off the uh, Blood Raven was Maynard Plum, and then he came out as Blood Raven. John the Fiddler was like, no, I'm actually Damon Blackfire, and Egg is actually, well, I'm actually um Aegon Targaryen, so. There was three of them, three hidden dragons. Wow, the parallels. So John, one of the three heads of the dragon, will be coming into his own as he wakes from stone. So this is how he will fulfill the prophecy. Um, now the whites, remember he's dreamed of being armored in ice and his body is probably gonna be frozen. It's in the ice cells. Bran has a dream of John uh, growing cold and hard at the wall. Sounds like an ice white thing. So this is this art is by Ertak Altanaz. I have to give Ertak mad credit, mad foresight. Ertak, I hope you're watching. And of course, we had Ertak on uh, to go over this and other pieces, which you can find on our channel. Just look up uh, Ertak on our our channel, and you'll find the stream. But there's he got a lot right here, so you can see John. Formerly encased in ice, he is breaking out of the ice shell like a waking dragon. He has weirwood textured skin. And he's got red eyes like the wolf or like a weirwood and he's got white hair. And this, I think, is the oldest artwork depicting John with white hair. I'm not sure who said it first. I've been saying it for a long time. Um, Alt Shift X mentioned it. Uh, Catelyn. When she comes back as Stoneheart, her hair goes white. So John could John's hair could go white simply from the resurrection process. And that will make him look more Targaryen, by the way. And it'll also make him look like his wolf ghost, if, especially if he has red eyes, because he has Willor fire in him and white hair. And then he'd also look like Elric of Melnibone, who we talked about earlier. He's got the sword Stormbringer. So Elric was Stormbringer. Elric's actually an albino, and so Blood Raven is a more proper copy of Elric. But if John comes back with red eyes and white hair, he'll be like Elric. And of course, Elric doesn't sit in a cave like Blood Raven. He goes around killing things with Stormbringer, and when he uses Stormbringer, he goes into a bloodlust fury and just kills everything around him, too. So we'll see some of that with John. 
to answer the question from earlier about John's rage, I think George will, will be riff off of Elric's like bloodlust. And it comes from the sword. The sword has like got a demonic dragon spirit or something in it. And it sort of takes over and it sometimes slays Elric's friends and it's a whole mess. So. This is how John might look. Him waking out of a frozen body is another waking from stone idea. And he was armored in ice in the dream. So it could be breaking out of that as well. And then Shireen's dream about, she's like, oh, I dreamed of the dragons again. They were coming to eat me. So to answer somebody's question earlier, will Shireen be killed when John is resurrected? It seems very possible because if John is like a waking dragon and Shireen is consumed in the fire that resurrects him, then that's kind of like her getting eaten by a dragon. I'm not, I don't think that's the only way that can be fulfilled, but it does kind of make sense. It's all kind of lining up there at the wall. So John will be upset about this when he learns about it, but he won't have a choice. He'll be dead. So Melisandre will be the one running that show. And, and uh, Celise, I think, would sacrifice her own child, too. She's fully in the grips of fanatic cultism or whatever. And then Shireen, she is a stone girl as well because of the grayscale. So that adds to the waking dragons from stone if her sacrifice pays for the life. I do want to point you, though, point out to you, Thoros does not kill anyone to resurrect Beric, and he does it six times. So that only death can pay for life thing, there might be some wiggle room there. Thoros is doing fire white resurrection. He doesn't kill anyone. So maybe Shireen will be sacrificed by Mel to raise John, but it doesn't have to be that way. Melisandre herself might walk into the pyre and be the sacrifice. <clears throat> so we'll see. Ah, here is John the Fiddler. I mentioned I mentioned this a minute ago. Here is the Mike Miller panel from this thing. So John the Fiddler, he's got lots of prophetic dreams. He sees Dunk in Kingsguard armor, which is accurate. Dunk does become a Kingsguard. I think I can even just scoot this down. This will look kind of messy, but. Um, no, sorry, it's not letting me. Okay, so um, yeah, you can see the bottom of, of Dunk in ghostly Kingsguard armor. But yeah, he sees Dunk and Dunk, of course, does become a member of Egg's Kingsguard, not John the Fiddler. So he's his dreams and visions are good, but his interpretation is wishful thinking. But he says that, yeah, he's, he, you know, I dreamed that a dragon would hatch right here at White Walls. And that turned out to be Egg. Throwing off his fake identity. So then we've got, um, that is again by Mike Miller, that artwork. So the Winterfell Dragon. Wait, did I make all the points on that one? Yes, I did. Winterfell Dragon. This is by Dmitry Leonovich. So, of course, there's multiple rumors about dragons under Winterfell, all of which I believe are talking about Jon's secret identity, first and foremost, as a hidden dragon at Winterfell. So first we're told that the hot springs might be heated by a dragon who lives down there. And then the maesters add that like, well, that's kind of not a crazy idea. The small folk think this. And <clears throat> it is true that the hot springs uh, at Winterfell, the geo, you know, the activity there, it is similar. They're heated by the same fires of the world that heat uh, volcanoes such as Valyria or Dragonstone. So the, the maesters know that that is all geothermic activity, right? So when the small folks say maybe it's heated by a dragon, that's... You know, they're not, but it's a cute idea. But it's it's a dragon association for heating Winterfell. Then we have, of course, Summer's Vision, 
Um, when Bran is down in the crypts and Ramsay is sacking it, he's looking through the eyes of Summer, his wolf. And Summer sees a great winged serpent whose roar was a river of flame. Now, everything in the wolf dream is described with symbolic language. The towers of man rock. Uh, the swords and knives are teeth and claws and things. So it is probably the case that these are just gouts of fire that looked like a serpent. But the language implies that a dragon hatched out of the first keep of Winterfell. Now, I have tried to make that theory fly. I've tried to give it wings. I think it is just symbolic language. George wants to make us think about dragons at Winterfell because of John. And when Bran comes out of the crypts, they open the door and there's a lot of birth symbolism. And John is going to probably discover his identity down in the crypts. So the idea of the dragon ideas are all tied to the crypts is my point. They heat the hot springs. They hatched out of the first keep right above the crypts. And then we have Vermax <clears throat> and the Pact of Ice and Fire. And I do want it to be more, but I just don't see how that makes sense. I have tried. So Vermax, like I said, when Jace goes north in this season in House of the Dragon, he's going to make some sort of pact with the Starks to come to Rhaenyra's side. And it's going to involve Jace promising a future daughter to marry Cregan's son. And that's the Pact of Ice and Fire. The rumor is that Vermax laid an egg in the crypts. I'm wondering if they just brought an egg as a down payment on the pact. But either way, it is a rumor that there is a dragon's egg down there. And so we have three different times, and it all comes within two pages in the world of Ice and Fire, to be honest. That George, all like we, if you go to the Winterfell section in the world of Ice and Fire, you open it up and it's like dragons, dragon eggs. Dragons heating the springs. And you're like, wait, what is all this about dragons in my Winterfell? It's kind of striking. So, of course, John, some sort of proof of his identity is probably down there in the crypts. Rhaegar's harp, you know, some Targaryen livery, a dragon's egg is one idea. There's something down there. So... That's that's that. This is all talking about John's secret identity. And of course, the Pact of Ice and Fire ultimately fulfilled by Rhaegar and Lyanna. Okay, give me um 30 seconds. I'm gonna give you reading Rhaegar music and I'll be right back. <laughs> And we're back. All right. It's reading Rhaegar. Ah, it's better. So these are all clues about John. Okay, so who wants the new theory? Here comes the new theory. Here's the new theory. The theory is all dragon eggs, all dragon dreams come from dragon eggs. That's the new theory. I like the theory. Okay, so Stebo, I don't, I can't dive into that one. Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. The theory is that Leaf is old Nan, and also Nettles and Sheep Stealers, the dragon under Winterfell. I don't see how that flies. I strongly disagree that Nettles is Leaf or anyone else. Nettles is her own person. I don't think old Nan can be Leaf because old Nan has been in the story until just a minute ago. And then Bran finds Leaf in the cave. So I don't think that works either. 
So yeah, thanks for the super chat. Um, it is a likable theory, but I just don't think it works. And I don't think Nettles can be someone else. I think that would ruin her character. But some people believe that. So I still love you. In any case, um, my new theory is that all dragon dreams come from dragon eggs. So the first evidence for this is Drogon and Daenerys. She has three dragon dreams before she births the dragons. And Drogon is in all of them. Uh, he's in the first two, and the third one is the wake the dragon dream. I can't remember specifically if he's in that one. The first two are definitely the black dragon and the second one, it's slick with blood and then her thighs are slick with blood. So it's birthing symbolism. It's implying that she has given birth to this dragon. The dragon immolates her and burns her with fire, but she's not afraid. She is emerges feeling whole and new and clean and stronger. And this is when the next day she begins to reverse her whole experience in the Kalasar and begins to take power. So it's a very empowering turning point for Danny. And the, the dragon in her dream is Drogon. And there's another minute, uh, another moment rather, where she's holding the eggs and she feels something in the egg reaching out to her unborn child in the womb. And so she knows these eggs are alive and she puts them in the brazier. She's like sensing it. And then when she actually wakes them, she says she sensed the truth of it long ago. The fire just wasn't hot enough. So the eggs are essentially telling Danny what to do through the first book. They're like, fire is good for you. You can be cleansed and renewed in fire. You need to burn the eggs. You need to embrace the fire. You are the dragon, all this stuff. So her, I believe that her egg, her dreams are coming from the eggs, from Drogon's egg in particular. And if you think back to Reyna's custom, Reyna Targaryen, uh, Jaehaerys' older sister, she's the one who came up with the custom of placing dragon's eggs in the cradle. And it makes a lot of sense. And it's, it tells us that uh, the dragons that hatched from those such eggs always bonded with the children from the cradle. And it makes sense, right? If if Drogon's egg is sending Danny dragon dreams and reaching out for her unborn child, then you can see what happens. The, the egg and the baby in the cradle are forming a psychic bond before the egg even hatches, just as Danny and Drogon did. And so I think, so yeah, Quave, Quave is involved, but Quave hasn't even met Danny as of the first book. And I think Quave is sending dreams only after she meets her and touches her. And that's part of that two finger touch. That Qua Remember that strange thing where Quave touches her wrist and it tingles afterwards? It's after that that we get the very clear glass candle Quave transmission. So I think she needed to establish contact first and that aided it. I'm not sure. We talk about that other times, but I do feel the evidence is strong that it is, it's not ascending from Quave. Like Danny sees Drogon and is communicating with Drogon's spirit from the egg. That is how I read it. And so it makes sense to put the eggs in the cradles then because the babies are going to be having dragon dreams and forming a psychic bond before they even hatch. And so, of course, they bond when the dragons hatch, like every time it works. So, John, remember I just said John the Fiddler had dragon dreams at White Walls, right? He, dragon dreams... And it turned out to be a reference to egg coming into his own as a Targaryen. Well, there was a dragon's egg at White Walls, guys. Remember? It was a big deal. It was the prize of the tourney. And Blood Raven stole it with the dwarves, the comic dwarves, uh, sneaking up the uh, privy shaft. It's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it. So yeah, John the Fiddler was getting dreams of a dragon hatching at White Walls. The dragon's egg was at White Walls. So... Potentially, those dreams were coming from the egg. And this is, again, John, a guy named John, was getting dragon dreams. Okay? 
And the dream was really about a Targaryen who was living with a false identity, throwing off their false identity to say, hey, I'm a Targaryen, everyone. So the parallels are absolutely wild. So here's what I am saying. Vermax either left a dragon egg down there or more likely there was one brought during the Pact of Ice and Fire and they stuck it down in the crypts for safekeeping and it was the, the marriage was never fulfilled. But that dragon's egg is down there. And here's where it's really going to get convincing. John's dreams aren't about the Kings of Winter. He says, it's not them I'm afraid of. And he's just marching past them. And they're like, it's not your place. But he has to keep going past them. There's something else calling him and something else that he's terrified of. What is it? It's a dragon. There's going to be a dragon at the end of his dream. When he completes the dream, he's going to see a dragon. And it's going to be an official dragon dream. And it will be coming from this egg that is tied to Vermax and the pact of ice and fire, which was fulfilled by Rhaegar and Lyanna. Do you see how this works? And John has already had something that sounds like a dragon dream, in fact. When Melisandre is talking about Azor Ahai and dragons, or Val is mentioning what Melisandre said, actually. And it says, uh, dragons, you know, dot, dot, dot. For a moment, John could almost see them too, could almost smell their hot breath or almost feel the flap of their wings, one or the other. And so it's almost like a waking dream where he's like, he's like smelling them and sensing them almost as if they're right there for a second. So I think that George is slow walking us up to a John dragon dream. And of course he can't give it to us before RLJ is revealed, but as soon as it is, or as it is, that's what we'll get. So dragon egg, dragon dreams come from eggs and John's recurring crypt stream is coming from Vermax's egg or the one that they brought with Vermax. And there's a new theory. So, yeah. And this is, by the way, this is Raina. Um, of course, uh, Damon and Lena's daughter. It is a different Reina that begins the custom of putting the eggs in the cradle. This Reina, an egg was put in her cradle, but it didn't hatch, unfortunately. It's very sad. But I just thought it was a cool echo since we have a different Reina as a child holding a dragon's egg. And it was originally Reina Targaryen who began that tradition. So shout out to House of the Dragon and all the Reinas. And yeah, this is, uh, this is Azor Ahai by Crucith. So this is Azor Ahai John. I'm a man. This is this is John completing his dragon dream. We are the dragon. He's staring at us, and he is he is his spirit is filled with fire, and the cold skulls are behind him. Something something. So there you go. Um, yeah, shout out to all the Reynas, baby, even yours. So that's it. That's my new theory. What do you guys think? Uh, let's do a poll. Hey, Mano James Plum, three and a half hours into the stream. If you happen to be by your computer, which you're probably making dinner now, but if you happen to be by your computer, hit me up with a poll. Um, do you agree with Dave's new theory or no? Let's, how do we word this? Um, is there a dragon egg sending John dreams in the crypts? Yes or no? And we'll wait a minute. And if it doesn't appear, that means Maynard Plum is making dinner, which he said he might do. And then if not, I will add the poll question in a moment. But maybe it'll just drop out of the sky. Is there a dragon egg sending John dreams from the crypts? And we'll see if people like my theory. But I like it. I think it's pretty good. And I think it's a nice way to tie out the whole John finishing his dream. John needs to find out he's a Targaryen. It all has to do with the crypts. Is it Rhaegar's harp? Nah, not Rhaegar's harp. Hey, look at that. Dreams coming from dragon egg in crypts. Thank you, making dinner, Maynard Plum. <laughs> Appreciate you. I told him I might do it. And then I waited three and a half hours to do it. Oh, it's with popular theory. Look at this. We got, we got the home crowd here for sure. 
Oh, my colored light just went out. Oh, well. Home crowd. Home court advantage. Pretty cool, though. Well, you don't have to agree. I mean, I, I'm. it's only a theory. It's, it's not one of those ones that I'm, like, convinced of. But I think it's a good... I think it's a good theory. Well, no, so this... So let me clarify. Yeah, he's not going to hatch that dragon and ride it. There's not time. He'd need to ride Regal. Um, the point is that there's a psychic connection to the egg and uh, to John's dragon identity. And then the egg itself, this might be the egg that's left over. Like after all the dragons are dead at the end of the story and the others are dead, most of the magic is gone, but we still have an egg or something. Or maybe they'll use the egg for a magic ritual, which I do believe is possible. Dragon bomb theory, stuff like that. But yeah, he's not going to hatch that and ride it. There wouldn't be time. Maybe maybe it hatches uh, as a promise of the future or something. I don't know. Um, I just had this theory, so I haven't gone any further with it. Do you need to touch the egg or be near it to receive that connection? Well, John's been living above it his whole life. So think about it. If there's a dragon egg in the crypts and there's never been a Targaryen living at Winterfell and then Jon Snow comes to live there, it kind of makes sense that maybe the egg would start reaching out. If there's a, you know, feeling feeling the Targaryen near him. Near it, rather. Cool. So uh, we've got uh, about 75-25 here. That's cool. It's pretty strong. Appreciate y'all. Yeah, and the fear makes sense too, right? Yeah, exactly. You would be kind of afraid of that. Danny was at first. All right, it's time for Don John. Thank you, Quinn, for joining the Squishers there. We'll go ahead and end that poll to so get a chat back. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. So, John might wield Dawn. Don Juan, if you will. Um, him and Danny are part Dane, first of all, even though RLJ is true. Because Diana Dane is Egg's mother. And then Egg married a Blackwood, Black Betha. Right? Melissa or Black Betha? Black Betha. Yes, Black Betha. She was the queen. So Egg married a Blackwood. And then Egg's kids were um, Jaehaerys II, who married his sister. And their kids were Ares and Riella, who were brother and sister. Um, and then it went down to uh, Rhaegar and Danny. So Rhaegar and Danny are half Blackwood and one quarter Dane. Speaking in very loose, inaccurate genetic terms, that's not how it works. There's a million genetic markers, and you get some from one and some from the other, and recessive and dominant and all stuff. We know that. However, just talking in terms of like the parenting quarters, okay? We had a Targaryen and a Dane, and that's Makar and Diana Dane. Then they gave birth to Egg. Egg marries a Blackwood, and then it goes straight down with incest. And we preserve that mix until Rhaegar and Danny. And then so John is Rhaegar's son, obviously half Stark. So he's down to one eighth Dane, quote unquote. Whereas Danny is a quarter Dane, quote unquote. And half Blackwood, which is very interesting, but we won't talk about that today. So the point is, I have predicted that Dawn will enter the fray because Darkstar will steal it. That is very heavily foreshadowed that Darkstar covets it and will steal it and will join Fagon's Kingsguard. Fagon is fake Rhaegar's son and Darkstar will be doing a bad impression of Arthur Dane. But... A Dane with Dawn in the Kingsguard is a huge symbol of legitimacy for Fagon that he would love. It will make everyone think of Rhaegar and Arthur Dane. So this is going to happen. So Danny will then eventually, obviously, run into Fagon in King's Landing. Fagon is the mummer's dragon, the cheering crowds, but it's also a lie that Danny's going to slay. We don't know how it's going to go. It's probably going to be tragic. But the point is. If Darkstar is hanging around in King's Landing or some battlefield with Dawn, 
and he's on Team Fagon. Specifically, he might be right next to Fagon, guarding him as a king's guard. Eventually, Danny and Dragons and Fagon and Darkstar are all going to be in the same room, and stuff's going to go down. And there are definitely ways that you can see that Danny will come into possession of Dawn. And then logically, she would give it to John at some point when they team up. The point now, if there's not, uh, that's kind of the necessity of it. And there's also Danny talking about giving Jorah a magic sword. John has Jorah's sword. So you can see if they all are in the same place, John gives his sword back to Jorah because he loves Mormont and he would love to restore, help Jorah restore his honor, you know, for the sake of the old bear. Um, and then John gets Dawn, which is Lightbringer. Because if anyone's going to wield Dawn, it's obviously John. Like, it just is. But what I'm pointing out is that he actually is part Dane. So if Edric Dane is, is involved, he might give the blessing for John to wield it. Maybe he'll be killed somewhere in, in all of this mix. Um, Nedric, Edric Dane, of course, is another clue about a Stark Dane last hero and Eldric Shadow Chaser. He's named after Ned Stark, but he's a Dane, and his actual name is Edric, which is similar to Eldric. So it just tells you Eldric Shadow Chaser was a Stark Dane. Uh, yeah, and then before George scrapped the five-year time gap, he was going to grow up and be named Sword of the Morning. And once he scrapped the time gap, he came up with Darkstar. And that's why we know Darkstar is going to steal Dawn, uh, because originally Edric was going to wield it honestly and then be killed in battle, cough it up to John and Danny. Uh, and instead, we're going to have Darkstar steal it and be killed and then cough it up to John and Danny. This is check out my Darkstar will steal Dawn video if you want the whole thing. But that's the short of the theory. And that's how John can get it in terms of practically speaking. And at some point, someone may point out or observe that, in fact, he is distantly related to the Danes. And so, therefore, he is worthy of being named Sword of the Morning. Maybe Edric Dane will name him Sword of the Morning or some other freaking Dane will come out of hiding and tip the hap and give tip the cap and give the blessing. I don't know. We're going to see Starfall, I think, though, when Ario Hota goes to beard Darkstar in his den or whatever. They're probably going to stop by Starfall there. Grey Waste Tim says, John looting bodies, lots of dead bodies to get Dawn and Euron's armor. That's it, man. That's it. So John could wield Dawn. And to get back, I already explained Venus, so I don't have to go over this again. But the Night's Watch Oaths, like I said, are modeled off of the Venus mythology. The sword in the darkness that brings the dawn, the light that brings the dawn, that's Venus. And Lightbringer, also a name for Venus. Dawn's Sword of the Morning, names derived from Venus. So, if John is going to be Azor High Reborn, if he's going to lead the Watch, if he's going to be like a new last hero, then he should be the Sword of the Morning. These are all the same archetype. So, whether he just is because he wields Dawn, excuse me, excuse me, if he just kind of like is because he wields Dawn or he could actually be named Sword of the Morning. And hung in the South. What does that mean? John's hung in the South for sure. If you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Not like that Mithra statue. <laughs> no, disappointment. John's not a disappointment. He knows the uh, Lord's kiss, right? Not R'hllor's kiss, the last kiss. That's different. Last kiss you give to corpses. Lord's kiss you give to lady parts. That's very different. Okay, so hung in the south. What does that mean? Reel it in, Dave. Reel, re reel it in. That's reeling it out. Reeling it in. John has this experience with the Sword of the Morning constellation. Remember, John loves the stars, loves observing the stars. And there, right before the dawn comes, when the one side of the sky is lightning and turning to purple and blue and things... It says the last stars of evening or last stars of morning hung in the south. And then he describes the bright white star in the hilt of the sword of the morning. So this is definitely Orion, the constellation Orion. Orion is 
one of the most significant constellations in classic mythology, almost always a warrior, generally carrying a club or sword or weapon over their shoulder. Um, later versions with the bow and arrow also. He's also got something uh, hanging from his hip. It's called either Venus's mirror or Orion's sword. And it's an asterism. It's a bright cluster. Oh, I've got it. Let me just get this out. This is cool. I'm going to show you what George is doing here. Oh, I didn't want you to do that. That's not what I wanted. Okay, never mind. I know what I'm doing. I just did it the wrong way. Okay, so this is Orion with like the magnification blown up. So everything is brighter. So you see the three belt stars? Right below the belt stars, you see there's like a little, it looks like a diamond, a pink diamond shape from the third star. And below that is a bright little blob. And it's actually several stars in a row. So this can be seen as Orion's sword in his sword belt, or it can be called the Venus mirror. And the diamond is the mirror and the bottom part is the handle. So it's just kind of an interesting thing because Venus, of course, is a light bringer related idea. Light bringer is this Aphrodite's mirror. But of course, you know, that's tied to Venus and Venus is tied to light bringer. So this is either a sword or Venus mirror. Both of those are light bringer ideas. Orion is always hung in the South. Not always, but like at the, yeah, no, generally, yeah, it appears in the Southern sky. And so um, at, uh, in the morning, there's, what am I trying to say? Yeah, that's generally where it, from the Northern hemisphere, it appears in the South. So this is uh, accurate for him to look in the South and see the sword of the morning constellation so that's no doubt orion and uh when uh when john looks at it he takes heart it's like this sort of moment where he gathers himself and takes heart in the fact that he can see the sword of the morning and the bright white star typically the south is where you'd like to be hung exactly you're five minutes late to the joke but that's it that's it hung in the south that's what i'm saying ladies man john so John is the only one who ever looks or identifies this constellation. And it just seems like maybe it's a clue that John is the sword of the morning and will be the last stars of morning as the sword of the morning. So, yeah, I had to get the chat going with the Lord's kiss stuff. Y'all were falling asleep on me. So we're at 7.50. We've been humming, humming, hanging tight, actually. Steady attendance. Appreciate y'all. Okay, let's keep going. Oh, this is the same point, just different art. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This is by Zippo514. Zippo514. Again, I have modified this. This was an, originally not a white glowing sword. I made it white and I made it glow so that it looks like dawn. I have struck twice. I got Justin Sweet's last hero. And I believe this is supposed to be the Fist of the First Men. It's just labeled by night, as Night's Watch versus the Others by Zippo514. It kind of looks like the fist. It kind of looks like John. He wasn't at the fist, so I'm not really sure. But I figured if I turned the sword white, it would look like Dawn, and it kind of does. So there you go. And then this art is by Max Beach Creative. Also, you think about the Danes. Starfall is in the south. So John looks to the south and sees the constellation, sort of the morning, literally where the Danes are. And so here is, yeah, the sword turning into the falling star. Very cool artwork. You know I love it. It's the sword of the morning. It's hung in the south. Dawn is ice. Now, if you have been to my channel before, you've heard this theory before, so I'll try to go quick with this one. Warham Salt Smoke. Does Darkstar have a shock of spiky hair that goes over one eye like an anime character? <laughs> Absolutely. If so, that would make him kind of an Odin figure, I guess. Well, no, you can't make him an Odin figure but unless George does that. His hair is a silver glacier 
divided by a streak of midnight black. I have joked that is like John standing on the wall. The wall is a silver glacier. John is the streak of midnight black. We should do a dark star symbolism one time. So this is Arthur Dane by Fadli Ramdani, the f same as artist that did the uh, Beefcake John. That is House Dane sigil. This is my favorite uh, Arthur Dane, the salt and pepper Arthur Dane. I dig it. It's got purple eyes and yeah, salt and pepper hair. So Dawn, look, let me just explain this. Um, this is one of those theories where I don't think like, Go ahead, come, come on and fight me if, if you if you want to. But the original ice of House Stark is definitely Dawn, as in the last hero's dragon steel. And it's easy to figure that out. So when we see ice in Game of Thrones, it's from Catelyn's point of view. And she says, the sword ice is 400 years old, spell forged in Valyria. But the name was older still, passed down from the age of heroes, which is thousands of years ago. So Ned's sword, 400 years old from Valyria. It's called ice, but there's been many more swords called ice before that going all the way back to the age of heroes. And if we're talking about Starks in the age of heroes, we're talking about the last hero who wielded Dawn, which looks like a big stick of ice. Look at the thing. It looks like a stick of ice and it's described as pale as milk glass. The bones of the others are also described as pale as milk glass. So I'm not saying that the sword Dawn is made from the other's shin bone, but they look similar. And George is using the same words to describe them. The others ice swords are also alive with moonlight and the wall is alive with light. It's, it's a big piece of ice that's described as a sword also. And then Dawn is pale as milk glass and alive with light. So it's a, it's a glass shin bone. That's, that's the joke. But the point is, it looks icy. And George describes it in the same words as he describes the icy bones of the others so that we know what it looks like. It looks icy. It looks like a stick of ice. So if we had a stark last hero with Dawn. And this is actually Arthur Dane by Mobo Bohm here. You know, it's funny. This is Arthur Dane by Mobo Canario. And this is Arthur Dane by Mobo Bohm. <laughs> People named Mobo love to draw Arthur Dane. It's the weirdest coincidence. Maybe it's the same artist with different names or something. That actually is more likely now that I think about it. This is probably he's probably watching at home laughing. He's like, his name is uh, Mobo Canario uh, Bohm or something. I don't know, but in any case, I modified this one. Dave strikes again. I imposed a meteor and some flame on this. The original is just a cool-looking pale Valerian sword. I made it look like it was on fire. Okay. But the point is that if a Stark was a la was the last hero, and most people think the last hero was a Stark, he had a dog. The story is told to Bran. Bran journeys north of the wall to find the children of the forest, just like the last hero did. So if the Stark, if the last hero was a Stark, and the last hero had Dragonsteel, and if Dragonsteel was Dawn, and so far most people think all of these things are true, then that means a Stark last hero defeated the others in the long night in part with the sword Dawn. So where did the naming tradition come from to call the Stark sword ice? It came from the last hero when he used a big sword that looked like a stick of ice to end the long night. And for reasons unexplained, I have a theory, but let's not get into it now. It ended up down in Starfall for safekeeping. Uh, and now the Danes almost look like stewards like in Gondor or something. Either that or maybe the sword was originally the Dane's sword since they're from the Great Empire of the Dawn and it was loaned to the last hero. And you can see an echo of this at the Tower of Joy. Ned Stark is fighting with these gray wraiths, just like the Night's Watch are shadows in black. 
and he's fighting three king's guard. And the king's guard are always symbolized with the language of the others, snow white armor, ghostly in the moonlight, white shadow this, pale shadow that, okay? All of this language is used for both the others and the king's guard because they're symbolic parallels. And so we have Ned, a last hero figure, with Night's Watch wraiths next to him. They're fighting three others. After this battle is over, last hero Ned takes Dawn and brings it down to Starfall and leaves it there. So what did the last hero do after he defeated the others with Dawn? He brought Dawn back down to Starfall and left it there, probably because it was originally their sword. So it's all right there. Dawn is the original ice. That's where the naming tradition came from. And so if John wields Dawn, it actually will be a repeat of the Stark last hero wielding Dawn. And so in a way, like him being a Stark also destines him to wield original ice. So the last clue about this, this is really great. There are four times in the books where a sword, quote, runs with morning light. And of course, Dawn is a light sword that brings the morning, a sword of the morning. So if a sword runs with morning light, we're like, oh, okay, maybe that's symbolism, right? And especially when it happens twice to John. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, I think it's both in the chapter where he beheads Jano Slint and thinks about Ned, meaning ice and, you know, the Stark tradition of ice and all that. And he lifts Longclaw over his head and it runs with morning light. And so this could be a way to indicate that John should wield a sword that runs with morning light, which is Dawn. The other two times a sword runs with morning light, it's when Rob Stark is sitting as a king of winter at River Run. He's got a sword across his lap and a direwolf next to him in the exact pose of the kings of winter. And his sword runs with morning light. And what is he doing in that scene? He's demanding that the Lannisters bring back his father's sword, Ice. So he's like, bring me ice. And his sword runs with morning light. And a lot of stuff that Rob does foreshadows John. That's mainly what Rob does, in fact, is foreshadow John. And the fourth time a sword runs with morning light, it is actually ice, except for its widow's whale. So it's one half of ice. When Joffrey is given the sword at his birthday, he holds it up and it runs with morning light. So all four times that a sword runs with morning light, it is stark associated. It's twice for John, once for Rob, and talking about ice, and then once when Joffrey is holding ice. So original ice ran with morning light. And as I said many times today, I believe I've made my point. <laughs> so Mobo, Canario, Mobo Bohm, who may or may not be the same person, Fadli Ramdani. And let's talk about John's ghost. Woo! <clears throat> this definitely feels like an iceberg. Ugh. I chose to do the iceberg on the Sunday I didn't have the birds, you'll notice. So I don't have to listen to any cries of pain. Oh, we're getting there, devoted. We're getting there. So John's ghost, as we've said, Varamir says his wolf is fit for a king. It's a second life fit for a king. And it's all in the name. The wolf is named Ghost. So will John's ghost be in his wolf named Ghost? Is Ghost a soul jar for John's ghost? I think so. Um, and then um, a hilt for sorcery. Oh, I love this. You guys are going to love this. This is by Aronsta Sesteo. This is, she did uh, the Craster's Keep as well. This art is by Michael C. Hayes. It says, very good boy ghost, very angry wolf boy ghost. So look at the sword. Look at John's long claw. So you see how the hilt is a wolf head and the sword is a black blade. Now, John is a black blade, as we said. I am the sword in the darkness. He's a black sword in the darkness. He's armored in black ice. 
So John, he's, he's dragon glass knife. Okay. John is a black sword. Ghost is the white wolf. So look at the sword. This, the wolf head is, sw has swallowed the blade. You see the blade is behind the head as if the wolf blade opened its mouth. The wolf head opened its mouth and the blade went inside of it. Just like a sword swallower, make your jokes. But that is what the sword is depicting, a ghost wolf head that has swallowed a black blade. Where is John's spirit going? It's going into ghost. So literally, ghost has swallowed John's spirit. And of course, a black blade makes you think of like his shadow and his, you know, his spirit or whatever going into ghost. So the sword is a symbol. Now, what do we know about swords and hilts? It's a big saying, right? Dalla Mansa's wife says, Sorcery is a sword without a hilt because there's no safe way to grasp it. However, John going into ghost and being reborn is going to be a way to master sorcery. When he comes back as a resurrected being, he will be sort of reconciled to his shadow, if you will, because him and his ghost will now be merged in resurrected John. So he's going to be a wolf man, a shadow man. It's all wrapped up in one. So like ghost is the hilt for the sorcery of John's resurrection, if you will. And this, that's what the sword is telling us. So it's all about John's resurrection. And then, of course, ghost is a weirwood wolf. He is looks like a, the weirwoods. John directly notices it and compares it. And so... A million times, what have I talked about? Azor High going into the Weirwood Net, right? So John going into Ghost is a symbolic parallel of the broader archetypal pattern of Azor High being swallowed up by the Weirwood trees. So John's going into his Weirwood wolf. Firewolf. This is another new theory. I've talked about this only briefly one time. Most of you probably have not heard of it. Oh, I'm going to have to take another bathroom break. Oh, well. Okay, so Firewolf. Not Direwolf. Firewolf. So remember, we've been talking about Ghost the animal is going to be slain to get the spirit back in the body. But what if... We don't let that ghost body go to waste. What if we fire white the wolf too? Seems like it might be wish fulfillment at first. At first, I thought it was just a wacky idea, but more I think about it. So first of all, animals can be whited. Welcome to Squisher, Mook or Muke or Muck, whatever it is. Welcome. Animals can be whited. We know that. We've seen it with the cold whites. We've just never seen it with hot whites. Then we've got the fact that the Starks, their wolves are described as hellhounds. I mean, they're riffing off of Cerberus symbolism very obviously. And Cerberism literally is a hellhound. The Starks and their wolves guard the crypts, which is an underworld symbol. Then when you look at the physical descriptions of the wolves, they're all fiery every single one burning eyes molten gold uh gray wind is like smoke you know this they're they're just like walking fires shaggy's eyes are green fire summer's liquid gold molten gold like the sun and even ghost eyes which look like weirwoods they also look like pools of fire and they look like they're blazing red like stars, like Melisandre's eyes. They're twice compared to Melisandre's eyes. So ghost's eyes also look incredibly fiery. And like red stars specifically. So it's like, yeah, when the red star comes again and John's reborn as Azor High, will like that fire of that red star, it's like reflected in his animal. That's going to be part of his rebirth. So the Starks are hellhounds. They're described in fiery language. Rob and Greywind in particular. Okay, so check this out. I believe it's a Theon vision where he sees Rob and Greywind stalking into the Great Hall of Winterfell. 
and the doors blow open and there's a snowstorm behind him. But it says Rob and Grey Wind stalked in, eyes burning, bleeding from a thousand wounds. So this is a dead Rob and a dead Grey Wind, but they've been reanimated and their eyes are burning and they're coming back to Winterfell angrily. This is all foreshadowing for John. Everything Rob does is foreshadowing for John. Okay. And so this sounds like a whited ghost and a whited John. And let me give you the artist credit. This one is Dejan Delic. And this is the scene where Melisandre calls ghost to her, which by the way, gives you a clue about how Melisandre will be able to burn ghost. She's literally just going to call him into the fire. She'll probably be in the fire too. And she'll probably just call him to her. Warmth calls to warmth. And that's probably how it'll happen. So, yeah. Blazing red like stars. Um, now, here's the thing. And this other artist, this is uh, Kaizoku Hime. And this is a very fire-looking ghost, which is why I used it. This one is one of by one another one of my favorite uh, underappreciated artists, Alcoholic Rattlesnake, aka Luciferes. A very cool name. And so here's that same scene with Mel and Ghost's eyes both looking like red stars from the books. And so yeah. Um, now the final idea here: if John himself is fire whited. the only animals that he could skin change would be other fiery animals, like a dragon or like a fire-whited ghost. Now, Cold Hands seems to still be able to use his skin change or magic on the elk and on the ravens, even though he's resurrected. And I, so I think that tells us that when skin changers are resurrected, they retain their magic. And that's kind of like, what's the point of having John barely use his skin changer magic and then killing Ghost and resurrecting him and now he doesn't have magic anymore? That'd be dumb. If he becomes a fire white or a, some kind of fiery resurrected man, he'd only really be able to skin change fire creatures. So why not give him a fire wolf and then have him be able to connect with the dragon? So these are toasty skins for fiery skin changer to skin change. That's the idea. Daggers in the dark. Where are we? Are we, how far are we? Uh, Nissa Nissa John. Okay. Oh, we're getting there. All right. I think I'm going to hit the restroom real quick. And then we'll talk about why John is like Nissa Nissa. You could sort of take a guess <laughs> here. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to give you the, the full music, though, this time, so I have time to come back so it's not dead air time. Here we go. And here we are. 
Oh, what a lovely Easter Sunday. Thank you all for joining me. We are four hours in exactly. I love you guys. Appreciate you. We're over 700 people. How is that dinner or lunch after church this morning for people who do that? Okay. So he's risen. Hallelujah. Nissa Nissa John, before he's risen, he gets killed. Now, I have said Azor High is a bad guy. He shouldn't have killed Nissa Nissa. That was blood magic murder, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, if we're talking about archetypes and heroic ideals, Nissa Nissa is expressing the heroic ideal of the story in that she, according to the story, willingly lays her life down to save the world. <clears throat> now, I pointed out earlier that John is willing to go on a suicide mission if it is for the greater good. He's willing to sacrifice his own honor, not other people, though. He won't kill other innocent people, but he will go to his own death. And so this is the heroic ideal of the story. It's consistent with the Nissa Nissa ideal of being willing to self-sacrifice. And I always pointed out with Danny, she puts herself on the line. She's not willing to kill other innocent people, just nasty slave masters, right? Miriam Asdor is gray. That's the most morally gray thing that Danny did. Yes, she kind of killed Danny's baby, but you can also understand why she did that. We'll talk about that some other time. However, heroic ideal, self-sacrifice instead of predatory sacrificing of other people. So Azor High is bad because he's using other people's lives for blood magic. However, somebody who does is like Nissa Nissa, who is willing to lay their own life on the line, that's heroic. So we see that John is a hero. He is willing to stick his neck out <clears throat> and it does catch up with him. Now he's murdered partly because of his bad political choices and breaking the Night's Watch O's to go rescue Arya, yes, yes. Also a lot of it because he let the wildlings through the wall, which was a good thing. And so when he dies, he's stabbed and the wounds smoke. And he has, there's tears. And most importantly, you can see Bo and Marsh crying as he stabs John. Bo and Marsh is sorrowful. He doesn't really want to kill John. He thinks he has to for the watch. And so this matches with the Azor High story where Azor Ahai, heavy was his heart for he knew what he had to do. I'm sorry. I love you best. You know, it's this whole sorrowful, regretful killing. And that is... Kind of how Bowen Marsh kills John. We have the salt and the smoke, and then we have this, the stabbing, okay? And what else I noticed is that <clears throat> this is John's death and Rhaegar's death seem parallel. Because um, when Robert talks about killing Rhaegar, he says, I drove the iron spike of my hammer into his black heart. So Rhaegar too was stabbed through the heart. And when John dies, he whispers the name Ghost. When Rhaegar dies, he whispers the name Lyanna. So, not a direct one-to-one -one comparison, but you could say that at that point in the story, Ghost is John's other half. And at that point in the story for Rhaegar, Lyanna is his other half. So, they both die whispering this name. And they both symbolically go into the Green Sea. This is weirwood symbolism. The weirwood net is a green sea that the green seers live in. And so going into the weirwood net can be symbolized by, for example, falling into the green fork or just falling into any water. So Rhaegar falls into the water when he dies. I've got a picture of that here. First of all, here is tragic and beautiful Rhaegar by Kuhariyu. Kuhariyu. This was Daggers in the Dark by Vesa. The Last Tears of the Dragon, this one is called. And then this one is by Maester Yu, and there is Rhaegar in the sea after he has been killed. Now, John, after he's killed, he goes into his wolf, which is the same color as a weirwood tree. So that's going into the weirwood. This is all Azor High going into the weirwood stuff. It's not that important, but I'm just pointing out the same symbolism for both Rhaegar and John's death. And then uh, Lyanna, John's other parent, is also Nissa Nissa. I guess Ned kind of gets sacrificially killed too, but let's just talk about Lyanna. 
Leanna dies in a bed of blood, giving birth to John. And the thing about this is that part of the Lightbringer metaphor of Azor Ahai stabbing Nissa Nissa and Nissa Nissa giving her life to give birth to this flaming sword is that this is a myth for procreation. The stabbing is intercourse and the mother of our saviors all die in childbirth, right? Danny's mom and John's mom both die giving birth to the Lightbringer children, just as Nissa Nissa dies to create Lightbringer. Um, so we see Nissa Nissa in a bed of blood, and she is holding Lightbringer in her hand. It's John. And there's even a nod to this in Stannis' beach scene. When they do their Lightbringer ritual and they burn the seven, he sticks it in uh, the sand. And then um, Davos' son and another uh, squire come and once the flames go out, they gather up the sword or they wrap it in a in a in a cloth or something. And it says the the red sword of heroes looked a bloody mess. And then they swaddle it in clothing like it was a newborn baby. So it's a bloody mess, and they're holding it like a newborn and carrying it away from the scenes. It's a uh, pretty cool stuff. So yeah, uh, Leanna does have a kind of Nissa Nissa death um, in her birth to John. Corn King John. John is called a Corn King. How's this still going? Because John's got a lot, it's a lot to do with John. See, I told you there was going to have some stuff that wasn't in the old ship text video. I did tell you that. <clears throat> so Corn King John, the Raven, quoth the Raven, Corn King John Snow. Now, what's a Corn King? A Corn King. I've been talking about mythical archetypes, right? The Corn King is a is a modern name for a classic mythical archetype. So modern scholars and somebody that wrote a book called The Corn King Cycle, I believe it is, came up with this term to refer to a type of mythological figure who dies and resurrects according to the cycle of the seasons. So Kernunos, the green man, even Osiris from Egyptian mythology, he is green-skinned, associated with nature. He dies and becomes lord of the underworld. He resurrects, and his son uh, Horus is reborn as the sort of new version of him. And so this is all about the cycle of nature. Um, the green of nature dies, the trees lose their leaves and color in the fall and winter, and then they come back in the spring. So this is often portrayed as some sort of green-skinned person, a tree man with the antlers looking like tree branches. He's basically a personification of nature. He's the green man. And uh, no, I don't, North must remember. I, I, I mentioned this earlier. I don't see the reason for a C-section thing. And she'd be dead, too, I think. Like, it's just, that's an instant death. That's not something where she's laying there talking and stuff. So, no. I... I yeah, it just seems overly violent and terrible. I don't see the reason for it. So, um, John being labeled a corn. So the corn king is defined by the attribute of dying in the fall and resurrecting in the spring. So calling John a corn king, George is telling us that John's rebirth will be tied to the turning of the cycle of the seasons. And that makes sense because the long night is a winter that's stuck, right? It's a night and a winter that's stuck. It doesn't give way to day or spring. It just freezes. So if John ends the long night, he will be turning the cycle again and bringing the spring. And so his resurrection will be done with the purpose to turn the cycle of seasons again. And so that is why he is a corn king. This is evidence that he will be reborn and that his mission is to fight the long night. And that's why it is more evidence that he is the prince that was promised. And the cool thing about Osiris and Isis, if we can jump to the next slide, is that the way Isis resurrects Osiris is very interesting. I, Osiris is cut up. Osiris, who tracks with Orion, by the way. So this is 
kind of lining up with this whole sword of the morning thing. Osiris is cut into 12 pieces and scattered throughout the land. And Isis has to go retrieve them like a scavenger hunt, put them back together. But you can't find the 13th piece, which is the dong. So she has to get a stone, which is like a Ben Ben stone, some sacred stone, a Linga stone, whatever. And give him a, you know, a fake wiener. And then she copulates with him and makes Horus. And that's where Horus comes from. And so, if you think about the last hero and the use of the 12, the 12, you know, friends of the last hero, John is a last hero reborn, Melisandre is set to resurrect him, will she climb on the pyre and copulate with reborn Jon Snow in some way to resurrect him? It could, it's not insane I'm telling you that it's not insane. Melisandre has wanted to make a shadow baby with Jon since she laid eyes on him. She talks about it all the time. The earth shadow's thick and dark. Look at look at it out on the walls, 20 feet tall. We could make such a great shadow baby, you and me. I think the shadow baby is Jon. He is the shadow being. Because Mel, he's not dead yet. And so Mel's thinking about making a shadow baby from his life fires. But once he's dead she's going to realize, oh, I've got to resurrect him. So she wants to make a shadow baby. There's some vague Osiris, Isis stuff going on here. I'm just wondering if there is some sort of sex element to the resurrection. So just look out for that. (laughs) Just look out for that. It could get weird. It could get weird. All right, moving on. King John of Winter. This doesn't look like a Winter John. This is Zyrtec Altanaz's Fire White John again. Why are we looking at Fire White John again? Well, Rob's Will names him the King of Winter, probably. And what is the King of Winter? The King of Winter, I looked it up, turns out to be a burning green man. Yeah, Danny tried with Drogo. Orange Tabby, you're so right. She did. She tried to resurrect him with sex. Oh, God, it's going to (laughs) happen. Oh, no. I thought it was just, I thought it was just entertaining you with far-fetched mythical correlations. Oh, my God, it's going to happen. I need to change my glasses for this. She did try with Drogo, and I'm about to show you that Drogo's pyre foreshadows John's resurrection, and the thing they did with Drogo's horse foreshadows the whole ritual with Ghost. Oh, God. (laughs) Oh, man. Oh, it's coming. Wow. Oh, I'm just... This is such a shocking theory uh, to have to think about coming true. <laughs> but it's kind of George R.R. R. Martin, right? Like sex magic, like shout out Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yes. But to have sex magic resurrection, like it's in it's in the mythology. So George is like, well, how do we how do we write this? <laughs> OK, um, so. The King of Winter. The King of Winter turns out to be a burning green man. He is a sub permutation, if you will, off of the Kernunos Corn King Green Man idea. It's a ritual in some parts of Europe. What you do if you're a farmer is you, um, you, 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 okay, so when you harvest in the fall, you take the leftover shoots and corn stalks and things and you, you bind them together to make a little straw man, a little wicker man a mini one, a couple feet tall. You keep him through the winter. You let it dry and brown out, totally dry out. So it's just dry straw. Then at Beltane Festival in the spring, you burn that. You burn the king of winter to usher in the spring. So the entire role of the Starks, first of all, to usher in the spring and to die if necessary. And John specifically is going to become a fire white king of winter. And that is exactly right. 
the folklore king of winter is a is a green man a dead green man that gets set on fire to bring the spring so john is going to be set on fire as the king of winter and he's going to bring the spring like it's right there in the name and he even goes out of his way to describe all the whites like straw they're like straw men and parchment, and they go up in flames very quickly, even if they are frozen. So imagine John being frozen, then being burned, but instead of consumed, it just, I mean, that's the most extreme version of it. But yeah, armored in ice with a burning blade. It could be an ice and fire combination thing. But yeah, he's definitely going to be a burning king of winter. And again, we go back to Rob. Um, Rob with, you know, eyes burning with the wounds returning to Winterfell undead as King of Winter. That's the idea. Burning, a burning King of Winter. Um, and then he, this art is by, uh, let's see, Antonio Manzanedo. And this one is by Anibalis Salvador. I'm sorry, I've got the, the names are really tiny over here. Anibalus Salvador, and this is the King of Winter. This is, of course, based on them sticking Rob uh, Grey Wind's head on Rob's body. Hashtag Rob died twice. He did. No, I didn't read Mists of Avalon. But yeah, Rob died twice. He died in his body, and then he died in Grey Wind's body a few minutes later. Very sad. In any case, they stuck the wolf head on the body, and... Um, this is great. So he's holding ice and you see that ice is smoking here. That's perfect. Grey Wind is described as smoke dark and Ned's ice is described as smoke dark. Okay. So it's like Grey Wind, the Grey Wind is smoke. It is smoke dark. And the Valerian Steel is the color of this Grey Wind. And that dark smoke, that gray wind, that's the long night meteor smoke. That's that's when the long night falls and the sun is blotted out. So this gray wind is alluded to in many places. In any case, this is your king of winter. He is a zombie. He is undead. Pretty much any every time he's been presented to us, he's undead. So, yeah. Also, the Rob with gray, the gray wind with the wolf head on top of the body. This is a clue that like ghost is going to be in John. Like this King of Winter is a wolf man. He is man and wolf fully combined. Like I said, you know, um, reconciled to your shadow, if you will. So that will be John as the King of Winter. He'll be a burning wolf man in terms of symbolism. And on the, in on the inside, basically. Now, the last thing is Danny's vision. Remember, I said, okay, so what's going on inside the tent is a skin changer ritual gone wrong. I'll explain that in a second, but you've got a comatose dying person, Drogo, and his horse that he is bonded to so intensely that no person is allowed to ride it but him. The Dothraki and their horses, remember, okay? Miriam Asdor slays the horse, and she says, strength of the horse go into the rider. And the, the blood sacrifice of the horse is supposed to resurrect or awaken this comatose person. So with John, we're going to have a dead body and a wolf. And the man is going to be in the wolf. We need the spirit of the man and the wolf to go into the man. So how are we going to do that? We're going to cut the wolf's throat or burn it, just like uh, Drogo's stallion was first bled into the bath. Uh, and then burned on the pyre when the dragons hatched. And so, this is a skin changer ritual. It is a foreshadowing of what will be done to resurrect John. This scene. And this art, thank you for asking, is by Manuel Leza Moreno. So, Manuel Moreno. This is the Tent of Dancing Shadows. So, this, this scene with Drogo... And I'll just flash forward to this art. Th this blood magic ritual with Drogo, this is foreshadowing for John's resurrection. And what do we see? What are the two things we see? 
when we look at, when we look from the outside of the tent, we see a wolf. We see the shadows dancing, right? There was a wolf and a man wreathed in flame. That's John. He is a shadow wolf and he's a man wreathed in flame. And we need to combine them. And Miri Mazdur is in the tent showing us how you combine them. She's showing us how do you get a shadow man and a, a shadow wolf and a man wreathed in flame to combine again? You slay the animal, you say the magic words, go into the rider, and then everything goes back into the rider. And then you have a wolf man. So Miri Mazdur was not trying to resurrect Drogo. She knows that Drogo isn't a skin changer. The ancient Dothraki might have been, by the way. But Drogo's not. And so what Miri Mazdur did is she used a skin changer ritual on someone who wasn't a skin changer. And she turned Drogo into a vegetable. So that she did that on purpose because she wasn't trying to save Drogo. As she sort of gave her villain speech right after that. She's like, yeah, Rego will burn no cities. <clears throat> she might have put the horse mind into Drogo. That is possible. I would have liked to see Drogo start neighing and scampering, but I don't know. Maybe the body wasn't up to it or something. But yes, technically, did it work? Nay. <laughs> so yeah, this is what's going on. Is You see the shadow of a wolf and the shadow of a man wreathed in flame. They are dancing. And inside, Mary Master is showing us how to fix John and how to put him back together. We see this vision again in Bran's chapter where he's outside Blood Raven's tent. And this might be because Bran will also be involved in John's resurrection. And so we're seeing it here. Or it's just a shadow and an echo. I don't know. But John or Bran, right before, you know, when all the when the whites are attacking them on the hillside. <clears throat> He sees ghost, meaning a wolf, not ghost, summer, a wolf, a dark wolf, wrestling with a white. And then the white gets set on fire by leaf. So it's the recreation of this vision, a wolf and a man wreathed in flame. And they even use the line wreathed in flame. And that's important because a wreath is a Christmas symbol for the king of winter. So hardy har har, the burning king of winter's symbol is being wreathed in flame. It's exquisite, right? It's beautiful. It makes perfect sense. So yes, a man wreathed in flame and the shadow wolf. This is about John, a burning king of winter. And we see it again outside of Blood Raven's cave with Bran. Again, a, a wolf dancing with a burning man wreathed in flame and then right after that snow gets dumped on everyone so it's maybe a john snow reference i'd have to go back there hodor is doing some interesting stuff his eyes the tears freeze over in his eyes so he gets the ice eyes his beard is frozen too so he's got a snow beard and then he's got one of the swords from the stark crypts so hodor is becoming an avatar of king of winter when Bran is in his head, like a Stark King of Winter. He's got a King of Winter sword, black and red, by the way, because his is a black sword that's got a little bit of red rust. So he's got Lightbringer. He's got Ice Eyes. He's got a snow beard, And he's got a Green Seer inside of him. And he's a giant. So it's a very interesting archetype. We'll have to break that down some other time. But... The wolf and the man wreathed in flame are spotted again there. So this brings me to another new theory. And like I said, I've mentioned this maybe once, but most of you probably haven't heard it. This is about Drogo's pyre foreshadowing John's pyre. I stumbled on this idea in a live stream and I have sort of clarified my thoughts about it. One sec. I hope you guys are having fun. Looks like you are. We're holding steady at 720 for quite a while here. This is Urtak Altanaz again. And this is Burnt Drogo. You can sort of see a horse behind him, a gray smoky horse. 
So, Drogo is a, a solar king, speaking in terms of archetypes. Danny calls him son of my life and all that. John is also a solar king, but he's a dark, a dark sun king. He's wearing black and he's kind of going to be the king of the long night and stuff like that. But he will help the sun come out and be reborn at the end. And Drogo similarly is a sun king, but most of his symbolism is dark. And so they are parallel archetypes. Also, you might notice that Drogon, the dragon named after Drogo, looks just like John. He's the black dragon, you know, shadow black, this and that, just like John is a black shadow. So kind of a match. I explained Mirror Master's skin changer ritual just now as a foreshadowing for John's resurrection. So you guys got that. Now think about the pyre and let's think about this as John's pyre and look at the potential parallels. Danny walks into the pyre. Drogo is the body on the pyre. Under Drogo is the body of the stallion, by the way, the red stallion that they slew in the tent. So recreating this over, we need John's body on the pyre. Ghost may have already been sacrificed and he's put on there too. Or maybe, like I said, I think Melisandre calls him to the pyre. But Danny walking into the pyre, that's definitely Melisandre walking into the pyre. If we're looking at an analog. And who's over there? Oh, there's somebody burning and screaming. It's it's Shireen. I mean, Miriam has door. Yeah. Yeah. Miriam S. Door is burnt on that pyre. So that's probably Shireen if this is all going to be one-to-one. -one. And then we see um, not only Drogo appear. Remember, Danny sees Drogo and his horse resurrect out of the pyre. She sees an image of Drogo riding his smoky stallion up the smoke pyre into the sky where she thinks, oh, well, he's the red comet. That's Drogo's star. The Dothraki believe that when they die, they become the stars. The stars are their ancestors. Okay, so Danny sees fiery Drogo riding a smoky stallion in the pyre. And so that would track to this firewolf idea that not only John is going to get up out of the pyre, but his wolf too. So we'll have John and ghosts potentially resurrecting out of this fire. So it's it's potentially a very close parallel with John's pyre and Drogo's pyre. And then there's the Isis thing. Okay, remember we talked about a potential sex magic part of it? Well, somebody just mentioned Danny tried that right before with Drogo. And when she walked into the fire, she thinks about her wedding. She says, this is a wedding too. It's so lovely. The flames are like the dancers at my wedding and I am welcoming the fire and opening my arms to it. So she's wedding the fire and there definitely is sexual imagery. She thinks about her and Drogo becoming one and take me and all this. There's definitely some of that. So yeah, I definitely think we could have sex magic somewhere involved in this. And it looks like, like I said, Shireen and Miriam Asdor seem like parallels. Mel walking into the pyres, obviously Danny walking into the pyre. And it appears that maybe Ghost is going to be resurrected out of this. This is why I said the Firewolf theory. I thought it was just wish fulfillment at first. But I think it's going to be just really freaking cool. <laughs> I think it's going to be really cool. We're going to have a fire white wolf. And I think Dark Souls did this. Yes. I don't know the Dark Souls game, so I don't know. This is artwork from, I don't know which one this is from. But you guys have seen me use the Dark Souls artwork for Azor High a bunch of times. The one you've seen is this one. His name is Cinder, I believe, right? Cinder? Soul of Cinder? So this is, he's looking at an eclipse and he's got a burning sword. I don't know what the story is. The guy that wrote this one, Hideki, um, I don't know his name, but he's the one that uh, worked with George for 
the newer one that ever Elden Ring. So I don't know that George isn't listed as a collaborator, but he's probably just a fan of George's work. Here's another uh, Dark Souls artwork. So see the flaming sword, sort of Dark Lord and the Eclipse. So this is very uh, Miyazaki. Thank you. Yeah, I know he's very well known. So this is a Dark Souls artwork, and here you have it. You have a burning sword warrior, warrior fire, and some sort of fire wolf here. I don't know if this is a spirit projection or a real wolf. I Like I said, I don't know the lore, so I don't know what is going on in this picture, but this uh, Soul of Cinder is an amalgamation of past champions of fire. That sounds like it's based on Elric and the Eternal Champion, doesn't it? Which is how this all works. When you see a video game and a story and they look similar, it's like, oh, they're probably reading the same mythology or the same shit from the 70s or whatever. And that's that's essentially what we've got here. So yeah, this may be the case. This may be sort of an over-exaggerated version of John and Ghost. We could probably kick some ass of the others with that, I'm thinking. So, very cool. And, I, you know, that artwork, um, some of that was uh, the one I just showed you. Sorry. With the wolf. That was by Steve Kakei. And this one is by Mohammed Saad. And I think he did the other one, too, with the Eclipse. So if you want to look up the Dark Souls artwork, it's obviously pretty cool. So moving along here, um, the Smoky Style. Yeah, we just covered all this stuff. So I talked about this, the Blood Magic Ritual and how it parallels. Yep. So this is uh, Magali Villeneuve putting, uh, and this is Danny putting the, the egg on the pyre. So again, Danny's pyre is where dragons are woken from stone. So if John's going to fulfill the prophecy and be a dragon woken from stone, this should it makes a lot of sense that this that John's resurrection would match Drogo's pyre. I mean it's it makes more sense than any parallel we've seen in the book. So in Drogo's pyre we hatch dragon's eggs, in John's pyre there's no eggs, but there is John. So it's just more evidence that he will be the dragon waking from stone. Yet more, yeah, I just cycled through this earlier. Sorry, this is Franz Volwinkle. And this is, of course, Danny waking the dragons under the bleeding star and fulfilling the prophecy. Apparently only her shirt burned off. The pants are stubborn. <laughs> I guess he didn't want to draw her ass too. I don't know. Fantasy always has to have boobs hanging out, right? It's part of the thing. So, the thief. Let's talk about a little, quick little more uh, astronomy. Eldrick Stoneskin says, I've got a video coming out soon about the parallels between John and Danny's funeral pyre. Both involve burning a scaled child to wake a dragon from stone. Oh, oh hey, okay, Eldrick. Thanks for the tip. Appreciate you giving me that leaked. Uh, you see, we're obviously barking up the same stream, so... Shout out to Eldrick Stoneskin. Check out his channel, Eldrick Stoneskin. Uh, yes, correct. Danny's child is. Is it put directly on the fire on the pyre, or is it just burned separately? But either way, the sacrifice of Danny's baby goes into the waking of the dragon. So yeah, <clears throat> if Shireen is burned, then that would be the parallel to Danny's lizard baby too. In this, uh, nice one. Nice. Okay, so I told you that the planets are wandering stars, right? We're talking about Venus. Well, Mars is the red wanderer, obviously. And in A Song of Ice and Fire, the faith of the seven, the seven planetary wanderers are, or the seven wanderers, are associated with each of the seven. And Mars is associated with the smith. So the Red Wanderer, the Smith, and then let's think about Mars. Uh, what are you saying, Eldrick? Resurrected people who've lost their wits with bells in their hair. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, 
Oh! Oh, Eldrick! I know, I know. Oh, oh, oh. Eh. Oh, man. Ah. Reser oh. Drogo is kind of zombified at that point, and he has bells in his hair, and he's been rendered, sent he's lost his wits. No, not Aegon Frey. Greatly still. Hey, God, Frey's alive. He's going to be up at the wall. No, it's... Oh, man. And we've also... People have speculated that if somebody tried to burn Shireen, that Patchface would try to stop it because Patchface loves Shireen and would never hurt Shireen. So is that Mel, Patchface, and Shireen all giving their lives in this fire? Uh, maybe we need two people if we're going to resurrect John and Ghost. I do think Melisandre will not be done, even if she walks in the pyre. I think she will be pulling an Obi-Wan Kenobi, and she will become a fiery force ghost. This is in the the Melisand uh, in the Melisandre Secret series, Fire Others. She is in the process of transforming into a fire spirit. She is not undead. She is losing her physical form and turning into a fire other. And so every act of magic that Melisandre does further transforms her and sears away her humanity. We get this description in her chapter. So if she practices a major feat of fire magic, like resurrecting John, she may become a fire other and lose her physical form. Then she will be a spirit like Obi-Wan Kenobi, she might be able to appear and reappear. Um, this is something that could make a lot of sense. So Patchface and Shireen to resurrect John and Ghost. That's more evidence for the Firewolf theory. So let's get back to the Red Wanderer. The Red Wanderer is Mars. Mars is the warrior. He's like a... Mars, as in like Roman mythology, okay, um, is is the same as Ares. So like when Drogo calls Daenerys Dan Ares' wife, that's a reference to Danny being a warrior like Ares and Mars. Ares, the consort of Aphrodite. So it, it, Danny gets both sides. Interesting. Um, so yes, the Mars, the Red Wanderer, sacred to the smith. Think about this. Azor High is a smith. He labored for 100 days and nights to make Lightbringer. He's smithing it himself, and he's tied to the Red Comet. So the Red Wanderer, Mars, that's cool. But more importantly, John himself is the stranger. He, he calls himself uh, the stranger, you know, the wanderer. And he'll always, his name will always be shouted. He thinks, you know, when he flees the wall, he's like, oh, I'll always be the man at the edge of the campfire. You know, there's another line where he thinks about his name always being shadowed. Um, and then when we go to the burning of the seven on Dragonstone, we see that the statue of the stranger has a burning hand that falls off. And of course, Ghost or John has a burnt hand. Now, the stranger is called the wanderer from far places and is depicted as a shadow with stars for eyes. The red wanderer is a wanderer from far places in the comet. So John being associated with the stranger, this is all about the comet, the red wanderer, and it all comes together. If this seems mushy, this all comes together when John is talking to you grit and you grit. And they're both looking up at the stars. And she said, uh, John's like, Oh, the red wanderer, that was sacred to the Smith in the, you know, in the down South up here, they called it the thief. And the wildlings believe that the best time to steal a woman is when the thief is in the moon maid. So the moon maid is a constellation and they are saying, this is an alignment thing. When Mars, the red wanderer appears inside of the constellation called the moon maid, that is when you steal a woman. But of course, this is just spelling out 
the Long Night Moon Disaster. The Red Wanderer is also a term for the Red Comet, and the Moon Maid could just be the Moon. So this is when the Red Comet is in the Moon. That's a good time to steal a woman. Now we're talking about Azor High and Nissa Nissa coinciding with the Red Comet being inside the Moon Maid. So it's really good stuff. And then on top of that, Ygritte says, like the night you stole me. So when John stole Ygritte, meaning spared her life and took her captive, the, the thief was in the Moon Maid. On top of that, when Corrin is, or when uh, the other rangers are sending Corrin and John up to the campfire where Ygritte is waiting, they look at the campfire and they say, oh, it looks, it looks like a red star from here. And then they say, when you get up to the top, throw down a burning brand. Okay, so there's a red star in the sky and there's a moon maid up there. And when Azor High John climbs up to the moon maid, they do throw down a burning brand. And the red comet is also compared to a burning brand by Aaron Dampere. So the whole thing is there. Azor High John climbs up the sky to the moon maid, to the red star. And then... There is an Azor Ahai killing Nissa Nissa symbolism, except for that John doesn't quite kill her, but he almost does. And then they throw down the red star. So it's like, oh, now stars are falling down from the sky because Nissa Nissa has been killed and the red wanderer is now in the moon maid. So this is all really good mythical astronomy symbolism. It's all saying the same thing over and over again in slightly different ways. The red comet hits the moon. It's just like Azor High stabbing Nissa Nissa. Lightbringer stabbing Nissa Nissa is like the comet stabbing the moon. Nissa Nissa is the moon. The comet is Lightbringer. That's perfect pairing. So that's what's going on with the thief. It's just a bunch of mythical astronomy symbolism jammed into John's plot line because he is the Red Wanderer. He is an Azor High figure. He is stealing moon maids. Um, and yeah, that's that's his deal. So... So here's just another picture. Um, oh, sorry, that last art was by Lauren Cannon, Summer and the Red Comet. And this is a photo by, who's it by? Jonathan Eggleston. I've had at least five people send me this photo. Eldrick Stoneskin, could the comet reappear at John's funeral pyre? Absolutely. That's the most likely time that it would appear. I would guess so. I would guess so. Um, so Mars the Red Wanderer. Um, here, this is basically a blood moon and a meteor. Uh, one of the Geminids. But it kind of looks like a comet and a moon. So, vibes. Vibes. It's a full moon and, uh, and a meteor shower happening at the same time. So it's pretty close. Ah, and here's the one from the seven. Like I said, the red comet above... We see the burning gods and the, like I said, the stranger has a burning hand. Also, the, the, the warrior falls athwart the maiden. So there's like the Azor Ahai is the warrior and he's athwart the maiden. So they're, he's killing her, but they're laying together. And then, yeah, so there's the, all the Azor Ahai stuff is spelled out heavily at the burning of the seven. I think we've done a chapter reread of that at one time. Maybe it's time to do that one again. This artwork is by Kimberly Pope. So yeah, this is probably more foreshadowing for John's resurrection here. Essentially, they're talking about waking dragons from stone and all this crap. Snow moon, snow moon. So John is tied to this ending moon destruction. And this Eldrick Stone skin is why I think the red comet reappearing will definitely have happened by the time John is resurrected. He is tied to the moon disaster yet to come. So when he fights Othor in Mormont's chambers, Othor is describing described as having a moon face and his name is Othor, which sounds like other. So he is a 
an archetypal figure. He represents the others and the other moon. Because in the Carthine tale, one day there was a second moon. It wandered too close to the sun and cracked. And that's where dragons come from. They drank the fire of the sun. One day the other moon will kiss the sun too and crack and the dragons will return. The other moon. So it's like, yeah, it's an ice associated moon. It's associated with the others. It's going to bring the return of the others. And the meteors are probably going to hit in the north as well, near the wall or something like that. In any case, when John kills Othor, Othor has a moon face. And John takes a sword and he slashes him right across the face. So this is Azor Ahai Nissa Nissa, but also like the sun stabbing the moon in the sky with the comet as a sword. So it's recreating the long night symbolism right there. And then, of course, what do we do to the moon? We burn it. John burns his hand, covers the moon in the drapes, and it burns. So everything fills with smoke. And uh, that's, the whole, that's the whole myth right there. I've been collecting this artwork for a while, yeah. There's two moons in Elden Ring. Of course there are. And wasn't one of them, like, gone and replaced with, like, a facsimile or a hologram or a spirit projection or something weird? I have been watching a little bit of Elden Ring's lore. We're going to do it. I'm getting around to it probably after the season. Michael Talks About Stuff has been plowing into it a bit. <laughs> okay, plowing, snow and moon, get it? Okay. So John has this wolf dream. It's his longest wolf dream. And in it, the moon is calling his name, Snow, over and over. And what's happening is that the Re Mormont's raven is trying to wake him up out of his wolf dream. So in the dream, Ghost is running beneath the moon. And it describes the moon in interesting symbolic language. And there's the wall and the, the wolf is racing through the white wood and all this stuff. But there's this refrain that keeps happening every couple lines. Snow, the moon cried. Snow, the moon insisted. Snow, the moon called down. Just like that. Snow, the moon called down. And then as he wakes from the dream... So basically, the, it, the moon is talking with the raven's voice. I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear. There's a raven in the room saying, snow, snow, snow. And it's bleeding into his dream. And in his dream, it seems like the moon is saying, snow, snow, snow. Then he wakes up and the raven lands on his chest with a thump. So it's literally like the snow moon has just fallen on John. And then... He takes his pillow and throws it at the raven. Because the raven hops off him to the corner of the bed. He throws his pillow at the raven and misses, which is kind of mean. He could have killed the raven with that pillow. It's kind of, I mean, I've been mad at Cleo, but I've never thrown a pillow at her. In any case, he throws the pillow at the bird, bird abuse, misses. And the pillow explodes against the wall in a flurry of feathers. And a pillow is a round white object, just like a moon. And just a second ago, the moon was a white raven. So when he picks up the pillow, this is another moon symbol, just like the raven. And he is full of feathers and he throws it at the wall. <laughs> so is the a piece of the moon going to get thrown at the wall? And is the sky going to fill with a flurry of moon bits and snow and ice? Answer is yes. And we found a parallel proof to this in the Eerie with the moon door. When they open the moon door at Tyrion's trial, it slams into the wall. <laughs> and it's the, it's the moon door and it's literally the moon door slams into the wall and then a bunch of snow blows in and they can see darkness and cold stars gazing in. So it's like the moon hits the wall, darkness falls, and then the others invade. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful stuff. And so it's the same thing here. Snow, the moon called down. 
It's like a white raven. And of course, the white ravens announce the coming of winter. And so we've got a snow moon. It lands on John's chest. And then he recreates the whole thing a second time by taking his pillow, smashing it against the wall, and creating the flurry of feathers. So I mentioned these other two points already. The other moon, okay? And then the idea that when the stars bleed, Azor Ahai will be reborn. It's, that's a meteor shower. It's, so it's a whole, it's a flurry of moon bits. But, but wait, it gets worse. <laughs> so here is, um, this artwork is by Philip Ehrlich, who I'm pretty sure is a fan of my podcast. He's drawn the Shadowlands and the Bloodstone Emperor and other things that we like. And he drew two moons in a comet when the two moons legend doesn't even have a comet. I'm the one who associated a comet with the two moons. So shout out Philip Ehrlich, wherever you are. Send me a message. I'll commission some more artwork from you. Um, but yeah, there is two moons and a comet. So same points we were just making. I just, I forgot to show this to you when I referred to, uh, you know, the, uh, the legend. Thank you, Barris Aurelius. Tell the world. Go tell the world, buddy. And this is by Eric Shoemaker Levy. No, I'm sorry. Eric Shoemaker. Shoemaker Levy is a comet. <laughs> This is artwork of a moon exploding into moon meteors. And so these are the bleeding stars that are coming. So they might not be, um, you know, snowy themselves, but they're going to trigger the snowstorm and that they're going to knock down the wall. They're going to throw up the clouds of smoke and ash and debris, which will block the sun. And then the winter will fall. This is all coming at the ends of winds of winter. So, if George did cryptically announce Winds of Winter's imminent release with his blog post a couple weeks ago, which some people do think, that means I am either going to be, uh, well, I could, I could, uh, the channel could expand very rapidly. I would just say that if there is a moon disaster and a comet that causes the long night at the end of Winds of Winter, there will be more people coming to our channel rapidly. And we will, there'll be interesting times. So we'll see if that happens, but I've been predicting it since 2015. So, uh, I've been just getting more and more certain <laughs> over all that time that it's, that it's happening. It's the end of the world and John knows it. And he thinks about it all the time. He does all the time. It's ridiculous. I can't cite all the quotes here. Check out the Lord Snow video. But John, every time he looks at the wall, practically, he's like, man, it's the end of the world. You know, and at first he's thinking like, oh, this is the end of the known world. But other times he's like, if it ever fell, it would be the end of the world. And when he's angry, he thinks I could smash it down in a second. So no, I don't, th I think that when John's resurrected, the comet will still be in the sky. Probably. I don't know, actually, Kim. I don't know. Maybe they'll be resurrecting him during the long night. I think it will fall after. I think we'll see the comet return. He'll be resurrected and the long night will follow. Will fall sometime after that. It'll be the very last thing in Winds of Winter. Will be the fall of the long night, I would think. He's got to fit it in Winds of Winter, and there's it's just a great place to stop a book. So John does think about the end of the world all the time, and he always thinks about that in association with the wall. If it ever fell, it's the end of the world. It is the end of the world. Whatever. It's like 10, 10 different quotes. It's, it's absurd. And one time he thinks, I'm so angry I could smash it all down in an instant. So we have this whole idea of John picking up the moon pillow and throwing it at the wall. So it could be that John is working some magic that brings on the moon disaster. Maybe the dragon horn that's up there that Melisandre tried to burn, but didn't. <clears throat> we shall see. I've got horn videos coming, so I don't want to get into horn talk right now. But there are some implications that John could be responsible in some way. It's probably just symbolism. 
But somebody's got to call the Comet. So I think it's going to be Euron and Danny with those dragon binder horns. But I, I've got horn theories, so just hang on with that. And Ice Dragon John, this is still more RLJ symbolism, if you think about it. John, in the same way that he always thinks about the end of the world, if you look up every mention of the Ice Dragon, almost all of them are in John's chapters, because John is the Ice Dragon. He is the son of Lyanna Stark and Rhaegar Targaryen. He is a dragon hidden under the snow in the north. And now at the wall, he's like literally a frozen dragon. Like he's cold. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so a Stark Targaryen symbol symbolically is an ice dragon. This is Urtek Altanaz on this artwork. He's an ice dragon. Um, John thinks about it all the time. Um, of course, comets are ice dragons too, right? Like actual comets are frozen balls of dirt and rock and trace minerals and iron and lithium and a little bit of nickel and whatever else. Phosphorus, actually. But they are frozen. They are definitely frozen. So the so if you look at a comet and say, that looks like a dragon, that's an ice dragon. And the red comet is compared to Ned's sword, ice. Which is actually perfect because the comets are very dirty ice. It's like black ice, actually, to use the black ice word. It's like black ice and space goo, which is like tar. It's like barbecue char tar frozen on to like the the like frozen rock and minerals so it's black ice it's an ice dragon it's all that stuff you see where george is kind of drawing his inspiration for all of his black swords and dragon swords they're all me it's all meteor stuff it's all comet stuff so john is an ice dragon his rebirth will be tied to the return of the comet which is an ice dragon and the ice dragon will be bringing the winter just as the ice dragon brings the winter in the short story, the ice dragon, this ice dragon comet will be bringing the winter. Um, and then uh, again, this is a lot of it's tied to the wall. So it seems like the fall of the wall will be tied to this meteor event. That's how the wall will be knocked down. And of course in the show, it was an ice dragon that knocked down the wall. And at the time me and the myth heads all pointed at it and been like, look, it's a comet knocking the wall down, kind of, sort of. <laughs> so there it is. There's your ice dragon knocking down the wall. It's going to be a comet, though, not an ice dragon. And this brings us to our last group of theories. Let's say goodbye to group three. We're on to... Group four, not, don't, that's, no, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Group four is a much shorter group. This is like seven or eight theories about the others, as you can see, John and the others. I've made a lot of videos about John and the others, so I don't want to rehash all of it. I will quickly go through some of the most important things. I've got a couple of things to add that you haven't heard before, and that will be what I will focus on. However, Why does it this have language? Um, Waymar Royce didn't get his text. This was done quickly and at the last minute. And what was this supposed to be? Hang on a second here. Waymar Royce. Oh, Starks and others. Okay, so this is the slide. This is just an extra picture. Okay, so... Starks and others, they are obviously connected. Obviously connected. Um, George says, what is the Song of Ice and Fire? Well, on one hand, it's Danny and the dragons. And then on the other hand, it's like the north and the wall and everything that's going on there. So Starks, the others, the wall, the Night's Watch. That's the ice part of the recipe. And the idea that the Starks are connected to the others, it's kind of intuitive, they're the lords of winter, so they're the kind of human version of the Starks. They always come down from the north. Um, Peter Baelish jokes about they always melt when they come north of the neck, so that's kind of funny. Um, and they talk about a frozen hell reserved for Starks. So there's a lot of language that suggests them as otherish, but of course it goes way beyond that. 
Let's look at that prologue picture. This art is by Young Yang. And this one is by Magali Villeneuve. So, this is Waymar versus the others. This is my favorite picture of an other. With the crystalline armor. So here's what's interesting. In the prologue of Ice and Fire, a Night's Watchman is killed by an ice sword. In the next chapter, which is Bran 1, a Night's Watchman is killed by an ice sword. <laughs> so, Waymar is killed by the ice sword of the other. And then Garrod, who's fled from the wall, and this very scene, is executed by Ned Stark with a sword called ice. <laughs> so... It's like, damned if you do, damned if you don't. <laughs> You're going to get executed with an ice sword, whether you stay there and fight the others, or if you flee south to Winterfell. It's the same answer either way. <clears throat> and so this is a clue that the others and the Starks are one in the same in some way. They are both wardens of the Night's Watch. So it's kind of funny. And it's one of many parallels between the Starks and the others. Many parallels, many videos about this. This is the Crypts of Winterfell by Fran Vegas, and it is a cold hell reserved for Starks. All the Kings of Winter are cold, cold glances, all that stuff. So now the Night's King may have been a Stark. And this is how the Starks have the blood of the other. And this somewhat humorous art is by um, Kurtana. Gotta get the nipple in there. It's un The side boob wouldn't actually show the nipple, really. They're bending time and space to bring you this ice nipple. Much like the Egyptian hi uh, uh, hieroglyphs where the people are sort of flat and they're sort of looking forward. Somehow the side boob has, has bent time and space. <laughs> In any case, she's very cold and very sexy. That's Night's Queen. There's Night's King. Um, so, um, I've got lots of ideas about Night's Queen. Check out my Night's Queen videos. I've got many theories, but she may have been a Stark or Night's King may have been a Stark. But... Uh, Old Nan suggests to Bran that Night's King was a Stark. I think it was actually Night's Queen. And the reason why is because all the Night's Queen parallel figures are Starks or implied Starks. And the best one is Lyanna. Lyanna is named after the Night's Queen, the Lyannon She. The Lyannon She, and this is by Gwyleth, is a spirit of the dead. She is Night's Queen. She is a frozen ghost of the damned. I don't want to go get lost in the mythology, but like, just look at her. It's Night's Queen. She's called a Leanne She. <laughs> so Leanna with her blue winter roses, like, yeah, that's, she is the Night's Queen archetype of all archetypes. And her son is Jon Snow. So that parallels Jon Snow and the others, uh, it parallels babies that are supposed to be given to the others, like mon like monster, like Gilly's monster. Gilly, by the way, the Gilly flower is a blue flower. So Gilly, just like Leanna, Night's Queen figure, mother of other babies. So yeah, I think it may have been Night's Queen that was originally a Stark, but one way or the other, there are clues that one or both was a Stark. And we know that, of course... Sometimes other babies don't get given to the others. Sometimes they are rescued. This artwork is by Zachary Fiore. And Gilly's baby monster was supposed to be given to the others. But instead... <laughs> don't worry about it, ironic calamity. I'm just saying the artist, from the angle, we shouldn't have been able to see the nipple. But they drew the nipple anyway. <laughs> because it's just more fun to draw a nipple. But I'm just saying, anyway, don't worry about it. It's not important. 
I love that that's that's what you're confused about though on this stream. <laughs> so sometimes other babies are rescued by Night's Watchmen instead of being given to the others. Sam, a heroic Night's Watchman, helps Gilly rescue her baby. Now, interestingly, one of the things they talk about doing with Monster is fostering him at Winterfell and raising him with the Starks. So now let's flip over to Lyanna, who is a Night's Queen figure. What does Ned do with her baby, her snow baby? He takes it home to Winterfell and raises it as a Stark. There's more echoes of this pattern. Theon Greyjoy, um, his mother is a Night's Queen figure. Alanis and Harlaw, she is corpse-like. And Ned steals the baby and brings it back to Winterfell to raise as a Stark. So I'm pretty sure that what happened was originally we had a, a other baby, a child of Night's King and Queen, who may have already been a Stark, brought back to Winterfell, rescued from their fate, not fully ice transformed, and that person became a Stark. Now, guess what we have? A Stark with the ability to wield ice magic. I wonder who built the wall. Supposedly it was Bran the Builder Stark. How do you get a Stark that can build a magic ice wall? I think I just answered the question. So that's Bran the Builder. He is a stolen other baby and the others have the blood, I mean, the Starks have the blood of the other. And so that is why it is John and Bran's problem to fix, just like Danny inherits the dragons and you know the legacy and she's undoing it with the slavery and all that. Same with the Starks. They have the blood of the other inside them. And that means just like the others are coming for Gilly's baby, they are hunting for baby monster. They want monster. They also want a Stark. They are owed a Stark. Just like the Starks are owed a Targaryen baby. They're owed Jace's daughter, right? So the others in the same way, because of some ancient pact, are owed a Stark baby. And this is the prince that was promised to the others. But uh, first, we have to look at this art by Irene's Color. So this is Lyanna with the icy Knight's Queen. Rhaegar, by the way, a great Knight's King symbol. That's neither here nor there. But yes, he dresses in black. Man that knew no fear. So promised, John is the prince that was promised dot, dot, dot to the others. And this is the thing. Just like the Pact of Ice and Fire is about a baby promised to the Starks, a Targaryen baby. John is a half Targaryen baby that has been promised to the others. And going back to the Tower of Joy, one more time, one more time. This is Mike Miller's Tower of Joy. Who is watching John's birth? The blue eyes of death are in the sky, folks. The others are watching John's birth. Why? Because he's the prince that was promised to the others. And this is their signal to move. I think this is the thing that got them stirring. Mance has said they've been stirring for a few years now. Craster's been giving babies to them for however long. We don't know. But yeah, 17 years ago, 18 years ago, John was born. The others were watching poetically and figuratively. But this is George telling us that, yeah, the others are watching out for the signs and the stars and they have their own prophecy, and John is who they want. They want to make him a vessel for the, the to rebirth of the Night's King, who, by the way, is originally Azor High. Azor High became the Night's King and got locked in the frozen side of the Weirwood Net, just like in Loki, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. And the others want somebody. And this is the whole thing with Waymar. People have picked this up. The others were testing Waymar. Waymar looks like John. He's a distant cousin of John. In fact, the Royces and the Starks have many marriages going back. He wears moleskin gloves like John, too, just so George can encourage us to compare them. He is a young lord, about the right age. And so the 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 others test him. They draw him out into the woods. The other ones stand back while one of them duels. And as soon as Waymar slips up and gets wounded and bleeds, they laugh at him and they say, you're not the one. 
And then they dispatch with him in cold butchery. They all move in and they just butcher him. So something changes when they see that Waymar bleeds and that he's mortal or when he failed the test, they said, you're not, you're nothing. They dismissed him. They killed him. But they were treating him with either caution or respect before then. And so what were they doing? They were testing him. And if he passed the test, what were they going to do? Something besides kill him because they killed him when he failed the test. So what is pass? What, how does, how would Waymar pass that test? Well, if he was John and John is going to be undead by the time he meets the others. So if an other stabbed John, he wouldn't bleed. And they'd be like, oh shit, you're the one. Maybe that's what this is about. But the point is, I think the others want somebody. And not only that, if you think about Waymore's transformation, it's symbolic of a Knight's King, okay? Because what happens is his one blue eye turns, uh, his one eye turns blue. So this is Odin's symbolism, you know, the one-eyed wizard thing. We see it with Blood Raven, except for Blood Raven's one eye is red. Waymar rises from the dead with one blue eye. So even though he's an ice white in the story, in symbolism terms, he's showing us Knight's King, resurrected, one-eyed blue wizard. So Euron is a wizard with one blue eye who's shaping up to be the big villain of the story, right? But he's also got dragon symbolism because Azor High became Knight's King. Then we look at Aemond Targaryen. He's got one blue star sapphire eye. It's even a blue star eye, just like Waymar's blue star eye. Aemon Targaryen is a dragon man <laughs> who wears night black armor and a blue star eye and rides Vagar, who's coated as an ice dragon. Okay, remember I said that the knight, um, the Kingsguard are symbolic others. Well, who, what king do they guard? A dragon king. Who do the others guard? The Knight's King. Because the Knight's King is a dragon king. He is original Azor High. It's said in so many ways. Stannis is a Knight's King, also posing as Azor High, that he takes up residence at the Night Fort. What is it, ADHD scholar? Oh, there's, oh, we have a, uh, well, why don't we have mods in the chat? Scott of Greywater Watch. This is this is what you got the mod for. There you go. Okay. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Okay, so um, let's see here. Where were we? Uh, and I apologize for any of you who've seen those messages in the chat. You know how it is. Can't control everyone on YouTube. Whatever. Anyway, okay, so um, where were we? Oh, yes, the archetypes. So Aemon is a dragon man and a knight's king. Euron, dragon symbolism, knight's king. Stannis, Azor Ahai symbolism, also knight's king. So original Azor Ahai, knight's king. So what the others are testing for is a vessel to put this spirit in. And they want John. They'll probably end up with Euron as a sort of <laughs> second choice. But this is what they want John for. This is why the whole prince that was promised to the others, like, what do they want? They don't just want to take John and then kill him and be like, aha, our pact is fulfilled. No, they want to fill him with the spirit of Knight's King. Check out the video, A New Knight's King, for the whole details. But yes, pacts are often sealed with children. In the story, whether it's marriage pacts or fostering, truces between... Um, Competitive uh, opposing sides are often settled by trading children. So it could be there was original pact with the others that involved giving them children and all this and that. So here is Leanna with her baby John in the snow. This is an interesting uh, conceptual piece. It is by Maester Yu. So this is John, the prince that was promised to the others. And John's destiny, like I said, oh, this should say Lord Snow at the top. It still says Prince that was promised to the others. It should say Lord Snow. I just didn't, uh, it's a typo. So John, 
he will become Night's King, at least for a while. I think the others are basically going to steal his body for a hot minute. Then they are going to put that Night's King spirit in there. Uh, and we're going to have to drive it out to steal his body back. That's where the fire magic is going to come in. So it's going to get real crazy. And uh, no, I didn't. No, I said you're on. Oh, you heard someone else. Okay, yeah, no, I can't control that. So here's the thing. Jon Snow's name, not only is, so Ygritte says it's an evil name, right? And it makes him sound cold, but it's literally, an, it's really just another way of saying Jack Frost because John is a nickname or Jack is a nickname for John and Snow and Frost are the same thing. So Jack Frost, obviously is some sort of frosty folkloric being, he's literally the one who makes the frost on the windows. And that's why you see the figure touching the windows here. That's the hoar frost. And so Jack Frost, I mean, he looks, looks like another, <laughs> right? So yeah, I say Aenys, Rainies, and Daenerys. I know some people like to say is, but whatever. It's okay. Do what you want. So Jon Snow is named after the spirit of winter himself, Jack Frost. So will Jon become a Night's King? Will he become Jack Frost? Maybe. This art is by Daniel uh, Bernal Imaginante, by the way. This, this is the cover of my Lord Snow video. Um, Bran sees a vision of him. <laughs> Denise the Dreamer. <laughs> Bran sees a vision of John at the wall growing cold and hard as the memory of all warmth fled from him. It's very extreme language. The memory of warmth fled. Like, that sounds like John getting icy whited, ice cold. Speaking of babies, what's going on with Monster and Little Sam? It seems important, but I can't figure out how it will play into the plot. Well, the others are coming from Monster, so that could cause some chaos at the wall. Maybe they will try to give Monster to the others. Um... Maybe he will be used for sacrifice. Maybe not. Um, I think somebody has a crazy theory about Monster becoming the vessel for Night's King's return, but I can't remember whose theory that is. Oh, Tony Teflon, I think that is. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's Tony Teflon. He thinks Baby Monster is going to be uh, the spirit of Night's King. I definitely could see him get used in a magic ritual or something. You know, not that I want to kill babies. Please don't say that about me. But thank you, Jacob, for the super chat. So, John, of course, in his Azor High dream is armored in ice. And that could just be a description of an ice-whited body. His body might stay cold, even when he's filled with fire, so that he's a hybrid, or maybe the ice will just be driven off. We don't know. And then, of course, there's a funny scene way back when, when Arya is in the, she is below King's Landing, and she's a little bit scared, and there's the dragon skulls, and she's like, I don't need to be scared. And she remembers a time in the crypts when John covered himself in flour and hid in a sepulcher, and Rob led the other younger kids down and started telling ghost stories. And then John jumps out as a pale white ghost moaning for blood. And Arya punches him in the stomach and says, you stupid, you scared the baby. Now, when John was murdered, it was described as a punch in the stomach. Only when Bowen Marsh withdrew his hand, the dagger stayed put. So that's a death symbolism, the punch in the stomach. And there is John as a white other ghost coming out of the crypts. So... If John's body is stolen by the others, that this will be foreshadowing for that. And he will need to be somehow freed from that enchantment. So somebody may have to stick him with a flaming sword or something in order to, to drive the Night's King spirit out of his body. It, it, it's it's going to be weird. So the Pale Crypt's ghost definitely foreshadows some kind of otherized John. As does John's time with the wildlings, because the wildlings are symbolic parallels for the others. They are an otherized group north of the wall, just like the others are. And I'm saying otherized as in alienated. Okay, otherization 
is when you say the immigrants took our jobs. Uh, they're not sending their best. They're dirty and smelly. Okay. You are turning the immigrants into a subhuman group, and you are then suggesting that they are deserving of subhuman treatment. This is why dehumanization is always a first step towards genocide. If you're going to genocide a population or repress them or treat them as second-class citizens, you must first convince everyone that they are second-class citizens and not fully humans. They're vermin. They're rats. They're they're filthy skull blood drinkers, okay? They lay with the others. They, You get the idea. The wildlings are otherized. They are people just like the people in the north, but everyone south of the wall has convinced themselves that they are somehow just different and bad and violent, and we can't ever let them south of the wall. They'll just kill everyone. They're monsters. So they have been otherized. The others themselves are the same thing. They're not misunderstood. Don't get me wrong, okay? But the others are former weirwood spirits. They have been driven out of the weirwood trees. They have been um, separated from their original home in the green lands. So the wildlings have been driven out of the green lands and into the cold lands. The others have been driven out of the green weirwoods and out of nature into this cold, haunted, dead forest. So it's all parallel. And so, yeah, I said four hours. We're going for five hours. Yeah, whatever. Danny Iceberg was five hours. Wouldn't want John to come up short, would he? We don't need no short, short man. So when John joins the wildlings, that is a symbol for him going over to the others. And accordingly, he takes off his black cloak, hides it under his saddle, and he puts on a white sheepskin uh, thing, garments, wear, winter wear, whatever, um, hood and cloak. Cloak, that was what I was looking for. So it is a wolf in sheep's clothing, first of all. There's the joke. It's a wolf in sheep's clothing, but he has turned white. And even sheep are associated with the others because Craster gives his sheep to the others when he doesn't have sons. So John is dressed up like a sheep. He's dressed up like one of Craster's sacrifices. And his name is Snow. And Snow is the name for all the bastards in the North, many of whom used to be given to the others in ancient day, we think. So John joining the wildlings is a preview of him Joining the others, meaning his body being stolen by the others. And John is kind of stolen against his will. He doesn't really join the wildlings. He's just forced to because of circumstance. And that is the same as the others possessing his body. Like when they put his spirit back in his body, he'll be freed from that. So he's kind of trapped, right? So it's a very detailed parallel. And he's even taken into the wildlings by the Lord of Bones, who's a great other's symbol. He's it's a white bone man, you know, with, with the others uh, having the white bones and being bone white and all this stuff. So it's pretty good. Um, it's, uh, yeah, he's the wolf in sheep's clothing. And then what do the wildlings do with John? Once they've stolen him, they use him to invade. They send John over the wall and they use his knowledge of the watch to, to cross the wall and invade Westeros. What are the others going to do with John's body? They're going to invade Westeros because he will be the vessel for the new Knights King. And then they will cross the wall and invade Westeros, just as the wildlings did with John. So it's really, once you see that parallel, it, it's hard to deny that. So this is why I'm so convinced that the others are going to steal John's body and cross the wall. It's just got to happen. So maybe that means I think the long night's going to fall before John is repossessed. I don't know. Maybe they'll, yeah, I don't know. I have to leave George room to, to write this shit, man. I'm not trying to write fan fiction here. I'm just trying to decode the symbolism. <laughs> so, um, let's see. Uh, so crossing the wall. Okay, guys, I got to take a really quick restroom break. I'm just going to go ahead and leave the art up and give me like, actually, no, I'll give the music. I think that's more entertaining. I'll do reading Rhaegar one more time. This will be the last break 
about 30 seconds and I'll be right back. And we're back. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate the fact that my numbers don't drop. Oh, man. This is a five and a half hour stream. I do have to use the restroom sometimes. Okay, so John has already let the wildlings through the wall twice. And if we're talking about the wildlings as symbolizing the others, which we just were, John has let them through the wall twice. <laughs> so is he going to let the others through the wall? Seems so. You tell me. Oh, yes, that's right. When you go to the chapters where he lets them through the wall, they're spelled out as others very extensively. We counted, he uses the other double entendre like 14 times. You know, it's like, it's like some of them did this. Other ones you know, did that. And it's the other ones are always doing cold things. Like some of the people were having trouble walking on the snow, but other ones from the frozen shore did not break the snow because they have the bear paws on. And of course the others don't break the snow either. Where are the super chats today? We got a bunch earlier. Why does everyone assume John is coming back to life? Well, because the story is dumb if he doesn't come back to life. No, it wouldn't be funny if he stayed dead. That would just be stupid. Think about it. I mean, it, it's funny to type it, but it wouldn't be fun for the story. Um, and then also everything that I've said today in the iceberg that foreshadows his resurrection. A man, then a wolf, then a man again. You know, all that stuff. So, yeah, definitely happening. Praise Garth, Hazy Dave. And that's why everyone is convinced it's going to happen. Also, he's clearly got some stuff to do. <laughs> like, come on. Just trolling me. It's too late in the stream for trolling. So he lets them through. He calls them winter's people. They're, they're frozen. They're cold. They're the others. The best one is that, you know, some of them glared at him. Some gave him smiles. Others looked at him like long lost brothers. So the others are the Starks long lost brothers. Okay. Um, and then it says, none of them kneeled, but all gave their oath. So the others are giving John their oath. They don't kneel to him because he is not in control, but he gives them their oath because he's Knight's King, kind of something like that. So yeah, it's, we did a reread of the John letting him through the wall chapter. If you want the whole detail, it's stunning. It's undeniable. The others, the wildlings are other coded so heavily that nobody could ever deny it. Um, and John is letting them through. And so, again, I say John will let the others through the wall. That is something that will happen. <clears throat> so, Knights King John. He will look like this, first of all. And this art is by H. Lazarus. Oh, let me go back to the Mel Val one. Sorry, I didn't give you this artist. This is by Morgane Lafee. We'll go back to that Ygritte in a second. This is H. Lazarus. So Knights King John, he does have Knights King symbolism. Uh, there's, there's a lot of it. And uh, so we've talked about some of it, the Jack Frost and the snow and the parallels with Leanna as a Night's Queen mother. Um, 
Armored in ice, that's a good one. Because the others literally wear ice armor. So whatever that means, it definitely makes us think about John wearing ice armor like an other. Um, when you grit dies, and this art is by Beroken Crafts. When you grit dies, John finds her body and she's dying. And it says that the snow and the frost made a silver mask on her face that twinkled in the moonlight. So even though you grit is kissed by fire and she's mostly nissiness of fire symbolism in her moment of death, she transforms into Night's Queen because Nissa Nissa probably became Night's Queen after her death, okay? So, Ygritte puts on the silver icy moon mask. And John's other woman, symbolically, is Val. And she is completely Night's Queen coded. And the most important scene with Val is when she steals John's ghost. So, this art is by Break Sky. Oh, maybe it's break ski. So this is Val with ghost. Now this is, this is, um, this is really good. So this is basically, um, a recreation of Knights King and Knights Queen in the little mini ritual. So ghost is North of the wall and Val is North of the wall and Val appears, or no, I'm sorry. Ghost is with John. Val appears out of the haunted forest and ghost goes up to her and acts really friendly. And John says, are you trying to steal my wolf? And that's all it is. A little quick exchange. But think about what just happened. John saw a beautiful woman north of the wall, just like Knight's Queen, or Knight's King saw Knight's Queen north of the wall. Knight's King gives his seed and soul to Knight's Queen. And John's like, are you trying to steal my ghost? So that's very similar giving his ghost to Night's Queen. So this is a little, just a little parallel ritual that spells out John and Val as a symbolic Night's Queen and King couple. And uh, yeah, so that is more evidence that John should eventually play a Night's King role with a real Night's Queen. Then John, last thing John does is lead a wildling force to attack Winterfell. The wildlings are coded as others, and John is leading them to attack Winterfell. So that sounds like a Night's King leading the others to invade Westeros, doesn't it? And attacking Winterfell, which he's going to do. Stannis declares the Night Fort as his seat, and then he attacks Winterfell from the north with a bunch of tree warriors. So it's a pattern that happens over and over. And it spells out John as a knight's king. And what does that mean? Probably that the others are going to steal his body and put knight's king spirit in his body, at least for a time. And when John is going north of the wall on the suicide mission uh, to kill Mance Raider, that is when he thinks about his name being shadowed forever in disgrace. And knight's king's name was erased from the records and forever forgotten. Very similar. And here's more Val artwork because we love Val. This is by Ville Pero. Ville Pero. And this is an awesome Val. It's got the weirwood brooch. Honey hair, blue eyes. She is a weirwood Night's Queen figure. And she's, yeah, in a tower guarded by a giant, just like Leanna was in a tower guarded by the King's Guard. Great parallel. Theory of Ice and Fire. Yeah, there is some stuff with him, with John and Val, that's like sort of spelling out that they are man and wife, just symbolically, you know. And of course, when John is offered Winterfell by Stannis, the part of that offer is that Val will become his wife if he can steal her, you know. So she would become the Lord of Stark. And this is another clue that Night's Queen was a Stark. I really think that's the case. So, because if Night's King is Azor High, he's actually a dragon man. So that's, that's the deal. I think it's Azor High, the dragon man, and Night's Queen, the Stark sort of ice priestess. Or just a... Spirit in the weirwood net. Something. 
because Nissa Nissa is a child of the forest creature to begin with. So she's a Westerosi figure. It makes more sense to align her with the Starks than Azor High, who's a dragon man from the east. <clears throat> and finally, we should start back. I have a crazy live stream, even crazier than this one. Not as long, but crazier. It's called We Should Start Back. And the principle behind it is that the prologue of Ice and Fire can be read forwards and backwards. The very first line of the, of the, of the prologue is We Should Start Back. And it's somebody talking to Waymar saying, we should go back. We've been out here for nine days, et cetera, et cetera. So I was looking at uh, Finnegan's Wake, which is a very strange book by James Joyce, where the last sentence is a fragment and connects to the first sentence of the book and creates a loop in the narrative. And then the, the book is disorganized in time. It's dreamlike. There is time shifting going on. There's loops and all kinds of weird shit. And so George seems inspired by this a little bit. And what he's done is he's created. Um, and the reason we know he's inspired by Finnegan's Wake, I'm sorry, I skipped this. The name of the castle River Run is taken from that sentence that loops from the end of the book to the beginning. And at last we come back circuitously, something, something, Commodus Vicus, uh, back to Houth Castle and Environs uh, where the river runs or something like that. So it's River Run itself. The castle has lots of clues about circular time and Finnegan's Wake and things like that. So it's definitely something that George is working with. Um, check out my House Tully live stream. I talked about Finnegan's Wake in more detail. So that we should start back House Tully live stream if you want more of this. The point is, Waymar's prologue can be read, read forwards and backwards, and it kind of tells almost the same story because it, it's reflexive, right? It's focus on Will and Waymar. Forget Garrod because he's hiding in the woods. It starts off with Will and Waymar. Will or Waymar sends Will up the tree. And when he does it, there is Nissa Nissa stabbing language. The cold stabbed through Will like a knife. And then there's a second line about stabbing. But there's two stabbing lines right as Waymar commands Will to go up the tree. So I've always said Nissa Nissa, when she is killed, she is a child of the forest and she goes into the weirwood net. So Will is Nissa Nissa. He goes into the tree. Then Azor High invokes the others. This murder of Nissa Nissa has brought out the others. They come out and they fight Will. Will loses. Or Waymar loses. Sorry, they fight Waymar, obviously. Waymar loses. The others disappear. That's the center point. Then Will comes back down out of the tree. And Waymar stands back up. And Waymar and Will have another stabbing session. Instead of, instead of implied this time... Waymar actually stabs Will, and they embrace like two lovers. It's a very curious line at the end of the prologue. There's a line about them being like embracing like lovers. And that's because this is Nissa Nissa Azor High stuff. So basically, you have the pair on either side doing a Nissa Nissa action. In between, Nissa Nissa goes up the tree and comes back down. And then there's a fight with the others in the middle. So you can see it's a symmetrical chapter. You go forward and back. It's roughly the same order of events, but different things come out. Yes, he chokes. Waymar chokes Will. That's exactly right. Um, and and uh, and then yeah, there's there's lovers language or something. I forget what it is. Somebody if somebody wants to look it up, they can. Um, and so let's so reading it forward. This is the story of how Azor Ahai screwed everything up. He killed Nissa Nissa. And remember, Waymar starts off the chapter by invading the woods. He's pressing forward. Everything suggests that he turns back. The trees are pulling at him. His companions are like, this is bad. We should go back. He's like, no, I am without fear. I am charging into the wood. I am heedless. I am mankind at war with nature. Okay. 
So Azor Ahai, Waymar, invading, invading. Then we come to the clearing, and he sends Nissa Nissa's spirit up the tree, again with a stabbing language, the wind cutting through Will like a knife in the chest. And so after Nissa Nissa is sent in the weirwood, now that means the weirwood net has been defiled, the great sin has happened, and so the others appear. They're not long in appearing. And you'll notice Will climbs the tree and says a prayer to the old gods right before the others appear. And guess what that is? That is Nissa Nissa going into the weirwood net and summoning the others as a defense, as a revenge, as a strike back, if you will. And so the others come out, the will of Nissa Nissa, if you will. <laughs> and they, and they, they kill Azor Ahai, but they also turn him into their master. Like I said, Waymar is resurrected with the Night's King symbolism. And so now Azor Ahai, the joke's on you. You sent Nissa Nissa into the weirwood net and she flipped, she flipped it around and now you are trapped. And this is the part where, Azor, where Night's King gives his seed and soul to Night's Queen. Nissa Nissa now has the power. Okay? <clears throat> and so Azor Ahai Waymar has been transformed into Night's King. And that's the end of that reading. So if we flip it around, we can see even more of the story. So if you read it backwards, the chapter begins with the embrace of Will and Waymar. And again, Waymar is again killing Nissa Nissa Will. He's choking her. But there's lover's language, right? So then what happens? He chokes her, and then she falls to the ground, dead. No, not falls to the ground. Sorry, this is hard. It's hard. You have to work it in backwards. So basically, before he was being choked, he was holding the sword. So you have to, so playing it backwards, Waymar chokes Will. Then Will picks up this sword and looks at it and drops it again and climbs up the tree. Then Azor Ahai, who's, he gets up because remember, because he's, uh, Waymar was laying in the snow when he got up and choked. So playing it backwards, he lays back down into the snow next to the sword and then does what? He gets up and picks up the sword and reforges it. So instead of the broken sword falling from Waymar's hand as he dies, just replay it. He gets up and the broken sword comes back together in his hand. So what does this look like? This is Azor High Reborn. So... I think the way that it works is like this. There's a time jump, okay? So Waymar and Will, there's the choking, and they both die. Waymar lays back into the snow, and Will goes up the tree. That's time break, okay? That's the original act being shown again. When Waymar gets back up out of the snow and picks up the sword and it comes back together, watching this backwards, that is John being reborn. That is the rebirth of Azor High. And now what happens? He's reforged the old sword and the others come out of the woods and he fights the others. But this time it works backwards. He fights them off to a stalemate and then they withdraw. Right? Okay. Then after they withdraw, Will comes back down out of the tree, Nissa Nissa, her spirit has come back out of the weirwood net and Azor High and Nissa Nissa are together again. And then they walk into the woods. That's the backwards reading. And so the suggestion here is that John and Danny be like Nissa Nissa reborn, potentially. We have these two people driving off the others and sending them back into the wood and then ending up together. So how would John and Danny lead the others back into the wood. John doesn't kill the others. Waymar doesn't kill the others in this reverse reading. He just duels them to a stalemate, and then they go back into the woods. The others going back into the woods is the solution. That is the others going back into the weirwoods, which is their original home. John and Danny then, Waymar and Will, I think, 
they then walk into those same woods. And so I'm wondering if John and Danny at the very end of the story will essentially become otherized and lead the others back into the weirwood net. And that's the bittersweet ending. Because if you think about the Danny Unsullied parallel, it's also suggested. The Unsullied are like whites, and the slave masters are like others. Danny burns the slave masters, frees the whites from enslavement, but then what? She becomes their leader. She then leads these freed whites. She gives them their names back. So that's like giving the whites back their identity, their their souls are freed from bondage. But how does Danny lead the whites like she leads the unsullied? Well, she would be leading them back into nature. Remember, all these the dead spirits go into the rocks and trees and into nature. Danny has so much nature mother goddess symbolism. So I think, you know, if you look at her undying uh, vision, it looks like she's going into the weirwood net when she falls into the bloody hand canopy, right? The hands that are the the uh, the freed slaves, they're 10,000 bloodstained hands, just like the weirwood canopy. The white bondage is tied to the weirwoods. So I think somehow Danny cleanses the weirwood net by going back into it, possibly her and John. And this is how they lead the whites and lead the others back into the trees. Thank you, Iconic Calamity. Warhammer Salt Smoke says, do you think John's resurrection will be harbinger for the death of Stannis? Mel thought Stannis was Azor High Reborn. I don't know when Stannis is going to die, and I don't know that it will have anything to do with John. But at some point, obviously Mel will realize she's got it wrong. So... That was me summing up a very complicated three-hour live stream that we should start back one um, in like 15 minutes. I hope that made sense. But uh, yeah, it's just a little writer's trick, writing a parallelism, reflexive chapter so that you can read it forward and back. We have found a few other chapters that seem like they can also be read forward and backwards. So it's just a really deep in the weeds thing. You know, those those videos don't get quite as many views. <laughs> But maybe some other day I'll find another chapter like that and we'll do a forwards and back reading. But the point is that it suggests the solution is leading the others back into the woods and it suggests that John and Danny may um, may do that. So this art here is by Breakski. No, it's not. I'm sorry. It is by Topo83. Will is up the tree. It's a weirwood here. It's not in the prologue, but it's a weirwood here. And there's Will and the other. So let me go and pull up my PayPal's because I think I may have got a couple. Jon Snow is my favorite character, says Kelly Johnson. This is the best dream since David took us into the depths of the night fort. Awesome. Well, I'm happy to hear that, Kelly. You do send me a lot of super chats, so I'm glad you're entertained. Cleo's special treatment from Nico. Thank you, Nico. Appreciate that. Appreciate you, buddy. So does Cleo. Okay, cool. So I will take. Yeah, we are in the weeds. We like the weeds. I will take a last call for questions and then we will finish this iceberg because that's pretty much all I had to say. Tim, what do you think, man? You have any thoughts for me? Obviously, like I said, next Sunday, we'll have Tim on to do the brand chapter where we get the Night of the Laughing Tree. That will set up my RLJ video. Synergy. Yeah, I don't really agree with any of that, uh, Caleb, for what it's worth. But let's see. Will the dragons be used for a peaceful solution? Yeah, so the dragons, like I said, the dragons only exist because of a whole lot of evil. The Valerian Empire and the original blood magic experiments to make them. And Danny also killed Mary Mastor at an act of blood magic in order to wake the dragons. So the dragons are tainted in a sense 
Yes, dragons can represent positive attributes like fire and life and courage and knowledge and all the stuff. But as far as the creatures, like they are monsters. <laughs> okay, like they're the definition of a monster. Danny thinks about them that way too. Um, the big thing about this is that the only just use of the dragons is to pit them against the others who are also monsters, right? And the whites and all that. So using them to conquer Westeros is what's wrong. But I think Danny is on the way to figuring that out. So where do you think George started when creating the series myths first and then plot? I'm a writer, so I'm in awe and intrigued. Yeah, I do. If you look back at George's older writing, he's working the mythical archetypes and the parallelism in all of his short stories. So I think he's developed, like the Ice Queen stuff goes back to Song for Lya. And Lya, obviously a similar name to Lyanna. So there's a continuity of thought that flows around the symbols and the mythical archetypes. And that's why I think those are mostly the things that inspire George. Um, and they're a part of the process from the beginning. What would be my thought about John procuring ice magic? Well, when he's whited by the others, he'll be icy. Will he be left with any of that iciness after he is liberated from the others is a question. Can you explain more of the role Nissa Nissa played in The Long Night? Was she in on the plan? I don't think she was in on the plan. Oh, there are some echoes that kind of look like that. Mostly she looks like a victim of blood sacrifice. I think she takes agency after... So basically think about her as a child of the forest woman. Azor High is not a green seer. He wants to force his way into the weirwood net, I believe. And so he has to kill children of the forest in blood magic and like force his way in. And doing that desecrated and defiled and altered the weirwood net. It could be that he meant to alter it so that it was suitable for him to inhabit where it wasn't before or something like that. No, Rob is not in Catlin. No, no, Catlin died a long time ago. What about blood oranges, Tim? The others will not be eradicated. They will become green man spirits. That's the whole thing about letting the wildlings through the wall and reconciling them to the green lands. John did that. John will help reconcile the others back to their weirwood tree homes. And this is again what the, the backwards reading of the prologue was saying. He's leading them back into the trees, sending them into the trees. So Nissa gets trapped in the weirwood net, but then she sort of turns the tables on Azor High. And it's possible that she is going to come back out or be reckoned with or rescued or something. We will see. There is some parallels for that. Where did Azor Ahai get the idea to do what he did? Well, Bloodstone Emperor, of course, who is sort of the evil version of Azor Ahai, he's, he cast down the true gods and worshipped one of these black moon meteors. So he seems to have directly gained magic power from this act. So he was willing to sacrifice and screw up nature in order to gain power. So you see how the themes are all coherent here. It's like, we're screwing up the stars. We're screwing up the weirwood net. We're messing with the primal forces of nature. <clears throat> oh, Tim's new video is Tuesday, Blood and Citrus. Awesome. Yeah, we can do some, we should do some Dornish chapters over on your channel, man. Bring some of the crowd over to your channel. Do you think the others live a tortured existence or is it more like a vampire? Yeah, it's hard to say, man. Hard to say. <laughs> Don't know if I can put myself in their mindset. Do you think skin changing is actually low key evil? Um, it seems, uh, it seems like maybe, you know, the, the animals do seem to be okay. Like they're, you know, Varamir, like some of the animals fight Varamir. The shadow cat and the snow bear hates him. But, um, uh, what, what you were saying, the, uh, 
but the the wolves don't fight. You know, the wolves like the Starks, so it's hard to say if if it is. And it seems to be kind of a natural. Um, what is the, oh, it's the same troll again? What is this about Rhodesia? Why 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 is that? It's a very obscure trolling, but okay, I'm sure there's some secret white supremacist reference I'm not getting. Um, anyway, so so uh, yeah, so the the, the war, I don't know that all warging is an abomination. It, it probably came about because humans interbred with green men or child of the forest, but humans might have evolved from green men or child of the forest too. So I really don't know. That's probably a question I can't answer today. Oh, I see. Rhodesia was an apartheid state. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, the queen maker chapter is a great one. Yeah. That's the one where Arya Hota dies. That's got some great stuff in it. We will read that one sometime soon. Because it goes along with all that green blood symbolism from the green weirwoods. Arya's oak heart dies. Yeah, sorry. Arya Hota chops him up. Um, in John 1, A Game of Thrones, the royal children are stand-ins for the others, and it's repeatedly noted they're unhappy and lose control after passing the wooden benches. I'll have to take a look at that. But yeah, it, I, I don't think they're happy. So that kind of makes sense. You know, the main thing as far as the green magic, it's like, well, how does it feel? You know, like, we know that Bran taking over Hodor is wrong because Hodor doesn't like it. But we're in the wolf dream, and it seems it seems contiguous. So, you know, uh, uh, seems like teamwork. That's called fucking teamwork. So, any more Jon Snow questions? And then I will go ahead and shut this down because it's we're almost at six bloody hours. Take that, all shift X, Jon Snow many hours live stream, which I watched a lot of. John one. Oh, game of Thrones. John one. Yeah. The snow show is going to be terrible unless they hire me to write it. I'm the only one that could save it. We have to go deep into night's queen lore and shit to make that interesting. Otherwise it's going to be a mess. So HBO, hire me if you want that to not be embarrassing. It's probably not going to be made, though, which is maybe the best. Greywaste Tim, thanks for all the content. Oh, yeah. Greywaste Tim is awesome. My favorite character is Daenerys. Absolutely. I identify with her, and I just feel her chapters the most, especially the... I'm a John Brown kind of guy. That's all I can say. So yeah, I love Danny. As far as obscure characters, I like, you know, Marwin the Mage and Rohan Weber and I like Val, I like Asha Greyjoy because of the King's Mood stuff and like Rhaegar, you know. It's my roommate, so. Definitely like Arya. I like all the characters. I really just, you know, nobody that I dislike. Um, we are going to do some some Jamie and Cersei rereads going forward, as we have been sprinkling in. Those have been fun. Jamie chapters are tons of fun to read. All right, guys. Thank you for joining me. I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up before we cross the six-hour line. We've got 723 people still, so you've been a very beautiful audience this Easter. Make my heart sing with enthusiasm. So thanks a lot, guys. Clearly you have enjoyed the stream. Thanks for coming out. And yeah, um, John's going to have white hair. We talked about that briefly. Probably don't need to go back into that. I forgot to put that on the list, but you know, it's there. So happy Easter. And I will see you next Sunday with another reread. So there'll be no video this week. No hot dragon rewatch. I'm going to take this week and work on videos. And I will see you next Sunday 
for the brand chapter with the Knight of the Laughing Tree with Grey Waste Tim. So, cheers, and thanks again. Oh, Theon has white hair too, totally. <laughs>